Section 1 of 93. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Joanna Michael Hoyt. 93 by Victor Hugo. Translated by Aline Delano. Part 1. At Sea. Book 1. The Forest of La Sodre. During the last days of May, 1793, one of the Parisian battalions introduced into Brittany by Santerre was reconnoitering the formidable La Sodre woods in Astier. Decimated by this cruel war, the battalion was reduced to about three hundred men. This was at the time when, after Argonne, Gemap, and Valny, of the first battalion of Paris, which had numbered six hundred volunteers, only twenty-seven men remained, thirty-three of the second, and fifty-seven of the third, a time of epic combats. The battalion sent from Paris into La Vendée numbered nine hundred and twelve men. Each regiment had three pieces of cannon. They had been quickly mustered. On the 25th of April, Gauhier being Minister of Justice and Bouchot Minister of War, the section of Bon Conseil had offered to send volunteer battalions into La Vendée. The report was made by Lubin, a member of the Commune. On the 1st of May, Santerre was ready to send off twelve thousand men, thirty field pieces, and one battalion of gunners. These battalions, notwithstanding they were so quickly formed, serve as models even at the present day, and regiments of the line are formed on the same plan. They altered the former proportion between the number of soldiers and that of non-commissioned officers. On the 28th of April the Paris Commune had given to the volunteers of Santerre the following order, no mercy, no quarter. Of the twelve thousand that had left Paris, at the end of May eight thousand were dead. The battalion which was engaged in La Sodre held itself on its guard. There was no hurrying. Every man looked at once to right and to left, before him, behind him. Clébert has said, The soldier has an eye in his back. They had been marching a long time. What o'clock could it be? What time of the day was it? It would have been hard to say, for there is always a sort of dusk in these wild thickets, and it was never light in that wood. The forest of La Sodre was a tragic one. It was in this coppice that from the month of November, 1792, civil war began its crimes. Mousqueton, the fierce cripple, had come forth from those fatal thickets. The number of murders that had been committed there made one's hair stand on end. No spot was more terrible. The soldiers forced cautiously. Everything was in full bloom. They were surrounded by a quivering wall of branches, whose leaves diffused a delicious freshness. Here and there sunbeams pierced these green shades. At their feet the gladiolus, the German iris, the wild narcissus, the wood daisy, that tiny flower, forerunner of the warm weather, the spring crocus. All these embroidered and adorned a thick carpet of vegetation, abounding in every variety of moss, from the kind that looks like a caterpillar to that resembling a star. The soldiers advanced silently, step by step, gently pushing aside the underbrush. The birds twittered above the bayonets. La Sodre was one of those thickets where formerly, in times of peace, they had pursued the Wishaba, the hunting of birds by night. Now it was a place for hunting men. The coppice consisted entirely of birch trees, beeches, and oaks. The ground was level. The moss and the thick grass deadened the noise of footsteps. No paths at all, or paths no sooner found than lost. Holly, wild slow, brakes, hedges of rest harrow, and tall brambles. It was impossible to see a man ten paces distant. Now and then a heron or a moorhen flew through the branches, showing the vicinity of a swamp. They marched along at haphazard, uneasy, and fearing lest they might find what they sought. From time to time they encountered traces of encampments, a burnt place, trampled grass, sticks arranged in the form of a cross, or branches spattered with blood. Here soup had been made, there mass had been said, yonder wounds had been dressed. But whoever had passed that way had vanished. Where were they? Far away, perhaps and yet they might be very near, hiding, blunderbuss in hand. The wood seemed deserted. The battalion redoubled its precaution. Solitude, therefore distrust. No one was to be seen. All the more reason to fear someone. They had to do with a forest of ill repute. 
an ambush was probable. Thirty grenadiers, detached as scouts and commanded by a sergeant, marched ahead, at a considerable distance from the main body. The vivandiere of the battalion accompanied them. The vivandieres like to join the vanguard. They run risks, but then they stand a chance of seeing something. Curiosity is one of the forms of feminine courage. Suddenly the soldiers of this little advanced guard received that shock familiar to hunters, which shows them that they are close upon the lair of their prey. They heard something like breathing in the middle of the thicket, and it seemed as if they caught sight of some commotion among the leaves. The soldiers made signs to each other. When this mode of watching and reconnoitering is confided to the scouts, officers have no need to interfere. What has to be done is done instinctively. In less than a minute the spot where the movement had been observed was surrounded by a circle of leveled muskets, aimed simultaneously from every side at the dusky centre of the thicket, and the soldiers, with finger on trigger and eye on the suspected spot, awaited only the sergeant's command to fire. Meanwhile the vivandier ventured to peer through the underbrush, and just as the sergeant was about to cry, Fire! This woman cried, Halt! And, turning to the soldiers, Do not fire! she cried and rushed into the thicket, followed by the men. There was indeed someone there. In the thickest part of the copse, on the edge of one of those small circular clearings made in the woods by the charcoal furnaces that are used to burn the roots of trees, in a sort of hole formed by the branches, a bower of foliage, so to speak, half open like an alcove, sat a woman on the moss, with a nursing child at her breast, and the fair heads of two sleeping children resting against her knees. This was the ambush. "'What are you doing here?' called out the vivandier. The woman raised her head, and the former added angrily, "'Are you insane to remain there?' she went on. "'A little more, and you would have been blown to atoms!' Then, addressing the soldiers, she said, "'It's a woman!' <laughs> "'Pardieu, that's plain to be seen,' replied a grenadier. The vivandier continued, "'To come into the woods to get oneself massacred! Can you conceive of anyone so stupid as that?' The woman, surprised, bewildered, and stunned, was gazing around as though in a dream at these muskets, sabres, bayonets, and savage faces. The two children awoke and began to cry. "'I'm hungry,' said one. "'I am afraid,' said the other. The baby went on nursing. The vivandier addressed it. "'You are the wise one,' she said. The mother was dumb with terror. "'Don't be afraid,' exclaimed the sergeant. We are the battalion of the Bonnet Rouge. The woman trembled from head to foot. She looked at the sergeant, of whose rough face she could see only the eyebrows, moustache, and eyes like two coals of fire. The battalion formerly known as the Red Cross, added the vivandier. The sergeant continued. Who are you, madam? The woman looked at him in terror. She was thin, young, pale, and in tatters. She wore the large hood and woolen cloak of the Breton peasants, fastened by a string around her neck. She left her bosom exposed with the indifference of an animal. Her feet, without shoes or stockings, were bleeding. "'It's a beggar,' said the sergeant. The vivandiere continued in her martial yet womanly voice, a gentle voice with all. "'What is your name?' The woman stammered in a scarce audible whisper. M "'Michel Fléchard.' Meanwhile, the vivandier stroked the little head of the nursing baby with her large hand. How old is this midget? she asked. The mother did not understand. The vivandier repeated, I ask you how old it is. Oh, eighteen months, said the mother. That's quite old, said the vivandier. It ought not to nurse any longer. You must wean it. We will give him soup. The mother began to feel more at ease. The two little ones, who had awakened, were rather interested than frightened. They admired the plumes of the soldiers. "'Ah, oh, they are very hungry,' said the mother. And she added, "'I have no more milk.' "'We will give them food,' cried the sergeant. "'And you also. But there is something more to be settled. What are your political opinions?' The woman looked at him and made no reply. "'Do you understand my question?' She stammered. I, uh, I was put into a convent when I was quite young. But I married. I am not a nun. The sisters taught me to speak French. The village was set on fire. 
We escaped in such haste that I had no time to put my shoes on. I ask you, what are your political opinions? I don't know anything about that. The sergeant continued. There are female spies, that kind of person we shoot. Come speak. You are not a gypsy, are you? What is your native land? She still looked at him as though unable to comprehend. The sergeant repeated, What is your native land? I do not know, she said. How is that? You do not know your country. Ah, do you mean my country? I know that. Well, what is your country? The woman replied, It is the farm of Sisquanyard, in the parish of Azay. It was the sergeant's turn to be surprised. He paused for a moment, lost in thought. Then he went on. What was it you said? Sisquanyard. You cannot call that your native land. That is my country. Then after a minute's consideration, she added, Ah, I understand you, sir. You are from France, but I am from Brittany. Well? It is not the same country. But it is the same native land, exclaimed the sergeant. The woman only replied, I am from Sisquanyard. <sighs> Let it be. Sisquanyard, then, said the sergeant. Your family belong there, I suppose? Yes. What is their business? They are all dead. I have no one left. The sergeant, who was quite loquacious, continued to question her. Devil take it. Everyone has relations, or one has had them. Who are you? Speak! The woman listened, bewildered. This, or one has had them, sounded more like the cry of a wild beast than the speech of a human being. The vivandière felt obliged to interfere. She began to caress the nursing child, and patted the other two on the cheeks. What is the baby's name? It is a little girl, isn't it? The mother replied, Chouchette. And the oldest one, for he is a man, the rogue. Rone Jean. And the younger one, for he is a man too, and a chubby one into the bargain. Gouaran, replied the mother. They are pretty children, said the vivandier. They look already as if they were somebody. Meanwhile, the sergeant persisted. Come, speak, madam. Have you a house? I had one once. Where was it? At Aze. Why are you not at home? Because my house was burned. Who burned it? I do not know. There was a battle. Where do you come from? From over there. Where are you going? I do not know. Come to the point. Who are you? I do not know. Don't know who you are. We are people running away. To what party do you belong? I do not know. To the blues or the whites, which side are you on? I am with my children. There was a pause. The vivandier spoke. For my part, I never had any children. I have not had time. The sergeant began again. But what about your parents? See here, madam. Tell me the facts about your parents. Now, my name is Radoub. I am a sergeant. I live on the Rue Cherche Midi. My father and my mother lived there. I can talk of my parents. Tell us about yours. Tell us who your parents were. Their name was Fleshard. That's all. Yes, the Fleshards are the Fleshards, just as the Radoubs are the Radoubs. But people have a trade. What was your parents' trade? What did they do, these Fleshards of yours? They were laborers. My father was feeble and could not work, on account of the beating which the Lord, his Lord, uh, our Lord, gave him. It was really a mercy, for my father had poached a rabbit, a crime of which the penalty is death. But the Lord was merciful, and said, You may give him only a hundred blows with a stick. And my father was left a cripple. And then? My grandfather was a Huguenot. The curé had him sent to the galleys. I was very young then. And then? My husband's father was a salt smuggler. The king had him hung. And what did your husband do? He used to fight in those times. For whom? 
for the king. And after that? Ah, for his lord. And then? For the curé. By all the names of beasts, cried the grenadier. The woman jumped in terror. You see, madam, we are Parisians, said the vivandier affably. The woman clasped her hands, exclaiming, Oh, my God and Lord Jesus! No superstitions here, rejoined the sergeant. The vivandier sat down beside the woman and drew the oldest child between her knees. He yielded readily. Children are quite as easily reassured as they are frightened, with no apparent reason. They seem to possess instinctive perceptions. My poor worthy woman of this neighborhood, you have pretty little children at all events. Oh, one can guess their age. The big one is four years and his brother is three. Just see how greedily the little rascal sucks. The wretch, stop eating up your mother. Oh, come, madam, do not be frightened. You ought to join the battalion. You should do as I do. My name is Uzard. It is a nickname, but I had rather be called Uzard than Mademoiselle Bicono, like my mother. I am the canteen woman, which is the same as saying she who gives the men to drink when they are firing grape shot and killing each other. The devil and all his train, our feet are about the same size. I will give you a pair of my shoes. I was in Paris on the 10th of August. I gave Westerman a drink. Everything went with a rush in those days. I saw Louis Sixteenth guillotined, Louis Capet, as they call him. I tell you, he didn't like it. You just listen now, to think that on the 13th of January he was roasting chestnuts and enjoying himself with his family. When he was made to lie down on what is called the seesaw, he wore neither coat nor shoes, only a shirt, a quilted waistcoat, grey cloth breeches, and grey silk stockings. I saw all that with my own eyes. The fiacre which he rode in was painted green. Now then, you come with us. They are kind lads in the battalion. You will be canteen number two. I will teach you the trade. Oh, it's very simple. You will have a can and a bell. You are right on the racket amid the firing of the platoons and the cannons and all that hubbub, calling out, Who wants a drink, my children? It is no harder task than that. I offer a drink to all, you may take my word for it, to the whites as well as to the blues, although I am a blue and a true blue at that. But I serve them all alike, wounded men are thirsty. People die without difference of opinions, dying men ought to shake hands. How foolish to fight. Hmm, come with us. If I am killed, you will fill my place. You see, I am not much to look at, but I am a kind woman and a good fellow. Don't be afraid. When the vivandier ceased speaking, the woman muttered to herself, Our neighbor's name was Marichon and it was our servant who was Marie-Claude. Meanwhile, Sergeant Radoub was reprimanding the grenadier. Silence! You frighten, madam. A man should not swear before ladies. I say this is a downright butchery for an honest man to hear about, replied the grenadier. And to see Chinese Iroquois, whose father-in-law was crippled by the Lord, whose grandfather was sent to the galleys by the curé, and whose father was hung by the king, and who fight zones! And who get entangled in revolts and are crushed for the sake of the Lord, the curé, and the king! Silence in the ranks, exclaimed the sergeant. One may be silent, sergeant, continued the grenadier, but it is all the same provoking to see a pretty woman like that running the risk of getting her neck broken for the sake of a caloton. Translator's footnote, an opprobious epithet for an ecclesiastic. Grenadier, said the sergeant, we are not in the pike club. Save your eloquence. And turning to the woman. And your husband, madam, what does he do? What has become of him? Nothing, since he was killed. Where was that? In the hedge. When? Three days ago. Who killed him? I do not know. How is that? You don't know who killed your husband? No. Was it a blue or a white? It was a bullet. Was that three days ago? Yes. In what direction? Towards Ernay. My husband fell. That was all. And since your husband died, what have you been doing? I have been taking my little ones along. Where are you taking them? Straight along. Where do you sleep? On the ground. What do you eat? Nothing. The sergeant made that military grimace which elevates the moustache to the nose. Nothing? Well, nothing but sloes. Blackberries, when I found any left over from last year. Wortleberries and fern shoots. Yes, you may well call it nothing. The oldest child, who seemed to understand, said, I'm hungry. The sergeant pulled from his pocket a piece of ration bread and handed it to the mother. 
Taking the bread, she broke it in two and gave it to the children, who bit into it greedily. She's not saved any for herself, growled the sergeant. Because she's not hungry, remarked a soldier. Because she's a mother, said the sergeant. The children broke in. Give me something to drink, said one. To drink, repeated the other. Is there no brook in this cursed wood, said the sergeant. The vivandier took the copper goblet suspended at her belt together with a bell, turned to the cock of the can that was strapped across her shoulder, and, pouring several drops into the goblet, held it to the children's lips. The first drank and made a grimace. The second drank and spit it out. It is good all the same, said the vivandier. Is that some of the old cutthroat? asked the sergeant. Yes, some of the best, but they are peasants. She wiped the goblet. And so, madam, you are running away, resumed the sergeant. I couldn't help it. Across the fields, with no particular object. Sometimes I run with all my might, and then I walk, and once in a while I fall. Poor countrywoman, said the vivandier. They were fighting, stammered the woman. I, I was in the middle of the firing. I, I don't know what they want. They killed my husband. That was all I know about it. The sergeant banged the butt of his musket on the ground, exclaiming, What a beast of a war! In the name of all that is idiotic! The woman continued, Last night we went to bed in an emousse. All four of you? All four. Went to bed? Went to bed. Then you must have gone to bed standing. And he turned to the soldiers. Comrades, a dead tree, old and hollow, wherein a man can sheathe himself like a sword in a scabbard is what these savages call a name moose. But what would you have? All are not obliged to be Parisians. The idea of sleeping in the hollow of a tree, and with three children, exclaimed the vivandier. And when the little one bawled, it must have seemed queer to the passers-by who could see nothing to hear the tree calling out, Papa! Mama! Fortunately, it is summertime, said the woman with a sigh. She looked down resigned, with an expression in her eyes of one who had known surprising calamities. The silent soldiers surrounded this wretched group. A widow, three orphans, flight, desolation, solitude, the rumblings of war on the horizon, hunger, thirst, no food but herbs, no roof but the sky. The sergeant drew near the woman and gazed upon the nursing infant. The baby left the breast, turned her head, and looked with her lovely blue eyes on the dreadful hairy face, bristling and fierce, that was bending over her, and began to smile. The sergeant drew back, and a large tear was seen to roll down his cheek, clinging to the end of his mustache like a pearl. He raised his voice. Comrades, I have come to the conclusion that this battalion is about to become a father. Are you willing? We adopt these three children. Hurrah for the Republic! shouted the grenadiers. So be it, exclaimed the sergeant, and he stretched out both hands over the mother and the children. Behold the children of the battalion of the Bonnet Rouge, he said. The vivandier jumped for joy. Three heads under one cap, she cried. Then she burst out sobbing and embraced the widow excitedly, saying, She looks like a rogue already, that little girl. Hurrah for the Republic, repeated the soldiers. Come, citizeness, said the sergeant to the mother. End of section one. Section two of Ninety Three by Victor Hugo, translated by Aline Delano. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part One at Sea, Book Two, The Corvette Claymore, Chapter One, England and France United. In the spring of 1793, when France, attacked at one and the same time on all her frontiers, experienced the pathetic diversion of the downfall of the Girondists, the following events were taking place in the Channel Islands. In Jersey, one evening on the 1st of June, about an hour before sunset, from the lovely little bay of Bonnuit, a corvette set sail in that foggy kind of weather dangerous for navigation, and, for that very reason, better suited for escape than for pursuit. The ship, although it was manned by a French crew, belonged to the English squadron which had been stationed to watch the eastern point of the island. The Prince of Tour d'Auvergne, 
of the House of Bouillon, commanded the English fleet, and it was by his order, and for a special and pressing service, that the corvette had been detached. This corvette entered at the Trinity House under the name of the Claymore, and, apparently a freight vessel, was in point of fact a man of war. She looked like a heavy and peaceable merchant ship, but it would not have been wise to trust to that, for she had been built to serve two purposes, cunning and strength, to deceive if possible, to fight if necessary. For the service on hand that night, the freight between decks had been replaced by thirty carronades of heavy caliber. Either for the sake of giving the ship a peaceable appearance, or possibly because a storm was anticipated, these thirty carronades were housed. That is, they were firmly fastened inside by triple chains, with their muzzles tightly braced against the portholes. Nothing could be seen from the outside. The portholes were closed. It was as though the corvette wore a mask. These guns were mounted on old-fashioned bronzed wheels, called the radiating model. The regular naval corvettes carry their guns on the upper deck. But this ship, built for surprise and ambush, had its decks clear, having been arranged, as we have just seen, to carry a masked battery between decks. The Claymore, although built in a heavy and clumsy fashion, was nevertheless a good sailor, her hull being one of the strongest in the English navy, and in an engagement she was almost equal to a frigate, although her mizzenmast was only a small one, with a fore-and-aft rig. Her rudder, of an odd and scientific shape, had a curved frame, quite unique, which had cost fifty pounds sterling in the Southampton shipyards. The crew, entirely French, was composed of refugee officers and sailors who were deserters. They were experienced men. There was not one among them who was not a good sailor, a good soldier, and a good royalist. A threefold fanaticism possessed them, for the ship, the sword, and the king. Half a battalion of marines, which could in case of necessity be disembarked, was added to the crew. The captain of the Claymore was a chevalier of Saint-Louis, Count Boisbetulot, one of the best officers of the old Royal Navy. The first officer was the Chevalier de la Vieuxville, who had commanded in the French guards the company of which Hoche was sergeant, and the pilot, Philippe Gacqual, was one of the most experienced in Jersey. It was easy to guess that the ship had some unusual work to do, in fact, a man had just stepped on board who had the look of one starting out for an adventure. He was an old man, tall, upright, and strong, with a severe countenance. A man whose age it would have been difficult to determine, for he seemed both young and old, advanced in years, yet abounding in vigor. One of those men whose eyes flash lightning though the hair is white. Judging from his energy, he was about forty years old. His air of authority was that of a man of eighty. At the moment when he stepped on board the corvette, his sea-cloak was half open, revealing beneath wide breeches called bras bra, high boots, and a goatskin waistcoat embroidered with silk on the right side, while the rough and bristling fur was left on the wrong side, the complete costume of a Breton peasant. These old-fashioned Breton waistcoats answered two purposes, being worn both on holidays and weekdays, and could be reversed at the option of the wearer, with either the hairy or the smooth side out fur on a weekday, and gala attire for holidays. And, as if to increase a carefully studied resemblance, the peasant dress worn by the old man was well worn on the knees and elbows, showing signs of long usage, and his cloak, made of coarse cloth, looked like the garb of a fisherman. He wore the round hat of the period, tall and broad-brimmed, which when turned down looks countrified, but when caught up on one side by a loop and a cockade has quite a military effect. He wore it turned down, country fashion, with neither loop nor cockade. Lord Balcaris, the governor of the island, and the Prince de la Tour d'Auvergne, had in person escorted him on board. The secret agent of the Prince de Lambre, an old bodyguard of the Count d'Artois, himself a nobleman, had personally superintended the arrangement of his cabin, showing his attention and courtesy even so far as to carry the old man's valise. When about to leave him to return to the land, Monsieur de Jalambre had made a deep bow to this peasant. Lord Balcaras exclaimed, Good luck to you, General. And the Prince de la Tour d'Auvergne said, Au revoir, cousin. The peasant was the name by which the sailors at once called their passenger in the short dialogues which sailors hold among themselves. Yet, without further information on the subject, they understood that this peasant was no more a genuine peasant than the man of war was a merchantman. There was scarcely any wind, the Claymore left Bonnuit, passed Boulay Bay, 
remaining for some time in sight, tacking, gradually diminishing in the gathering darkness, and finally disappeared. An hour later, Gelambre, having returned home to saint hélier sent to the Count d'Artois, at the headquarters of the Duke of York, by the Southampton Express, the following lines. My lord, the departure has just taken place, success is certain. In eight days the whole coast, from Granville to Saint-Malo, will be ablaze. Four days previously, the representative of the Marne, Prieur, on a mission to the army on the coast of Cherbourg, and just then stopping at Granville, received by a secret emissary the following message, in the same handwriting as the previous one. Citizen representative, the first of June, at high tide, the war corvette Claymore, with a masked battery, will set sail to land on the coast of France a man who answers to the following description. Tall, aged, grey-haired, dressed like a peasant, and with the hands of an aristocrat. Tomorrow I will send you further details. He will land on the morning of the second. Communicate this to the cruiser. Capture the corvette. Guillotine the man. End of section two. Section 3 of 93 by Victor Hugo, translated by Aline Delano. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part 1, Book 2, Chapter 2. Night with the Ship and the Passenger. The corvette, instead of sailing south in the direction of St. Catherine, headed to the north, then, veering towards the west, had boldly entered that arm of sea between Sark and Jersey called the Passage of the Deroute. There was then no lighthouse at any point on either coast. It had been a clear sunset. The night was darker than summer nights usually are. It was moonlight, but large clouds, rather of the equinox than of the solstice, overspread the sky, and, judging by appearances, the moon would not be visible until she reached the horizon at the moment of setting. A few clouds hung low near the surface of the sea and covered it with vapor. All this darkness was favorable, Gaqual, the pilot, intended to leave Jersey on the left, Guernsey on the right, and by boldly sailing between Anois and Dover, to reach some bay on the coast near Saint-Malo, a longer but safer route than the one through Minquier, for the French coaster had standing orders to keep an unusually sharp lookout between saint hélier and Granville. If the wind were favorable and nothing happened, by dint of setting all sail, Gacqual hoped to reach the coast of France at daybreak. All went well. The corvette had just passed Grenaise. Towards nine o'clock the weather looked sullen, as the sailors express it, both wind and sea rising. But the wind was favorable, and the sea was rough, yet not heavy, waves now and then dashing over the bow of the corvette. The peasant, whom Lord Balcaras had called general, and whom the Prince de la Tour d'Auvergne had addressed as cousin, was a good sailor, and paced the deck of the corvette with calm dignity. He did not seem to notice that she rocked considerably. From time to time he took out of his waistcoat pocket a cake of chocolate, and, breaking off a piece, munched it. Though his hair was grey, his teeth were sound. He spoke to no one, except that from time to time he made a few concise remarks in an undertone to the captain, who listened to him deferentially, apparently regarding his passenger as the commander rather than himself. Unobserved in the fog, and skillfully piloted, the claymore coasted along the steep shore to the north of Jersey, hugging the land to avoid the formidable reef of Pierre de Lique, which lies in the middle of the strait between Jersey and Sark. Gacqual, at the helm, sighting in Turum Grove de Lique, Grenet, and Plémont, making the corvette glide in among those chains of reefs, felt his way along to a certain extent, but with the self-confidence of one familiar with the ways of the sea. The corvette had no light forward, fearing to betray its passage through these guarded waters. They congratulated themselves on the fog, the Grande Etape was reached. The mist was so dense that the lofty outlines of the pinnacle were scarcely visible. They heard it strike ten from the belfry of saint Ouen, a sign that the wind was still aft. All was going well. The sea grew rougher, because they were drawing near La Corbière. A little after ten, the Count Boisbretelot and the Chevalier de la Vieuxvie escorted the man in the peasant garb to the door of his cabin, which was the captain's own room. As he was about to enter, he remarked, lowering his voice. "'You understand the importance of keeping the secret, gentlemen. Silence up to the moment of explosion. You are the only ones here who know my name.' "'We will carry it to the grave,' replied Boisbertelot. "'And for my part I would not reveal it were I face to face with death,' remarked the old man. And he entered his stateroom. 
End of section 3. Section 4 of 93 by Victor Hugo, translated by Aline Delano. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part 1, Book 2, Chapter 3, Patrician and Plebeian United. The commander and the first officer returned on deck, and began to pace up and down side by side, talking as they walked. The theme was evidently their passenger, and this was the substance of the conversation which the wind wafted through the darkness. Bois-Bertelot grumbled half-audibly to La Vieuville. It remains to be seen whether or no he is a leader. La Vieuville replied, oh, Meanwhile, he is a prince. Almost. A nobleman in France, but a prince in Brittany. Like the Tremois and the Rohans. With whom he is connected. Bois-Bertelot resumed, In France and in the carriages of the king he is a marquis, as I am a count and you a chevalier. Oh, the carriages are far away, exclaimed Vieuville. We are living in the time of the tumbrel. A silence ensued. Bois-Bertelot went on. For lack of a French prince, we take one from Brittany. For lack of thrushes, no, since an eagle is not to be found, we take a crow. I should prefer a vulture, remarked Bois-Bertelot. La Vieuville replied, Oh, yes, indeed, with a beak and talons. We shall see. Yes, replied Vieuville. It is time there was a leader. I agree with Tontignac. A leader and gunpowder. See here, commander, I know nearly all the possible and impossible leaders, those of yesterday, those of today, and those of tomorrow. Not one of them has the head required for war. In this cursed Vendée, a general is needed who would be a lawyer as well as a leader. He must harass the enemy, dispute every bush, ditch, and stone. He must force unlucky quarrels upon him and take advantage of everything. Vigilant and pitiless, he must watch incessantly, slaughter freely, and make examples. Now, in this army of peasants there are heroes, but no captains. Dolbey is a non-entity. Lescure are an invalid. Bonchamp is merciful. He is kind, and that implies folly. La Roche Jacqueline is a superb sub-lieutenant. Sils is an officer good for the open field, but not suited for a war that needs a man of expedience. Cotillano is a simple teamster. Stoufflé is a crafty gamekeeper. Berard is inefficient. Boulanvilliers is absurd. Charette is horrible. I make no mention of Gaston the Barber. Mort de Montbleu! What is the use of opposing revolution? And what is the difference between ourselves and the Republicans if we set barbers over the heads of noblemen? The fact is that this beastly revolution has contaminated all of us. It is the itch of France. It is the itch of the tiers etat, rejoined Bois-Bertelot. England alone can help us. And she will, Captain, undoubtedly. Meanwhile, it is an ugly state of affairs. Yes, rustics everywhere. A monarchy that has Stoufflé, the gamekeeper of Monsieur de Molivrier, for a commander, has no reason to envy a republic whose minister is Pache. The son of the Duc de Castrier is Porter. <laughs> what men this Vendian war brings face to face! On one side, Santerre, the brewer. On the other, Gaston, the hairdresser. My dear La Vieuville, I feel some respect for this Gaston. He behaved well in his command of Guémenet. He had three hundred blues neatly shot after making them dig their own graves. Well enough done, but I could have done quite as well as he. <laughs> Pardieu, to be sure, and I too. The great feats of war, said Vieuville, require noble blood in those who perform them. These are matters for knights and not for hairdressers. But yet there are estimable men in this third estate, rejoined Bobetelot. Take that watchmaker Jolie, for instance. He was formerly a sergeant in a Flanders regiment. He becomes a Vendean chief and commander of a coast band. He has a son, a Republican. And while the father serves in the ranks of the whites, the son serves in those of the blues. An encounter, a battle, the father captures the son and blows out his brains. He did well, said La Vieuville. A royalist Brutus, answered Boisbertelot. Nevertheless, it is unendurable to be under the command of a Coquereau, a jean Jean, a Moulin, a Faucard, a Beaujou, a Chope. My dear Chevalier, 
The opposite party is quite as indignant. We are crowded with plebeians. They have an excess of nobles. Do you think the sans culottes like to be commanded by the Count de Canclos, the Viscount de Miranda, the Viscount de Beauharnais, the Count de Valence, the Marquis de Custine, and the Duc de Biron? What a combination! And the Duc de Chartres. Son of Egalité! By the way, when will he be king? Never. He aspires to the throne, and his very crimes serve to promote his interests. And his vices will injure his cause, said Boisbertelot. Then, after another pause, he continued, Nevertheless, he was anxious to be reconciled. He came to see the king. I was at Versailles when someone spit on his back. From the top of the grand staircase? Yes. I am glad of it. We called him Bourbon the Bourbeau. He is bald-headed. He has pimples. He is a regicide. <laughs> and La Vuville added, I was with him at Wissant. On the Saint-Esprit? Yes. Had he obeyed Admiral d'Orvilliers' signal to keep to the windward, he would have prevented the English from passing. True. Was he really hidden in the bottom of the hold? No, but we must say so all the same. And La Vieuville burst out laughing. Boisbertelot continued. <laughs> Fools are plentiful. Look here. I have known this Boulanvilliers of whom you were speaking. I knew him well. At first the peasants were armed with pikes. Would you believe it? He took it into his head to form them into pikemen. He wanted to drill them in crossing pikes and repelling a charge. He dreamed of transforming these barbarians into regular soldiers. He undertook to teach them how to round in the corners of their squares, and to mass battalions with hollow squares. He jabbered the antiquated military dialect to them. He called the chief of a squad a cop de scad, which was what corporals under Louis XIV were called. He persisted in forming a regiment of all those poachers. He had regular companies whose sergeants ranged themselves in a circle every evening, and, receiving the sign and countersign from the colonel's sergeant, repeated it in a whisper to the lieutenant's sergeant, who repeated it to his next neighbor, who in his turn transmitted it to the next man, and so on from ear to ear until it reached the last man. He cashiered an officer for not standing bareheaded to receive the watchword from the sergeant. You may imagine how he succeeded. This simpleton could not understand that peasants have to be led peasant fashion, and that it is impossible to transform rustics into soldiers. Yes, I have known Boulanvilliers. They walked along a few steps, each one engrossed in his own thoughts. Then the conversation was resumed. By the way, has the report of Dompierre's death been confirmed? Yes, Commander. Before Condé. At the camp of Fomars, he was hit by a cannonball. Boisbertelot sighed. <sighs> Count Dampierre, another of our men who took sides with them. May he prosper wherever he may be, said Vuville. And the ladies, where are they? At Trieste. Still there. Yes, ah, this republic, exclaimed La Vuville. What havoc from so slight a cause! To think that this revolution was the result of a deficit of only a few millions. Insignificant beginnings are not always to be trusted. Everything goes wrong, replied La Vuville. Yes, La Rouerie is dead. Dutrisna is an idiot. What wretched leaders are all those bishops? This Goussy, bishop of La Rochelle. Beaupois saint Audard, bishop of Poitiers. Mercy, bishop of Luzon, a lover of Madame de la Chasserie. Whose name is Servanteau, you know, commander? Miss Chasserie is the name of an estate. And that false bishop of Agra, who is a curé of I know not what. Of Dole. His name is Guillaume de Folleville. But then he is brave and knows how to fight. Priests when one needs soldiers. Bishops who are no bishops at all. Generals who are no generals. La Vieville interrupted Boisbertelot. Have you the moniteur in your stateroom, commander? Yes. What are they giving now in Paris? Hadel and Pauline and La Caverne. I should like to see that. You may. We shall be in Paris in a month. Boisbertelot thought a moment and then added, At the latest. Uh, so Mr. Wyndham told Lord Hood. Well, then, Commander, I take it affairs are not going so very badly. All would go well, provided that the Breton War were well managed. De Vieuville shook his head. Commander, he said, are we to land the Marines? Certainly, if the coast is friendly, but not otherwise. 
In some cases war must force the gates, in others it can slip through them. Civil war must always keep a false key in its pocket. We will do all we can, but one must have a chief. And Waubertelot added thoughtfully, What do you think of the Chevalier de la Duzy, La Viville? Do you mean the younger? Yes. For a commander? Yes. He is only good for a pitched battle in the open field. It is only the peasant who knows the underbrush. In that case, you may as well resign yourself to General Stofflet and Catelineau. La Vieuville meditated for a moment. Then he said, What we need is a prince, a French prince, a prince of the blood, a real prince. How can that be, he who says prince? Says coward, I know it, commander, but we need him for the impression he would produce upon the herd. My dear Chevalier, the princes don't care to come. We will do without them. Robertelot pressed his hand mechanically against his forehead, as if striving to evoke an idea. He resumed. Then let us try this general. He is a great nobleman. Do you think he will do? If he is one of the right sort, said La Vieuville. You mean relentless, said Robertelot. The Count and the Chevalier looked at each other. Monsieur Barbetelot, you have defined the meaning of the word. Relentless. Yes, that's what we need. This is a war that shows no mercy. The bloodthirstier and the ascendant. The regicides have beheaded Louis XVI. We will quarter the regicides. Yes, the general we need is General Relentless. In Anjou and Upper Poitou, the leaders play the magnanimous. They trifle with generosity, and they are always defeated. In the Marais and the country of Retz, where the leaders are ferocious, everything goes bravely forward. It is because Charette is fierce that he stands his ground against Parrain. Hyena pitted against Hyena. Boisbertelot had no time to answer. Viville's words were suddenly cut short by a desperate cry, and at the same instant they heard a noise unlike all other sounds. This cry, and the unusual sounds, came from the interior of the vessel. The captain and the lieutenant rushed to the gun deck, but were unable to enter. All the gunners came running up, beside themselves with terror. A frightful thing had just happened. End of section 4「Section 5 of 93 by Victor Hugo, translated by Aline Delano. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part 1, Book 2, Chapter 4, Tormentum Belli. One of the carronades of the battery, a 24-pound cannon, had become loose. This is perhaps the most dreadful thing that can take place at sea. Nothing more terrible can happen to a man of war under full sail. A cannon that breaks loose from its fastenings is suddenly transformed into a supernatural beast. It is a monster developed from a machine. This mass runs along on its wheels as easily as a billiard ball. It rolls with the rolling, pitches with the pitching, comes and goes, stops, seems to meditate, begins anew, darts like an arrow from one end of the ship to the other, whirls around, turns aside, evades, rears, hits out, crushes, kills, exterminates. It is a ram battering a wall at its own pleasure. Moreover, the battering ram is iron, the wall is wood. It is matter set free. One might say that this eternal slave is wreaking its vengeance. It would seem as though the evil in what we call inanimate objects had found vent and suddenly burst forth. It has the air of having lost its patience, and of taking a mysterious, dull revenge. Nothing is so inexorable as the rage of the inanimate. The mad mass leaps like a panther. It has the weight of an elephant, the agility of a mouse, the obstinacy of the axe. It takes one by surprise, like the surge of the sea. It flashes like lightning. It is deaf as the tomb. It weighs ten thousand pounds, and it bounds like a child's ball. It whirls as it advances, and the circles it describes are intersected by right angles. And what help is there? How can it be overcome? A calm succeeds the tempest, a cyclone passes over, a wind dies away. We replace the broken mass, we check the leak, we extinguish the fire. But what is to be done with this enormous bronze beast? How can it be subdued? You can reason with a mastiff, take a bull by surprise, fascinate a snake, frighten a tiger, mollify a lion. But there is no resource with the monster known as a loosened gun. You cannot kill it, it is already dead, and yet it lives. 
it breathes a sinister life bestowed on it by the infinite. The plank beneath sways it to and fro. It is moved by the ship. The sea lifts the ship, and the wind keeps the sea in motion. This destroyer is a toy. Its terrible vitality is fed by the ship, the waves, and the wind, each lending its aid. What is to be done with this complication? How fetter this monstrous mechanism of shipwreck? How foresee its comings and goings, its recoils, its halts, its shocks? Any one of those blows may stave in the side of the vessel. How can one guard against these terrible gyrations? One has to do with a projectile that reflects, that has ideas and changes its direction at any moment. How can one arrest an object in its course whose onslaught must be avoided? The dreadful cannon rushes about, advances, recedes, strikes to right and to left, flies here and there, baffles their attempts at capture, sweeps away obstacles, crushing men like flies. The extreme danger of the situation comes from the unsteadiness of the deck. How is one to cope with the caprices of an inclined plane? The ship had within its depths, so to speak, imprisoned lightning struggling for escape, something like the rumbling of thunder during an earthquake. In an instant the crew was on its feet. It was the chief gunner's fault, who had neglected to fasten the screw-nut of the breaching chain, and had not thoroughly chalked the four trucks of the carronade, which allowed play to the frame and bottom of the gun carriage, thereby disarranging the two platforms and parting the breaching. The lashings were broken, so that the gun was no longer firm on its carriage. The stationary breaching which prevents the recoil was not in use at that time. As a wave struck the ship's side, the cannon, insufficiently secured, had receded, and having broken its chain, began to wander threateningly over the deck. In order to get an idea of this strange sliding, fancy a drop of water sliding down a pane of glass. When the fastening broke, the gunners were in the battery, singly and in groups, clearing the ship for action. The carronade, thrown forward by the pitching, dashed into a group of men, killing four of them at the first blow. Then, hurled back by the rolling, it cut in two an unfortunate fifth man, and struck and dismounted one of the guns of the larboard battery. Hence the cry of distress which had been heard. All the men rushed to the ladder. The gun deck was empty in the twinkling of an eye. The monstrous gun was left to itself. It was its own mistress, and mistress of the ship. It could do with it whatsoever it wished. This crew, accustomed to laugh in battle, now trembled. It would be impossible to describe their terror. Captain Boisbertelot and Lieutenant Lavuville, brave men though they were, paused at the top of the ladder, silent, pale, and undecided, looking down on the deck. Someone pushed them aside with his elbow and descended. It was their passenger, the peasant, the man about whom they were talking a moment ago. Having reached the bottom of the ladder, he halted. End of section 5、section、six of、by Victor Hugo, translated by Aline Delano. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part one, book two, chapter five, vis et vir. The cannon was rolling to and fro on the deck. It might have been called the living chariot of the apocalypse. A dim wavering of lights and shadows was added to this spectacle by the marine lantern swinging under the deck. The outlines of the cannon were indistinguishable by reason of the rapidity of its motion. Sometimes it looked black when the light shone upon it. Then again it would cast pale, glimmering reflections in the darkness. It was still pursuing its work of destruction. It had already shattered four other pieces and made two breaches in the ship's side, fortunately above the water line, but which would leak in case of rough weather. It rushed frantically against the timbers. The stout riders resisted. Curved timbers have great strength, but one could hear them crack under this tremendous assault brought to bear simultaneously on every side. With a certain omnipresence truly appalling. A bullet shaken in a bottle could not produce sharper or more rapid sounds. The four wheels were passing and repassing over the dead bodies, cutting and tearing them to pieces, and the five corpses had become five trunks rolling hither and thither. The heads seemed to cry out. Streams of blood flowed over the deck, following the motion of the ship. The ceiling, damaged in several places, had begun to give way. The whole ship was filled with a dreadful tumult. 
The captain, who had rapidly recovered his self-possession, had given orders to throw down the hatchway all that could abate the rage and check the mad onslaught of this infuriated gun. Mattresses, hammocks, spare sails, coils of rope, the bags of the crew, and bales of false assignats, with which the corvette was laden, that infamous stratagem of English origin being considered a fair trick in war. But what availed these rags? No one dared to go down to arrange them, and in a few moments they were reduced to lint. There was just sea enough to render this accident as complete as possible. A tempest would have been welcome. It might have upset the cannon, and with its four wheels once in the air, it could easily have been mastered. Meanwhile the havoc increased. There were even incisions and fractures in the masts that stood like pillars grounded firmly in the keel and piercing the several decks of the vessel. The mizzenmast was split, and even the mainmast was damaged by the convulsive blows of the cannon. The destruction of the battery still went on. Ten out of the thirty pieces were useless. The fractures in the side increased, and the corvette began to leak. The old passenger, who had descended to the gun deck, looked like one carved in stone as he stood motionless at the foot of the stairs and glanced sternly over the devastation. It would have been impossible to move a step upon the deck. Each bound of the liberated carronade seemed to threaten the destruction of the ship, but a few moments longer and shipwreck would be inevitable. They must either overcome this calamity or perish. Some decisive action must be taken, but what? What a combatant was this carronade! Here was this mad creature to be arrested, this flash of lightning to be seized, this thunderbolt to be crushed. Boisbertelot said to Vieville, Do you believe in God, Chevalier? Yes and no. Sometimes I do, replied La Vieville. In a tempest. Yes, and in moments like these. Truly God alone can save us, said Boisbertelot. All were silent leaving the carronade to its horrible uproar. The waves beating the ship from without answered the blows of the cannon within, very much like a couple of hammers striking in turn. Suddenly, in the midst of this inaccessible circus, where the escaped cannon was tossing from side to side, a man appeared, grasping an iron bar. It was the author of the catastrophe, the chief gunner, whose criminal negligence had caused the accident, the captain of the gun. Having brought about the evil, his intention was to repair it. Holding a handspike in one hand, and in the other a tiller rope with the slip-noose in it, he had jumped through the hatchway to the deck below. Then began a terrible struggle, a titanic spectacle, a combat between cannon and cannoneer, a contest between mind and matter, a duel between man and the inanimate. The man stood in one corner in an attitude of expectancy, leaning on the rider and holding in his hand the bar and the rope. Calm, livid, and tragic, he stood firmly on his legs that were like two pillars of steel. He was waiting for the cannon to approach him. The gunner knew his piece, and he felt as though it must know him. They had lived together a long time. How often had he put his hand in its mouth? It was his domestic monster. He began to talk to it as he would to a dog. Come, said he. Possibly he loved it. He seemed to wish for its coming, and yet its approach meant sure destruction for him. How to avoid being crushed was the question. All looked on in terror. Not a breath was drawn freely, except perhaps by the old man, who remained on the gun deck gazing sternly on the two combatants. He himself was in danger of being crushed by the piece. Still he did not move. Beneath them the blind sea had command of the battle. When, in the act of accepting this awful hand-to-hand -hand struggle, the gunner approached to challenge the cannon, it happened that the surging sea held the gun motionless for an instant, as though stupefied. "'Come on,' said the man. It seemed to listen. Suddenly it leaped towards him. The man dodged. Then the struggle began, a contest unheard of, the fragile wrestling with the invulnerable, the human warrior attacking the brazen beast, blind force on the one side, soul on the other. All this was in the shadow. It was like an indistinct vision of a miracle. A soul. Strangely enough, it seemed as if a soul existed within the cannon, but one consumed with hate and rage. The blind thing seemed to have eyes. It appeared as though the monster were watching the man. There was, or at least one might have supposed it, cunning in this mass. It also chose its opportunity. 
It was as though a gigantic insect of iron was endowed with the will of a demon. Now and then this colossal grasshopper would strike the low ceiling of the gun deck, then falling back on its four wheels like a tiger on all fours rush upon the man. He, supple, agile, adroit, writhed like a serpent before these lightning movements. He avoided encounters, but the blows from which he escaped fell with destructive force upon the vessel. A piece of broken chain remained attached to the carronade. This bit of chain had twisted in some incomprehensible way around the breech button. One end of the chain was fastened to the gun carriage. The other end thrashed wildly around, aggravating the danger with every bound of the cannon. The screw held it as in a clenched hand, and this chain, multiplying the strokes of the battering ram by those of the thong, made a terrible whirlwind around the gun, a lash of iron and a fist of brass. This chain complicated the combat. Despite all this, the man fought. He even attacked the cannon at times, crawling along by the side of the ship and clutching his handspike into the rope. The cannon seemed to understand his movements and fled as though suspecting a trap. The man, nothing daunted, pursued his chase. Such a struggle must necessarily be brief. Suddenly the cannon seemed to say to itself, Now then, there must be an end to this. And it stopped. A crisis was felt to be at hand. The cannon, as if in suspense, seemed to meditate. Or, for to all intents and purposes it was a living creature, it really did meditate, some furious design. All at once it rushed on the gunner, who sprang aside with a laugh, crying out, Try it again! as the cannon passed him. The gun in its fury smashed one of the larboard carronades. Then, by the invisible sling in which it seemed to be held, it was thrown to the starboard, towards the man who escaped. Three carronades were crushed by its onslaught. Then, as though blind and beside itself, it turned from the man and rolled from stern to stem, splintering the latter, and causing a breach in the walls of the prow. The gunner took refuge at the foot of the ladder, a short distance from the old man who stood watching. He held his handspike in readiness. The cannon seemed aware of it, and without taking the trouble to turn it rushed backward on the man, as swift as the blow of an axe. The gunner, if driven up against the side of the ship, would be lost. One cry arose from the crew. The old passenger, who until this moment had stood motionless, sprang forward more swiftly than all those mad whirls. He had seized a bale of the false assignats, and at the risk of being crushed succeeded in throwing it between the wheels of the carronade. This decisive and perilous maneuver could not have been executed with more precision and adroitness by an adept in all the exercises given in the work of Duracell's Manual of Naval Gunnery. The bale had the effect of a plug. A pebble may block a log. A branch sometimes changes the course of an avalanche. The carronade stumbled, and the gunner, availing himself of the perilous opportunity, thrust his iron bar between the spokes of the back wheels. Pitching forward, the cannon stopped and the man, using his bar for a lever, rocked it backward and forward. The heavy mass upset, with the resonant sound of a bell that crashes in its fall. The man, reeking with perspiration, threw himself upon it, and passed the slip-noose of the tiller rope around the neck of the defeated monster. The combat was ended. The man had conquered. The ant had overcome the mastodon. The pygmy had imprisoned the thunderbolt. The soldiers and sailors applauded, the crew rushed forward with chains and cables, and in an instant the cannon was secured. Saluting the passenger, the gunner exclaimed, "'Sir, you have saved my life!' The old man had resumed his impassable attitude, and made no reply. End of section 6 Section 7 of 93 by Victor Hugo, translated by Aline Delano this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part 1, Book 2, Chapter 6 The Two Ends of the Scale The man had conquered, but it might be affirmed that the cannon also had gained a victory. Immediate shipwreck was averted, but the corvette was still in danger. The injuries the ship had sustained seemed irreparable. There were five breaches in the sides, one of them, a very large one, in the bow, and twenty carronades out of thirty lay shattered in their frames. The recaptured gun, which had been secured by a chain, was itself disabled. The screw of the breech button being wrenched, it would consequently be impossible to level the cannon. The battery was reduced to nine guns. There was a leakage in the hold. 
All these damages must be repaired without loss of time, and the pumps set in operation. Now that the gun deck had become visible, it was frightful to look upon. The interior of a mad elephant's cage could not have been more thoroughly devastated. However important it might be for the corvette to avoid observation, the care for its immediate safety was still more imperative. They were obliged to light the deck with lanterns placed at intervals along the sides. In the meantime, while this tragic entertainment had lasted, the crew, entirely absorbed by a question of life and death, had not noticed what was going on outside of the ship. The fog had thickened, the weather had changed, the wind had driven the vessel at will. They were out of their course, in full sight of Jersey and Guernsey, much farther to the south than they ought to have been, and confronting a tumultuous sea. The big waves kissed the wounded sides of the corvette with kisses that savored of danger. The heaving of the sea grew threatening. The wind had risen to a gale. A squall, perhaps a tempest, was brewing. One could not see four oars' length before one. While the crew made haste with their temporary repairs on the gun deck, stopping the leaks and setting up the cannons that had escaped uninjured, the old passenger returned to the deck. He stood leaning against the mainmast. He had taken no notice of what was going on in the ship. The Chevalier de la Viville had drawn up the marines on either side of the mainmast, and at a signal whistle of the boatswain, the sailors, who had been busy in the rigging, stood up on the yards. Count Boisbertelot approached the passenger. The captain was followed by a man who, haggard and panting, with his dress in disorder, still wore on his countenance an expression of content. It was the gunner who had so opportunely displayed his power as a tamer of monsters, and gained the victory over the cannon. The count made a military salute to the old man in the peasant garb, and said to him, Here is the man, general. The gunner, with downcast eyes, stood erect in a military attitude. General, resumed Count Barbertolo, considering what this man has done, do you not think that his superiors have a duty to perform? I think so, replied the old man. Be so good as to give your orders, resumed Barbertolo. It is for you to give them. You are the captain. But you are the general, answered Barbertolo. The old man looked at the gunner. Step forward, he said. The gunner advanced a step. Turning to Count Barbertolo, the old man removed the cross of St. Louis from the captain's breast and fastened it on the jacket of the gunner. The sailors cheered, and the marines presented arms. Then, pointing to the bewildered gunner, he added, Now let the man be shot. Stupor took the place of applause. Then, amid a tomb-like silence, the old man, raising his voice, said, The ship has been endangered by an act of carelessness, and may even yet be lost. It is all the same whether one be at sea or face to face with the enemy. A ship at sea is like an army in battle. The tempest, though unseen, is ever present. The sea is an ambush. Death is the fit penalty for every fault committed when facing the enemy. There is no fault that can be retrieved. Courage must be rewarded, and negligence punished. These words fell one after the other, slowly and gravely, with a certain implacable rhythm, like the strokes of the axe upon an oak tree. Looking at the soldiers, the old man added, Do your duty. The man on whose breast shone the cross of St. Louis bowed his head, and at a sign of Count Barbertelot two sailors went down to the gun deck, and presently returned bringing the hammock shroud. The two sailors were accompanied by the ship's chaplain, who since the departure had been engaged in saying prayers in the officers' quarters. A sergeant detached from the ranks twelve soldiers, whom he arranged in two rows, six men in a row. The gunner placed himself between the two lines. The chaplain, holding a crucifix, advanced and took his place beside the man. March! came from the lips of the sergeant, and the platoon slowly moved towards the bow, followed by two sailors carrying the shroud. A gloomy silence fell on the corvette. In the distance a hurricane was blowing. A few moments later a report echoed through the gloom. One flash, and all was still. Then came the splash of a body falling into the water. The old passenger, still leaning against the mainmast, his hands crossed on his breast, seemed lost in thought. Boisbertelot, pointing towards him with the forefinger of his left hand, remarked in an undertone to La Viville, The Vendée has found a leader. End of section 7
Section 8 of 93 by Victor Hugo, translated by Aline Delano. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part 1, Book 2, Chapter 7. He who sets sail invests in a lottery. But what was to become of the corvette? The clouds that had mingled all night with the waves had now fallen so low that they overspread the sea like a mantle and completely shut out the horizon. Nothing but fog. All was a dangerous situation even for a seaworthy vessel. A heavy swell was added to the mist. They had improved their time. The corvette had been lightened by throwing into the sea everything that they had been able to clear away after the havoc caused by the carronade. Dismantled cannons, gun carriages, twisted or loosened timbers, splintered pieces of wood and iron. The portholes were opened, and the corpses and parts of human bodies, wrapped in tarpaulin, were slid down on planks into the sea. The sea was running high. Not that the tempest was imminent. On the other hand, it seemed as if the hurricane that was rumbling afar off on the horizon and the wind were both decreasing and moving northward, but the waves were still high, showing an angry sea, and the corvette in its disabled condition could with difficulty resist the shocks, so that the high waves might prove fatal to it. Gaqual, absorbed in thought, remained at the helm. To show a bold front in the presence of danger is the habit of commanders. La Vieville, whose spirits rose in time of trouble, addressed Gaqual. "'Well, pilot,' he said, "'the squall has subsided. Its sneezing fit came to naught. We shall pull through. We shall get some wind and nothing more.' "'We can't have wind without waves.' A true sailor, neither gay nor sad, and his reply was charged with an anxious significance. For a leaking ship, a high sea means a rapid sinking. Gaqual had emphasized this prediction by frowning. Perhaps he thought that after the catastrophe with the cannon and the gunner, La Vieville had been too quick to use light-hearted, almost cheerful words. Certain things bring ill luck at sea. The sea is reticent. One never knows its intentions, and it is well to be on one's guard. La Vieville felt obliged to resume his gravity. "'Where are we, pilot?' he asked. In the hands of God, replied the pilot. A pilot is a master. He must always be allowed to do what pleases him, and often to say what he chooses. That kind of man is not apt to be loquacious. La Vieville left him, after asking a question to which the horizon soon replied. The sea had suddenly cleared. The trailing fogs were rent. The dusky heaving waves stretched as far as the eye could penetrate into the dim twilight and this was the sight that lay before them. The sky was shut in by clouds, although they no longer touched the water. The dawn had begun to illumine the east, while in the west the setting moon still cast a pale, glimmering light. These two pallid presences in opposite quarters of the sky outlined the horizon in two narrow bands of light between the dark sea and the gloomy sky. Black silhouettes were sketched against them, upright and motionless. In the west, against the moonlit sky, three high cliffs stood forth, like Celtic cromlechs. In the east, against the pale horizon of the morning, eight sails drawn up in a row in formidable array came in view. The three cliffs were a reef, the eight sails a squadron. Behind them was Minquier, a cliff of ill repute, and in front were the French cruisers. With an abyss on the left hand and carnage on the right, they had to choose between shipwreck and a battle. The corvette must either encounter the cliffs with a damaged hull, a shattered rigging, and broken masts, or face a battle, knowing that twenty out of the thirty cannons of which her artillery consisted were disabled, and the best of her gunners dead. The dawn was still faint, and the night not yet ended. This darkness might possibly last for quite a long time, as it was caused mostly by the clouds that hung high in the air, thick and dense, looking like a solid vault. The wind had scattered the sea fog, driving the corvette on Minquier. In her extreme weakness, and dilapidated as she was, she hardly obeyed the helm as she rolled helplessly along, lashed onward by the force of the waves. The Minquier, that tragic reef, was more dangerous at that time than it is now. Several of the turrets of this marine fortress have been worn away by the incessant action of the sea. The form of reefs changes. Waves are fitly likened unto swords, each tide is like the stroke of a saw. At that time, to be stranded on the Minquier meant certain death. 
the cruisers composed the squadron of Cancale, the one that afterwards became so famous under the command of Captain Duchesne, called by Lequinio Père Duchesne. The situation was critical. During the struggle with the carronade, the ship had wandered unconsciously from her course, sailing more in the direction of Granville than of Saint Malo. Even had her sailing power been unimpaired, the Minquier would have barred her return to Jersey, while the cruisers hindered her passage towards France. Although there was no storm, yet, as the pilot had said, the sea was rough. Rolled by the heavy wind over a rocky bottom, it had grown savage. The sea never tells what it wants at the first onset. Everything lies concealed in its abyss, even trickery. One might almost affirm that it has a scheme. It advances and recedes. It offers and refuses. It arranges for a storm and suddenly gives up its intention. It promises an abyss and fails to keep its agreement. It threatens the north and strikes the south. All night long the corvette Claymore labored with the fog and feared the storm. The sea had disappointed them in a savage sort of way. It had drawn a storm in outline and filled in the picture with a reef. It was to be a shipwreck in any event, but it had assumed another form, and with one enemy to supplement the work of the other, it was to combine a wreck on the surf with destruction by battle. "'A shipwreck on the one hand and a fight on the other!' exclaimed Riville amid his gallant laughter. <laughs> "'We have thrown double fives on both sides!' End of section 8「Section 9 of 93 by Victor Hugo, translated by Aline Delano. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part 1, Book 2, Chapter 8, 9 to 380. The corvette was little better than a wreck. A sepulchral solemnity pervaded the dim twilight, the darkness of the clouds, the confused changes of the horizon, and the mysterious sullenness of the waves. There was no sound except the hostile blasts of the wind. The catastrophe rose majestic from the abyss. It looked more like an apparition than an attack. No stir on the rocks, no stir on the ships. The silence was overpowering beyond description. Were they dealing with reality? It was like a dream passing over the sea. There are legends that tell of such visions. The corvette lay, so to speak, between a demon reef and a phantom fleet. Count Boisbertelot in a low voice gave orders to La Vieuville, who went down to the gun deck, while the captain, seizing his telescope, stationed himself behind the pilot. Gacquois's sole effort was to keep up the corvette to the wind, for if struck on her side by the sea and the wind she would inevitably capsize. Pilot, where are we? said the captain. On the Mincure. On which side? On the worst one. What kind of bottom? Small rocks. Can we turn broadside on? We can always die. The captain turned his spyglass towards the west and examined the Minquier. Then, turning it to the east, he watched the sails that were in sight. The pilot went on as though speaking to himself. Yonder is the Minquier. That is where the laughing sea mew and the great black hooded gulls stop to rest when they migrate from Holland. Meanwhile, the captain had counted the sails. There were indeed eight ships drawn up in line, their warlike profiles rising above the water. In the center was seen the stately outline of a three-decker. The captain questioned the pilot. Do you know those ships? Of course I do. What are they? That's the squadron. Of the French? Of the devil. A silence ensued and again the captain resumed his questions. Are all the cruisers there? No, not all. In fact, on the 2nd of April, Valaze had reported to the convention that ten frigates and six ships of the line were cruising in the channel. The captain remembered this. You are right, he said. The squadron numbers sixteen ships, and only eight are here. The others are struggling along the coast, down below, on the lookout, said Gacquoil. Still gazing through his spyglass, the captain murmured, One three-decker, two first-class and five second-class frigates. I, too, have seen them close at hand, muttered Gacquoil. I know them too well to mistake one for the other. The captain passed his glass to the pilot. 
Pilot, can you make out distinctly the largest ship? Yes, Commander, it is the Côte d'Or. They have given it a new name. It used to be the Etat de Bourgogne, a new ship of a hundred and twenty-eight cannon. He took a memorandum book and pencil from his pocket, and wrote down the number, one hundred and twenty-eight. Pilot, what is the first ship on the port? The Experimenté. A frigate of the first class, fifty-two guns. She was fitting out at Brest two months ago. The captain put down on his notebook the number, fifty-two. What is the second ship to port, pilot? The Driard. A frigate of the first class, forty eighteen pounders She has been in India and has a glorious military record. And below the fifty-two he wrote the number forty. Then, raising his head, he said, Now, on the starboard. They are all second-class frigates, Commander. There are five of them. Which is the first one from the ship? The Raison Rouge. The thirty-two eighteen-pounders. The second? The Richmond. Same. Next. The Arthay. A queer name to sail under. Next. The Calypso. Next. The Preneuse. Five frigates, each of thirty-two guns. The captain wrote one hundred and sixty under the first numbers. You are sure you recognize them, pilot? he asked. You also know them well, commander. It is something to recognize them, but it is better to know them. The captain, with his eyes on the notebook, was adding up the column to himself. One hundred and twenty-eight, fifty-two, forty, one hundred and sixty. Just then La Viville came up on deck. Chevalier, exclaimed the captain, we are facing three hundred and eighty cannon. So be it, replied La Viville. You have just been making an inspection, La Viville. How many guns have we fit for service? Nine. So be it, responded Boisbertolot in his turn, and taking the telescope from the pilot, he scanned the horizon. The eight black and silent ships, though they appeared immovable, continued to increase in size. They were gradually drawing nearer. La Fiville saluted the captain. Commander, he said, here is my report. I mistrusted this corvette, Claymore. It is never pleasant to be suddenly ordered on board a ship that neither knows nor loves you. An English ship is a traitor to the French. That slut of a carronade proved this. I have made the inspection. The anchors are good. They are not made of inferior iron, but hammered out of solid bars. The flukes are solid. The cables are excellent, easy to pay out and have the requisite length of one hundred and twenty fathoms, plenty of ammunition, six gunners dead. Each gun has one hundred and seventy-one rounds. Because there are only nine cannon left, rumbled the captain. Bois Bertolo leveled his glass to the horizon. The squadron continued its slow approach. Carronades have one advantage. Three men are sufficient to man them. But they also have a disadvantage. They do not carry as far, and shoot with less precision than cannon. It was therefore necessary to let the squadron approach within the range of the carronades. The captain gave his orders in a low voice. Silence reigned on the ship. No signal to clear the decks for action had been given, but still it had been done. The corvette was as helpless to cope with men as with the sea. They did their best with this remnant of a warship. Near the tiller ropes on the gangway were piled spare hawsers and cables, to strengthen the mast in case of need. The quarters for the wounded were put in order. According to the naval practice of those days, they barricaded the deck, which is a protection against balls, but not against bullets. The ball gauges were brought, although it was rather late to ascertain the caliber, but they had not anticipated so many incidents. Cartridge boxes were distributed among the sailors, and each one secured a pair of pistols and a dirk in his belt. Hammocks were stowed away, guns were pointed, and muskets, axes, and grapplings prepared. The cartridge and bullet stores were put in readiness. The powder magazine was opened. Every man stood at his post. Not a word was spoken while these preparations went on amid haste and gloom, and it seemed like the room of a dying person. Then the corvette was turned broadside on. She carried six anchors like a frigate, and all of them were cast, the spear anchor forward, the kedger aft, the sea anchor towards the open, the ebb anchor towards the breakers, the bower anchor to starboard, and the sheet anchor to port. The nine uninjured carronades were placed as a battery on the side towards the enemy. The squadron, equally silent, had also finished its evolutions. The eight ships now stood in a semicircle, of which Minquier formed the cord. 
The claymore, enclosed within this semicircle, and held furthermore by its own anchors, was backed by the reef, signifying shipwreck. It was like a pack of hounds surrounding a wild boar, not giving tongue, but showing its teeth. It seemed as if each side were waiting for something. The gunners of the claymore stood to their guns. Boisbertelot said to La Viville, I should like to be the first to open fire. A coquette's fancy, replied La Viville. End of section 9《ナイティスリー》by Victor Hugo, translated by Aline Delano. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part One, Book Two, Chapter Nine. Someone escapes. The passenger had not left the deck. He watched all that was going on with his customary impassibility. Boisbertelot went up to him. "Sir," he said, "the preparations are completed. We are now clinging to our grave. We shall not relax our hold." We must succumb either to the squadron or to the reef. The alternative is before us: either shipwreck among the breakers or surrender to the enemy. But the resource of death is still left. Better to fight than be wrecked. I would rather be shot than drowned. Fire before water, if the choice be left to me. But where it is our duty to die, it is not yours. You are the man chosen by princes. You have an important mission: that of directing the Vendean war. Your death might result in the failure of monarchy. Therefore, you must live. While honor requires us to stand by the ship, it calls on you to escape. You must leave us, General. I will provide you with a boat and a man. You may succeed in reaching the shore by making a detour. It is not yet daylight. The waves are high and the sea dark. You will probably escape. There are occasions when to flee means to conquer. The old man bent his stately head in token of acquiescence. Count Boisbertelot raised his voice. Soldiers and sailors, he called. Every movement ceased, and from all sides faces were turned in the direction of the captain. He continued, "This man who is among us represents the king. He has been entrusted to our care. We must save him. He is needed for the throne of France. As we have no prince, he is to be, at least we hope so, the leader of the Vendée. He is a great general. He was to land with us in France. Now he must land without us. If we save the head, we save all." Yes, yes, yes! Cried the voices of all the crew. The captain went on. He too is about to face a serious danger. It is not easy to reach the coast. The boat must be large enough to live in this sea and small enough to escape the cruisers. He must land at some safe point, and it will be better to do so nearer Fougeres than Coutances. We want a hardy sailor, a good oarsman, and a strong swimmer, a man from that neighborhood, and one who knows the straits. It is still so dark that a boat can put off from the corvette without attracting attention, and later there will be smoke enough to hide it from view. Its size will be an advantage in the shallows, where the panther is caught, the weasel escapes. Although there is no outlet for us, there may be for a small rowboat. The enemy's ships will not see it, and what is more, about that time we shall be giving them plenty of diversion. Is it decided? Yes, yes, yes! Cried the crew. Then there is not a moment to be lost," continued the captain. "Is there a man among you willing to undertake the business?" In the darkness, a sailor stepped out of the ranks and said, "I am the man." End of section ten. Section eleven of Ninety Three by Victor Hugo, translated by Aline Delano. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part One, Book Two, Chapter Ten. Does he escape? A few minutes later, one of those small boats called a gig, which are always devoted to the use of the captain, pushed off from the ship. There were two men in this boat: the passenger in the stern and the volunteer sailor in the bow. The night was still very dark. The sailor, according to the captain's instructions, rowed energetically toward the Minquier. For that matter, it was the only direction in which he could row. Some provisions had been placed in the bottom of the boat: a bag of biscuits, a smoked tongue, and a barrel of water. Just as they were lowering the gig, La Viville, a very scoffer in the presence of destruction, leaning over the stern post of the corvette, cried out in his cool, sneering voice a parting word: "Very good for escaping, and still better for drowning." "Sir, let us joke no more," said the pilot. 
They pushed off rapidly, and soon left the corvette far behind. Both wind and tide were in the oarsman's favor, and the small skiff flew rapidly along, wavering to and fro in the twilight, and hidden by the high crests of the waves. A gloomy sense of expectation brooded over the sea. Suddenly amid this illimitable, tumultuous silence a voice was heard, exaggerated by the speaking trumpet, as by the brazen mask of ancient tragedy, it seemed almost superhuman. It was Captain Boisbertelot speaking. "'Royal Marines!' he exclaimed. "'Nail the white flag to the mizzenmast. We are about to look upon our last sunrise.' And the corvette fired a shot. "'Long live the king!' shouted the crew. Then from the verge of the horizon was heard another shout, stupendous, remote, confused, and yet distinct. "'Long live the Republic!' and a din like unto the roar of three hundred thunderbolts exploded in the depths of the sea. The conflict began. The sea was covered with fire and smoke. Jets of spray thrown up by the balls as they struck the water rose from the sea on all sides. The claymore was pouring forth flame on the eight vessels. The squadron, ranged in a semicircle around her, opened fire from all its batteries. The horizon was in a blaze. A volcano seemed to have sprung from the sea. The wind swept to and fro this stupendous crimson drapery of battle, through which the vessels appeared and disappeared like phantoms. Against the red sky in the foreground were sketched the outlines of the corvette. The fleur-de-lis flag could be seen floating from the mainmast. The two men in the boat were silent. The triangular shoal of the Minquier, a kind of submarine trinacrium, is larger than the Isle of Jersey. The sea covers it. Its culminating point is a plateau that is never submerged, even at the highest tide, and from which rise, towards the northeast, six mighty rocks standing in a line, producing the effect of a massive wall which has crumbled here and there. The strait between the plateau and the six reefs is accessible only to vessels drawing very little water. Beyond this strait is the open sea. The sailor who had volunteered to manage the boat headed for the strait, Thus he had put Minquier between the boat and the battle. He navigated skillfully in the narrow channel, avoiding rocks to starboard and port. The cliff now hid the battle from their view. The flaming horizon and the furious din of the cannonade were growing less distinct by reason of the increased distance, but judging from the continued explosions one could guess that the corvette still held its own, and that it meant to use its hundred and ninety-one rounds to the very last. The boat soon found itself in smooth waters beyond the cliffs and the battle, and out of the reach of missiles. Gradually the surface of the sea lost something of its gloom. The rays of light that had been swallowed up in the shadows began to widen. The curling foam leaped forth in jets of light, and the broken waves sent back their pale reflections. Daylight appeared. The boat was beyond reach of the enemy, but the principal difficulty still remained to be overcome. It was safe from grape-shot, but the danger of shipwreck was not yet past. It was on the open sea, a mere shell, with neither deck, sail, mast, nor compass, entirely dependent on its oars, face to face with the ocean and the hurricane, a pygmy at the mercy of giants. Then amid this infinite solitude, his face whitened by the morning light, the man in the bow of the boat raised his head and gazed steadily at the man in the stern as he said, I am the brother of him whom you ordered to be shot. End of section 11. Section 12 of 93 by Victor Hugo, translated by Aline Delano. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part 1, Book 3, Almalo. Chapter 1, Speech is Word. The old man slowly lifted his head. He who had addressed him was about thirty years of age. The tan of the sea was upon his brow. There was something unusual about his eyes, as if the simple pupils of the peasant had taken on the keen expression of the sailor. He held his oars firmly in his hands. He looked gentle enough. In his belt he wore a dirk, two pistols, and a rosary. "'Who are you?' said the old man. I have just told you. What do you wish? The man dropped the oars, folded his arms, and replied, To kill you. As you please, replied the old man. The man raised his voice. 
Prepare yourself. For what? To die. Why? inquired the old man. A silence followed. For a moment the question seemed to abash the man. He continued, I tell you that I mean to kill you. And I ask if you the reason? The sailor's eyes flashed. Because you killed my brother. The old man answered quietly, I saved his life at first. True, you saved him first, but you killed him afterwards. It was not I who killed him. Who was it, then? His own fault. The sailor gazed on the old man open-mouthed. Then once more his brows contracted savagely. What is your name? asked the old man. My name is Amalo, but I can kill you all the same, whether you know my name or not. Just then the sun rose. A ray struck the sailor full in the face, vividly illumining that wild countenance. The old man studied it closely. The cannonading, though not yet ended, was no longer continuous. A dense smoke had settled upon the horizon. The boat, left to itself, was drifting to leeward. With his right hand the sailor seized one of the pistols at his belt, while in his left he held his rosary. The old man rose to his feet. "'Do you believe in God?' he asked. "'Our Father, who art in heaven,' replied the sailor. Then he made the sign of the cross. "'Have you a mother?' He crossed himself again, saying, "'I have said all I have to say. I give you one minute longer, my lord.' And he cocked the pistol. "'Why do you call me, my lord?' "'Because you are one. That is evident enough.' "'Have you a lord yourself?' "'Yes, and a grand one, too. Is one likely to be without a lord?' "'Where is he?' "'I do not know. He has left the country. His name is Marquis de Lantenac, Viscount de Fontenay, Prince in Brittany. He is lord of the Cette Forêt. I never saw him, but he is my master all the same. If you were to see him, would you obey him? Of course I should be a heathen were I not to obey him. We owe obedience to God, and after that to the king, who is like unto God, and then to the Lord, who is like the king. But that has nothing to do with the question. You have killed my brother, and I must kill you. The old man replied, let us say, then, that I did kill your brother. I did well. The sailor had closed more firmly upon his pistol. Come, he said. So be it, said the old man. And he added composedly, Where is the priest? The sailor looked at him. The priest? Yes, I gave your brother a priest. Therefore it is your duty to provide one for me. But I have none replied the sailor, and he continued, How do you expect to find a priest here on the open sea? The convulsive explosions of the battle sounded more and more distant. Those who are dying yonder have their priest, said the old man. I know it, muttered the sailor. They have the chaplain. The old man went on. If you make me lose my soul, it will be a serious matter. The sailor thoughtfully bent his head. And if my soul is lost, continued the old man, yours will be lost also. Listen to me. I feel pity for you. You shall do as you like. For my part, I only fulfilled my duty when I first saved your brother's life and afterwards took it from him. And at the present moment, I am doing my duty in trying to save your soul. Reflect, for it is a matter that concerns you. Do you hear the cannon shots? Men are dying over yonder, desperate men in their last agony, husbands who will never see their wives. Fathers who will never see their children. Brothers who, like yourself, will never see their brothers. And who is to blame for it? Your own brother. You believe in God, do you not? If so, you know that God is suffering now. He is suffering in the person of his son, the most Christian king of France, who is a child like the child Jesus, and who is now imprisoned in the temple. God is suffering in his church of Brittany, in his desecrated cathedrals, in his gospels torn to fragments in his violated houses of prayer, in his murdered priests. What were we about to do with that ship which is perishing at this moment? 
We were going to the relief of the Lord. If your brother had been a trustworthy servant, if he had performed his duties faithfully like a good and useful man, no misfortune would have happened to the carronade. The corvette would not have been disabled, she would not have got out of her course and fallen into the hands of that cursed fleet. And we should all now be landing in France, brave sailors and soldiers as we were, sword in hand with our white banner unfurled, a multitude of contented, happy men, advancing to the rescue of the brave Vendean peasants, on our way to save France, the King, and Almighty God. That is what we were intending to do, what we should have done, and what I, the only one remaining, still propose to do. But you intend to prevent me. In this struggle of impious men against priests, in this conflict of regicides against the King, of Satan against God, you range yourself in the ranks of Satan. Your brother was the devil's first assistant, you are his second. What he began, you mean to finish. You are for the regicides against the throne. You take sides with the impious against the church. You take away the Lord's last resource. For as I shall not be there, I who represent the king, villages will continue to burn, families to mourn, priests to bleed, Brittany to suffer, the king to remain imprisoned, and Jesus Christ to grieve over his people. And who will have caused all this? You. Well, you are carrying out your own plans. I expected far different things from you, but I was mistaken. It is true that I killed your brother. He played a brave part. For that I rewarded him. He was guilty, therefore I punished him. He failed in his duty. I have not failed in mine. What I did I would do again, and I swear by the great Saint Anne of Orai, who looks down on us, that under like circumstances I would shoot my own son just as I shot your brother. Now, you are the master. Indeed, I pity you. You have broken your word to the captain, you Christian without faith, you Breton without honor. I was entrusted to your loyalty, and you accepted the trust meaning to betray it. You offer my death to those to whom you have promised my life. Do you realize whom you are destroying here? It is your own self. You rob the king of my life, and you consign yourself forever to the devil. Go on, commit your crime. You set a low value on your share in paradise. Thanks to you the devil will conquer. Thanks to you, the churches will fall. Thanks to you, the heathen will go on turning bells into cannon. Men will be shot with the very instrument that once brought to mind the salvation of their souls. Perhaps at this moment, while I still speak to you, the same bell that pealed for your baptism is killing your mother. Go on with the devil's work. Do not pause. Yes, I have condemned your brother. But learn this. I am but a tool in the hands of God. Ah, you pretend to judge God's ways. You will next sit in judgment on the thunderbolt in the heavens. Wretched man, you will be judged by it. Beware what you do. Do you even know whether I am in a state of grace? No. Never mind. Go on. Do your will. You have the power to hurl me to perdition and yourself likewise. Your own damnation as well as mine rests in your hands. You will be answerable before God. We are alone face to face with the abyss. Complete your work. Make an end of it. I am old, and you are young. I have no weapons. You are armed. Kill me. While the old man, standing erect, was uttering these words in a voice that rang above the tumult of the sea, the undulations of the waves showed him now in shadow, now in light. The sailor had turned ghostly pale. Large drops of moisture fell from his brow. He trembled like a leaf. Now and then he kissed his rosary. When the old man finished, he threw away his pistol and fell on his knees. "'Pardon, my lord! Forgive me!' he cried. "'You speak like our lord himself. I have been wrong. My brother was guilty. I will do all I can to make amends for his crime. Dispose of me. Command me. I will obey.' "'I forgive you,' said the old man. End of section 12「Book Three, The provisions with which the boat had been stocked were far from superfluous, for the two fugitives were forced to make long detours, and were thirty-six hours in reaching the coast. They passed the night at sea, but the night was fine, with more moonlight than is pleasing to people who wish to escape observation. 
At first they were obliged to keep away from the French coast, and gain the open sea in the direction of Jersey. They heard the final volley from the unfortunate corvette, and it sounded like the roar of a lion whom the hunters are killing in the forest. Then a silence fell upon the sea. The corvette Claymore perished like the Vengeur, but glory has kept no record of its deeds. One can win no laurels who fights against his native land. Almalo was a remarkable sailor. He performed miracles of skill and sagacity. The route that he improvised amid the reefs, the waves, and the vigilance of the enemy was a masterpiece. The wind had abated, and the struggle with the sea was over. Almalo had avoided the Côte de Minquier, and having rounded the Chaussée au Boeuf, took refuge there, so as to get a few hours of rest in the little creek formed by the sea at low tide. Then, rowing southward, he continued to pass between Granville and the Chaussée Islands without being noticed by the lookout either of Chaussée or Granville. He entered the Bay of Saint-Michel, a daring feat considering that the cruising squadron was anchored at Cancal. On the evening of the second day, about an hour before sunset, he passed the hill of Saint-Michel, and landed on a shore that is always avoided on account of the danger from its shifting sand. Fortunately, the tide was high. Almalo pushed the boat as far as he could, tried the sand, and, finding it firm, grounded the boat and jumped ashore, the old man following, with eyes turned anxiously towards the horizon. "'My lord,' said Almalo, "'this is the mouth of the Quenon. We have Beauvoir to starboard, and win at the port. The belfry before us is Arvedon. The old man bent over the boat, took from it a biscuit which he put in his pocket, and said to Almalo, "'You may take the rest.' Almalo put what remained of meat and biscuit in the bag, and hoisted it on his shoulder. Having done this, he said, "'My lord, am I to lead the way, or to follow you?' "'You will do neither.' Almalo looked at the old man in amazement. The latter went on, "'We are about to separate Almalo, two men are of no use whatever. Unless they are a thousand, it is better for one man to be alone.' He stopped and pulled out of his pocket a knot of green silk resembling a cockade, with a fleur-de-lis embroidered in gold in the centre. "'Can you read?' he asked. "'No. Oh, that is fortunate. A man who knows how to read is embarrassing. Have you a good memory?' "'Yes.' "'Very well. Listen, Almalo. You will follow the road on the right, and I the one on the left. You are to turn in the direction of Bazouge, and I shall go toward Fougere. Keep your bag, because it makes you look like a peasant. Hide your weapons. Cut yourself a stick from the hedge. Creep through the tall rye. Glide behind the hedges. Climb over fences and cross the fields. You will thus avoid the passers-by as well as roads and bridges. Do not enter Pontorson. Ah, you will have to cross the Quinone. How will you manage that? I shall swim across. Excellent. Then you will come to a ford. Do you know where it is? Between Nancy and Vieuxvier. Correct. You are evidently familiar with the country. But night is coming on. Where will my lord sleep? I can take care of myself. And where will you sleep? There are plenty of a moose. I was a peasant before I was a sailor. Throw away your sailor hat. It would betray you. You can surely find some worsted head covering. Oh, a cap is easily found. The first fisherman I meet will sell me his. Very well. Now listen. You are familiar with the woods? All of them. Throughout this entire neighborhood? From Noirmoutier to Laval. Do you know their names, too? I know the woods and their names. I know all about them. You will forget nothing? Nothing. Good. Now mind. How many leagues can you walk in a day? Ten? Fifteen? Eighteen? Twenty, if need be. It will have to be done. Do not miss a word of what I am about to tell you. You will go to the woods of saint aubin Near Lamballe? Yes. On the edge of a ravine between saint rieul and pré d'Iliac there is a large chestnut tree. You will stop there. No one will be in sight. But a man will be there nevertheless. On that I can depend. You will give the call. Do you know it? Amalo puffed out his cheeks, turned towards the sea and there rang the to quit to who of the owl. One would have supposed it came from the depths of a forest, so owl-like and sinister was the sound. Good, said the old man, you have it. He extended to Almalo the green silk knot. This is my commander's badge, take it. 
No one must know my name at present, but this knot is sufficient. The fleur-de-lis was embroidered by Madame Royale in the temple prison. Amelot knelt. Trembling with awe, he received the knot embroidered with the fleur-de-lis, and in the act of raising it to his lips he paused as if in fear. May I? he asked. Yes, since you kissed the crucifix. Amelot kissed the fleur-de-lis. Rise, said the old man. Amelot obeyed him, placing the knot in his bosom. Listen carefully to what I am about to say. This is the order. Revolt. Give no quarter. On the edge of the forest of saint Aubon, you will give the call, repeating it three times. After the third time, you will see a man rise from the ground. I know, from a hole under the trees. That man will be Planchenot, sometimes called Coeur de Roy. To him you will show this knot. He will know what it means. Then you are to go by ways that you must discover for yourself to the woods of Astier, where you will see a cripple surnamed Mousqueton, a man who shows mercy to no human being. You are to tell him that I love him, and that he must stir up the parishes in his neighborhood. Thence you will go to the wood of Quebon, which is one mile from Plourmel. When you give the owl cry, a man will come out of a hole. That will be Monsieur Tuot, Seneschal of Plourmel, who formerly belonged to the Constitutional Assembly but on the Royalist side. You will direct him to fortify the castle of Quebon that belongs to the Marquis de Guerre, a refugee. Ravines, woods of moderate extent, and even soil, a good spot. Monsieur Tuot is an able and upright man. From there you will go to saint gouin le and speak to Jean Chouan, whom I look upon as the actual leader, and then to the woods of Villanglos, where you will see Guitier called saint Martin. You will tell him to keep his eye on a certain Cormenil, son-in-law of the old Goupil de Prefel, and who is the head of the Jacobins of Argentan. Remember all this. I write nothing, because writing must be avoided. La Roirie made out a list which ruined everything. Thence you will go to the wood of Rouge of Feu, where Millet lives, he who leaps across ravines by the help of a long pole. They call it a leaping pole. Do you know how to use it? Am I not a Breton peasant? The leaping pole is our friend. It makes our arms bigger, our legs longer. That is to say, it reduces the enemy and shortens the way. An excellent machine. Once, with my leaping pole, I stood my ground against three salt-tax men armed with sabres. When was that? Ten years ago. Under the king? Certainly. Against whom? I really do not know. I was a salt smuggler. Very good. It was called fighting against the collectors of the salt tax. Is the tax on salt the same thing as the king? Yes and no, but it is not necessary for you to understand this. I ask Monseigneur's pardon for having put a question to Monseigneur. Let us go on. Do you know the Tourg? Do I know it? I came from there. How is that? Why, because I come from Parigny. To be sure, the Tourg borders on Parigny. Do I know the Tourg? The great round castle belongs to the family of my lords. A large iron door separates the old building from the new part, which a cannon could not destroy. In the new building they keep the famous book on saint Barthélemy, which people come to see as a curiosity. The grass is full of frogs. When I was a boy I used to play with those frogs. And the underground passage, too. Perhaps I am the only one left who knows about that. What underground passage? I don't know what you are talking about. That was in old times when the Tourg was besieged. The people inside could escape through an underground passage, which opened into the woods. I know there are subterranean passages of that kind in the Chateau of Jupelier and Hunodai, and in the Tower of Champion, but there is nothing like it in the Tourg. But indeed there is, Monseigneur. I do not know the passages of which Monseigneur speaks. I only know the one in the Tourg because I belong in the neighborhood. And besides, I am the only one who does know of it. It was never spoken of. It was forbidden, because this passage had been used in the wars of Monsieur de Rohan. My father knew the secret and showed it to me. I know both the secret entrance and the outlet. If I am in the forest, I can go into the tower. And if I am in the tower, I can go into the forest without being seen, so that when the enemies enter, there is no one to be found. That is the passage of the Tourg. Oh, I know it well. The old man remained silent for a moment. 
You must be mistaken. If there had been any such secret, I should have known it. Monseigneur, I am sure of it. There is a stone that turns. Oh, yes, you peasants believe in turning stones, in singing stones, and in stones that go by night down to a neighboring brook to drink. A pack of idle tales. But when I turned the stone myself... Yes, just as others have heard it sing. My friend the Tourg is a Bastille, safe and strong and easily defended, but he would be a simpleton indeed who depended for escape on a subterranean passage. But, Monseigneur... The old man shrugged his shoulders. Let us waste no more time but speak of business. This peremptory tone checked Almelo's persistence. The old man resumed. Let us go on. Listen. From Rougefeu you are to go into the wood of Montchevrier, where you will find Benedicite, the leader of the Twelve. He is another good man. He recites his Benedicite while he has people shot. There is no room for sensibility in warfare. From Montchevrier you will go... He broke off. I had forgotten about the money. He took from his pocket a purse and a pocketbook, which he put into Almelo's hands. In this pocketbook you will find thirty thousand francs in paper money, which is worth about three livres and ten sous. The Azignats are false, to be sure, but the real ones are no more valuable. And in this purse, mind, you will find one hundred louis d'or. I give you all I have, because I have no need of anything here, and it is better that no money should be found on me. Now I will go on. From Montchevret you are to go to Antran, where you will meet Monsieur de Fort. From Antran to Jupelier, where you will see Monsieur de Rochecote. From Jupelier to Noirieux, where you will find the Abbe Baudouin. Will you remember all this? As I do my paternoster. You will see Monsieur de Boisguy at saint brice en cogle Monsieur de Tepon at Moran, which is a fortified town, and the Prince de Talmont at Chateau Gontier. Will a prince speak to me? Am I not speaking to you? Amelo took off his hat. You need but to show Madame's fleur-de-lis, and your welcome is assured. Remember that you will have to go to places where there are mountaineers and pateaux. You will disguise yourself. That is an easy matter, since the Republicans are so stupid that with a blue coat, a three-cornered hat, and a cockade you may go anywhere. The day of regiments and uniforms has gone by, the regiments are not even numbered, and every man is at liberty to wear any rag he fancies. You will go to saint mer You will see Gaulier, called Grand Pierre. You will go to the cantonment of Parnay, where all the men have swarthy faces. They put gravel in their muskets and use a double charge of powder to make more noise. They do well, but be sure and tell them to kill, kill, and kill. You will go to the camp of the Vache Noire, which is an elevation in the midst of the forest of La Charny. From Vache Noire to the camp of Lavoine, then to the camp Vert, and afterward to the camp of the Fourmis. You will go to Grand Bordage, also called Haut de Pré, where lives the widow whose daughter married Triton the Englishman. That is in the parish of Quélan. You will visit Epineux le Chevreuil, Cire le Guillaume, Guillaume, Paran, and all the men in hiding throughout the woods. You will make friends, and you will send them to the borders of Upper and Lower Maine. You will see Jean Treton in the parish of Vaigre, Sans Regret in Bignon, Chambord in Bonchamp, the Corbon brothers at Maisoncel, and Petit Saint Fruge, Saint Jean sur Evre. He is the one who is called Boudoiseau. Having done this, and uttered the watchwords, Revolt! No quarter! In all these places, you will join the royal and Catholic Grand Army wherever it may be. You will see Dolbey, de l'Escure, de la Roque Jacquelon, and such leaders as may still be living. You will show them my commanders not. They know what it means. You are only a sailor, but Catelino is nothing but a teamster. You will give them this message from me. It is time to join the two wars, the great and the small. The great one makes more noise, but the small one does the work. The Bondé does fairly well. But Chouanery goes farther, and in civil war cruelty is a powerful agent. The success of a war depends on the amount of evil that it causes. He broke off. Almelo, I tell you all this, not that you can understand the words, but because your perceptions are keen and you will comprehend the matters themselves. I have trusted you since I saw you managing that boat. Without knowing anything of geometry, you execute wonderful sea maneuvers. He who can pilot a boat can guide an insurrection. Judging from the way in which you managed our affair at sea, I feel sure that you will execute my instructions equally well. But to resume. So you will repeat to the chiefs all that I have told you, or words to the same effect as near as you can remember. I am confident that you will convey to them my meaning. I prefer the warfare of the forest to that of the open field. I have no intention of exposing one hundred thousand peasants to the grape shot of the soldiers in blue and the artillery of Monsieur Carnot. 
In a month's time, I expect to have 500 sharpshooters hidden in the woods. The Republican army is my game. Poaching is one method of warfare. The strategy of the thickets for me. Ah, that is probably another word which you will not understand. But never mind. You know what I mean when I say no quarter and ambushes on every side. Give me more chouannerie rather than the regular Vendean warfare. You will add that the English are on our side. Let us catch the Republic between two fires. Europe helps us. Let us put down revolution. Kings are waging a war of kingdoms. We will wage a war of parishes. You will say all this. Do you understand me? Yes. Put all to fire and sword. That is it. No quarter. None whatever. You understand. I will go everywhere. And be always on your guard, for in these parts it is an easy matter to lose one's life. Death I have no fear of. He who takes his first step may be wearing his last shoes. You are a brave fellow. And if I am asked Monseigneur's name? It is not to be made known yet. You are to say that you do not know it, and you will say the truth. Where shall I see Monseigneur again? At the place where I am going. How shall I know where that is? All the world will know it. Before eight days have gone by, you will hear of me. I shall make examples. I shall avenge the king and religion. And you will know well enough that it is I of whom they are speaking. I understand. Do not forget anything. You may rest assured of that. Now go, and may God guide you. Go! I will do all you bid me. I will go. I will speak. I will obey. I will command. Good. And if I succeed? I will make you a knight of Saint-Louis. Like my brother. And if I fail, you will have me shot? Like your brother. So be it, Monseigneur. The old man bent his head and seemed to fall into a gloomy reverie. When he raised his eyes, he was alone. Almelo was only a black speck vanishing on the horizon. The sun had just set. The sea mews and hooded gulls were flying homeward from the ocean, and the atmosphere was charged with that well-known restlessness that precedes the night. The tree frogs croaked. The kingfishers flew whistling from the pools. The gulls and rooks kept up their usual evening clamor, and the shorebirds called to each other, but not a human sound was to be heard. It was absolute solitude. Not a sail on the bay, not a peasant in the fields, only a bleak expanse as far as the eye could reach. The tall sand thistles quivered. The pale twilight sky shed a livid light over all the shore, and the ponds far away on the dark plain looked like sheets of pewter laid flat upon the ground. A sea wind was blowing. End of section 13section 14 of 93 by victor hugo translated by aline delano this librivox recording is in the public domain part 1 book 4 telmarch chapter 1 on the top of the dune the old man waited until almelo was out of sight then drawing his sea cloak more closely around him he started walking slowly wrapped in thought he took the direction of wienne almelo had gone toward beauvoir Behind him rose the enormous triangle of Mont Saint Michel, with its cathedral tiara and its cuirass like fortress, whose two great eastern towers, the one round, the other square, help the mountain to bear up under the burden of the church and the village. As the pyramid of Cheops is a landmark in the desert, so is Mont Saint Michel a beacon to the sea. The quicksands in the bay of Mont Saint Michel act imperceptibly upon the dunes. At that time, between Wiene and Ardevan, there was a very high one which is no longer in existence. This dune, leveled by an equinoctial gale, was unusually old, and on its summit stood a milestone, erected in the twelfth century in memory of the council held at Avranches against the assassins of St. Thomas of Canterbury. From its top one could see all the surrounding country and ascertain the points of the compass. The old man directed his steps to this dune and ascended it. When he reached the summit, he seated himself on one of the four projecting stones, and, leaning back against the monument, began to examine the land that lay spread out like a geographical map at his feet. He seemed to be looking for a route in a country that had once been familiar to him. In this broad landscape, obscured by the twilight, nothing was distinctly visible but the dark line of the horizon against the pale sky. 
one could see the clustered roofs of eleven hamlets and villages, and all the belfries of the coast were visible several miles away, standing high that they might serve as beacons to the sailors in time of need. Some minutes later, the old man seemed to have found what he was looking for in this dim light. His eye rested on an enclosure of trees, walls, and roofs, partially visible between the valley and the wood. It was a farm. He nodded his head with an expression of satisfaction, like one who says to himself, There it is, and began to trace with his finger the outlines of a route across the hedges and the fields. From time to time he gazed intently at a shapeless and somewhat indistinct object that was moving above the principal roof of the farm, and seemed to ask himself what it could be. It was colorless and dim, in consequence of the time of day. It was not a weather vane, because it was floating, and there seemed to be no reason why it should be a flag. He felt weary, and grateful to rest on the stone where he was sitting, he yielded to that vague sense of oblivion which the first moment of repose brings to weary men. There is one hour of the day which may be called noiseless, the peaceful hour of early evening. That hour had come, and he was enjoying it. He gazed, he listened. To what? To perfect tranquillity. Even savage natures have their moments of melancholy. Suddenly this tranquillity was not exactly disturbed, but sharply defined by the voices of those who were passing below. They were the voices of women and children. It was like a joyous chime of bells heard unexpectedly in the darkness. The group from which the voices came could not be distinguished on account of the underbrush, but it was evident that the persons were walking along the foot of the dune in the direction of the plain and the forest. As those clear, fresh voices reached the old man where he sat absorbed in thought, they were so near that he lost not a word. A woman's voice said, Let us hurry, Fleishard, is this the way? No, it is over yonder. And the dialogue went on between the two voices, the one high and shrill, the other low and timid. What is the name of this farm where we are living now? Eh, Bompire. Are we still far from it? Fully a quarter of an hour. Let us make haste and get there in time for the soup. Yes, I know we are late. We ought to run, but your mites are tired. We are only two women and cannot carry three brats. And then you, Fleshard, you are carrying one as it is, a perfect lump of lead. You have weaned that little gormandizer, and you still carry it. That is a bad habit. You had better make it walk. Well, the soup will be cold. Worse luck. Ah, oh, what good shoes you gave me. They fit as though they were made for me. It's better than going barefooted. Do hurry, Ronny Jean. He is the one who makes us late. He has had to stop and speak to all the little village girls that we meet. He behaves like a man already. Of course he does. He is going on five years old. Tell us, Ronne Jean, why did you speak to that little girl in the village? A child's voice, that of a boy, replied, Because I know her. How is that? You know her, said the woman. Yes, answered the boy, because we played games this morning. Well, I must say, exclaimed the woman, we have been here only three days, a boy no bigger than your fist, and he has found a sweetheart already. And the voices grew fainter in the distance, and every sound died away. End of section 14、Section、15 by Aline Delano. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part One, Book Four, Chapter Two, Aures habet et non audiet. The old man sat motionless. He was not consciously thinking, nor yet was he dreaming. Around him was peace, repose, assurance of safety, solitude. Although night had shut down upon the woods, and in the valley below it was nearly dark, broad daylight still rested on the dune. The moon was rising in the east, and several stars pricked the pale blue of the zenith. This man, although intensely absorbed in his own interests, surrendered himself to the unutterable peacefulness of nature. He felt the vague dawn of hope rising in his breast, if the word hope may fitly be applied to projects of civil warfare. For the moment it seemed to him that in escaping from the inexorable sea he had left all danger behind him. No one knew his name. He was alone, lost as far as concerned the enemy. He had left no traces behind him, for the surface of the sea preserves no trace. All is hidden, ignored, 
and never even suspected. He felt unspeakably calm. A little more and he would have fallen asleep. It was the deep silence pervading both heaven and earth that lent to the hour a subtle charm to soothe the imagination of this man, stirred as he was by inward and outward agitations. There was nothing to be heard but the wind blowing in from the sea, a prolonged monotonous bass, to which the ear becomes so used that it almost ceases to be noticed as a sound. All at once he rose to his feet. His attention was suddenly awakened. An object on the horizon seemed to arrest his glance. He was gazing at the belfry of Cormorai, at the farther end of the valley. Something unusual was going on in this belfry. Its dark silhouette was clearly defined against the sky. The tower surmounted by the spire could be seen distinctly, and between the tower and the spire was the square cage for the bell, without a penthouse, and open on the four sides, after the fashion of Breton belfries. Now this cage seemed to open and shut by turns, and at regular intervals. Its lofty aperture looked now perfectly white, and the next moment black, the sky constantly appearing and vanishing, eclipse following the light, as the opening and shutting succeeded each other with the regularity of a hammer striking an anvil. This belfry of Cormorai lay before him at a distance of some two leagues. He looked toward the right in the direction of the belfry of Baguea Pican, which also rose straight against the horizon, and the cage of that belfry was opening and closing like the belfry of Cormorai. He looked toward the left at the belfry of Tani. The cage of Tani opened and closed like that of Baguea Pican. He examined all the belfries on the horizon, one after another. The belfries of Courtille, of Précy, of Crolon, and of croix à Franchine on his right hand, those of ras sur Cuenon, of Maudray, and of the Pas on his left, and before him the belfry of Pontorson. Every belfry cage was changing alternately from white to black. What could it mean? It meant that all the bells were ringing, and they must be ringing violently to cause the light to change so rapidly. What was it, then? The tocsin, beyond a doubt. They were ringing, and frantically, too, from all the belfries in every parish, and in every village, and yet not a sound could be heard. This was owing to the distance, combined with the sea wind, which, blowing from the opposite direction, carried all sounds from the shore away beyond the horizon. All these frantic bells ringing on every side, and at the same time this silence. What could be more appalling? The old man looked and listened. He could not hear the toxin, but he could see it. Seeing the toxin is rather a strange sensation. Against whom was this fury directed? Against whom was the toxin ringing? End of section 15《Section 16 of 93 by Victor Hugo, translated by Aline Delano. Part 1, Book 4, Chapter 3, The Usefulness of Big Letters. Someone was surely caught in a trap. Who could it be? A shudder shook this man of steel. It could not be he. His arrival could not have been discovered. It was impossible for the representatives to have learned it already, for he had but just stepped on shore. The corvette had surely foundered with all on board, and even on the corvette, Boisbertelot and La Viville were the only men who knew his name. The bells kept up their savage sport. He counted them mechanically, and in the abrupt transition from the assurance of perfect safety to a terrible sense of danger, his thoughts wandered restlessly from one conjecture to another. However, after all, this ringing might be accounted for in many different ways, and he finally reassured himself by repeating, in short, no one knows of my arrival here or even my name. For several minutes there had been a slight noise overhead and behind him, a sound resembling the rustling of a leaf. At first he took no notice of it, but as it continued, persisted one might almost say, he finally turned. It was really a leaf, a leaf of paper. The wind was struggling to tear off a large placard that was pasted on the milestone above his head. The placard had but just been pasted, for it was still moist, and had become a prey to the wind, which in its sport had partly detached it. The old man had not perceived it, because he had ascended the dune on the opposite side. He stepped up on the stone where he had been sitting, and placed his hand on the corner of the placard that fluttered in the wind. The sky was clear. In June the twilight lasts a long time, and although it was dark at the foot of the dune, the summit was still light. A part of the notice was printed in large letters, 
It was yet sufficiently light to read it, and this was what he read. The French Republic, one and indivisible. We, prior of the Marne, representative of the people, in command of the army on the coast of Cherbourg, give notice that the ci-devant Marquis of Lantenac, Viscount of Fontenay, calling himself a Breton prince, and who has secretly landed on the coast of Granville, is outlawed. A price has been set upon his head. Whoever captures him, dead or alive, will receive sixty thousand livres. This sum will be paid in gold and not in paper money. A battalion of the army of the coast guards of Cherbourg will be at once dispatched for the apprehension of the former Marquis of Lantenac. The inhabitants of the parishes are ordered to lend their aid. Given at the town hall of Granville, the 2nd of June, 1793. Signed, Prieur de la Marne. Below this name there was another signature written in smaller characters, which the fading light prevented him from deciphering. Pulling his hat down over his eyes, and muffling himself in his sea cape up to his chin, the old man hastily descended the dune. Evidently it was not safe to tarry any longer on this lighted summit. Perhaps he had stayed there too long already. The top of the dune was the only point of the landscape that still remained visible. When he had descended and found himself in the darkness, he slackened his pace. He took the road leading to the farm which he had traced out, evidently believing himself safe in that direction. It was absolute solitude. There were no passers-by at this hour. Stopping behind a clump of bushes, he unfastened his cloak, turned his waistcoat with the hairy side out, refastened his cloak, that was but a rag held by a string around his neck, and resumed his journey. It was bright moonlight. He came to a place where two roads forked, and on the pedestal of the old stone cross which stood there a white square could be distinguished, undoubtedly another placard like the one he had lately read. As he drew near to it he heard a voice. "'Where are you going?' it said. And turning he beheld a man in the hedgerow, tall like himself and of about the same age, with hair as white and garments even more ragged than his own, almost his very double. The man stood leaning on a long staff. "'I asked you where you were going,' he repeated. "'In the first place tell me where I am,' was the reply, uttered in tones of almost haughty composure. And the man answered, "'You are in the seigneury of Tanis, of which I am the beggar and you the lord.' "'I?' "'Yes, you, Monsieur le Marquis de Lantenac.' End of section 16「Section 17 of 93 by Victor Hugo, translated by Aline Delano. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part 1, Book 4, Chapter 4, The Caiman. The Marquis de Lantenac, henceforth we shall call him by his name, replied gravely. Very well, then deliver me up. The man continued. We are both at home here, you in the castle. I in the bushes. Let us put an end to this. Do what you have to do. Deliver me to the authorities, said the Marquis. The man went on. You were going to the farm, Herr Bonpai, were you not? Yes. Don't go there. Why not? Because the blues are there. How long have they been there? These three days past. Did the inhabitants of the farm and village resist? No, they opened all the doors. Ah, said the Marquis. The man indicated with his finger the roof of the farm, which was visible in the distance above the trees. Do you see that roof, Marquis? Yes. Do you see what there is above it? Something waving? Yes. It is a flag. The tricolor, said the man. It was the object that had attracted the attention of the Marquis when he stood on the top of the dune. Isn't the tocsin ringing? inquired the Marquis. Yes. On what account? Evidently on yours. But one cannot hear it. The wind prevents it from being heard. The man continued. Did you see that notice about yourself? Yes. They are searching for you. Then, glancing towards the farm, he added, 
they have a demi battalion over there. Of Republicans. Of Parisians. Well, said the Marquis, let us go on. And he made a step in the direction of the farm. The man seized him by the arm. Don't go there. Where would you have me go? With me. The Marquis looked at the beggar. Listen to me, Marquis. My home is not a fine one, but it is safe. A hut lower than a cellar, seaweed for a floor, and for a ceiling a roof of branches and of grass. Come, they would shoot you at the farm, and at my house you will have a chance to sleep. You must be weary. Tomorrow the blues start out again, and you can go where you choose. The Marquis studied the man. On which side are you, then? asked the Marquis. Are you a royalist or a republican? I am a beggar. Neither royalist nor republican? I believe not. Are you for or against the king? I have no time for that sort of thing. What do you think of what is transpiring? I think that I have not enough to live on. Yet you come to my aid. I knew that you were outlawed. What is this law, then, that one can be outside of it? I do not understand. Am I inside the law or outside of it? I have no idea. Does dying of hunger mean being inside the law? How long have you been dying of hunger? All my life. And you propose to save me? Yes. Why? Because I said to myself, there is a man who is poorer than I, for he has not even the right to breathe. True, and so you mean to save me? Certainly. Now we are brothers, my lord, beggars both, I for bread and you for life. But do you know there is a price set on my head? Yes. How did you know it? I have read the notice. Then you can read. Yes, and write also. Did you think I was like the beasts of the field? But since you can read and have seen the notice, you must know that he who delivers me up will receive sixty thousand francs. I know it. Not in Azignats. Yes, I know. In gold. You realize that 60,000 francs is a fortune? Yes. And that the man who arrests me will make his fortune? Yes. And what then? His fortune. That is exactly what I thought. When I saw you, I said to myself, to think that whoever arrests this man will earn 60,000 francs and make his fortune. Let us make haste to hide him. The Marquis followed the beggar. They entered a thicket. There was the beggar's den, a sort of chamber in which a large and ancient oak had allowed the man to take up his abode. It was hollowed out under its roots, and covered with its branches. Dark, low, hidden, actually invisible, and in it there was room for two. I foresaw that I might have a guest, said the beggar. This kind of subterranean lodging less rare in Brittany than one might imagine, is called a carnichot. The same name is also given to hiding places built in thick walls. The place was furnished with a few jugs, a bed of straw or seaweed, washed and dried, a coarse cursy blanket, and a few tallow dips, together with a flint and steel, and twigs of furs to be used as matches. They stooped, crawling for a moment, and penetrated into a chamber divided by the thick roots of the tree into fantastic compartments, and seated themselves on the heap of dry seaweed that served as a bed. The space between the two roots through which they had entered, and which served as a door, admitted a certain amount of light. Night had fallen, but the human eye adapts itself to the change of light, and even in the darkness it sometimes seems as if the daylight lingered still. The reflection of a moonbeam illumined the entrance. In the corner was a jug of water, a loaf of buckwheat bread, and some chestnuts. Let us sup, said the beggar. They divided the chestnuts. The Marquis gave his bit of hardtack. They ate of the same black loaf, and drank in turn out of the same jug of water, 
meanwhile conversing. The Marquis questioned the man. So it is all one to you, whatever happens? Pretty much. It is for you, our lords, to look out for that sort of business. But then what is going on now, for instance? It is all going on over my head, the beggar added. Besides, there are things happening still higher. The sun rises, the moon waxes and wanes. That is the kind of thing that interests me. He took a swallow from the jug and said, Good fresh water. Then he continued, How do you like this water, my lord? What is your name? asked the Marquis. My name is Telmarch, but they call me the Caiman. I understand. Gaimand is a local word. Which means beggar. I am also called Le Vieux. He went on. I have been called Le Vieux for forty years. Forty years? But you must have been young then. I was never young. You are young still, Marquis. You have the legs of a man of twenty. You can climb the great dune, while I can hardly walk. A quarter of a mile tires me out, yet we are of the same age. But the rich have an advantage over us. They eat every day. Eating keeps up one's strength. After a silence, the beggar went on. Wealth and poverty, there's the mischief. It seems to me that that is the cause of all these catastrophes. The poor want to be rich, and the rich do not want to become poor. I think that is at the bottom of it all, but I do not trouble myself about such matters. Let come what may, I am neither for the creditor nor for the debtor. I know that there is a debt and somebody is paying it, that is all. I would rather they had not killed the king, and yet I hardly know why. And then one says to me, think how they used to hang people for nothing at all, think of it. For a miserable shot fired at one of the king's deer, I once saw a man hung. He had a wife and seven children. There is something to be said on both sides. He was silent again, then resumed. Of course, you understand. I do not pretend to know just how matters stand. Men go to and fro, changes take place, while I live beneath the stars. Again Telmarch became thoughtful, then went on. I know something of bone-setting and medicine. I am familiar with herbs and the use of plants. The peasants see me preoccupied for no apparent reason, and so I pass for a wizard. Because I dream, they think that I am wise. Do you belong to the neighborhood? asked the Marquis. I have never left it. Do you know me? Certainly. The last time I saw you, you were passing through this part of the country on your way to England. That was two years ago. Just now I saw a man on the top of the dune, a tall man. Tall men are not common hereabouts. Brittany is a country of short men. I looked more closely. I had read the notice, and I said to myself, See, here! And when you came down, the moon was up, and I recognized you. But I do not know you. You have looked at me, but you never saw me. And Telmarch the Caimand added, I saw you. The passer-by and the beggar look with different eyes. Have I ever met you before? Often, for I am your beggar. I used to beg on the road below your castle. Sometimes you gave me alms. He who gives takes no notice, but he who receives looks anxiously and observes well. A beggar is a born spy. But though I am often sad, I try not to be a malicious spy. I used to hold out my hand, and you saw nothing but that, into which you threw the alms that I needed in the morning to keep me from dying of hunger at night. Frequently I went twenty-four hours without food, Sometimes a penny means life itself. I am paying you now for the life I owe you. Drew, you are saving my life. Yes, I am saving your life, Monseigneur. The voice of Telmarch grew solemn. On one condition. What is that? 
that you have not come here to do harm. I have come here to do good. Let us sleep, said the beggar. They lay down side by side on the bed of seaweed. The beggar dropped to sleep at once. The Marquis, although much fatigued, remained awake for some time, thinking and watching his companion in the darkness. Finally he lay back. Lying upon the bed was equivalent to lying on the earth, and he took advantage of this to put his ear to the ground and listen. He could hear a hollow subterranean rumbling. It is a fact that sound is transmitted into the bowels of the earth. He could hear the ringing of the bells. The tocsin continued. The Marquis fell asleep. End of section 17 Section 18 of 93 by Victor Hugo, translated by Aline Delano. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part 1, Book 4, Chapter 5. When he awoke, it was daylight. The beggar was standing up, not in his den, for it was impossible to stand erect there, but outside on the threshold. He was leaning on his staff, and the sunshine fell upon his face. Monseigneur said Tullmarch. It has just struck four from the belfry of Tanis. I heard it strike. Therefore the wind has changed. It comes from the land, and as I heard no other sound, the tocsin must have ceased. All is quiet at the farm and in the village of Erbon Pile. The blues are either sleeping or gone. The worst of the danger is over. It will be prudent for us to separate. This is my time for going out. He indicated a point on the horizon. I am going this way. Then, pointing in the opposite direction, he said, You are to go that way. The beggar gravely waved his hand to the Marquis. Take those chestnuts with you if you are hungry, he added, pointing to the remains of the supper. A moment after, he had disappeared among the trees. The Marquis rose and went in the direction indicated by Telmarch. It was that charming hour called in the old Norman peasant dialect the peep of day. The chirping of the finches and of the hedge sparrows was heard. The Marquis followed the path that they had traversed the day before, and as he emerged from the thicket, he found himself at the fork of the roads marked by the stone cross. The placard was still there, looking white and almost festive in the rising sun. He remembered that there was something at the foot of this notice that he had not been able to read the evening before, on account of the small characters and the fading light. He went up to the pedestal of the cross. Below the signature, Prieur de la Marne, the notice ended with the following lines in small characters. The identity of the ci-devant Marquis of Lantenac having been established, he will be executed without delay. Signed, Gauvin, Chief of Battalion in Command of Exploring Column. Gauvin! said the Marquis. He paused, wrapped in deep thought, his eyes fixed on the placard. Go on, he repeated. He started once more, turned, looked at the cross, came back, and read the placard over again. Then he slowly walked away. Had anyone been near, he might have heard him mutter to himself in an undertone, Go on. The roofs of the farm on his left were not visible from the sunken paths through which he was stealing. He skirted a precipitous hill covered with blossoming firs, of the species known as the thorny firs. This eminence was crowned by one of those points of land called in this district a hjord, and at its base the trees cut off the view at once. The foliage seemed bathed in light. All nature felt the deep joy of morning. Suddenly this landscape became terrible. It was like the explosion of an ambuscade. An indescribable tornado of wild cries and musket shots fell upon these fields and woods all radiant with the morning light, and from the direction of the farm rose a dense smoke mingled with bright flames, as though the village and the farm were but a truss of burning straw. It was not only startling but awful, this sudden change from peace to wrath, like an explosion of hell in the very midst of dawn, a horror without transition. A fight was going on in the direction of Erbon Pile. The Marquis paused. No man in a case like this could have helped feeling as he did. Curiosity is more powerful than fear. One must find out what is going on, even at the risk of life. 
he climbed the hill at the foot of which lay the sunken path. From there, although the chances were that he would be discovered, he could at least see what was taking place. In a few moments he stood on the hure and looked about him. In fact, there was both a fusillade and a fire. One could hear the cries and see the fire. The farm was evidently the center of some mysterious catastrophe. What could it be? Was it attacked? And if so, by whom? Could it be a battle? Was it not more likely to be a military execution? By the orders of a revolutionary decree, the Blues frequently punished refractory farms and villages by setting them on fire. For instance, every farm and hamlet which had neglected to fell the trees as prescribed by law, and had not opened roads in the thickets for the passage of Republican cavalry, was burned. It was not long since the parish of Bourgogne, near Ernay, had been thus punished. Was Erbon Pile a case in point? It was evident that none of those strategic openings ordered by the decree had been cut, either in the thickets or in the environs of Tanis and Erbon Pile. Was this the punishment thereof? Had an order been received by the advanced guard occupying the farm? Did not this advanced guard form a part of one of those exploring columns called Colonnes Infernales? The eminence on which the Marquis had stationed himself was surrounded on all sides by a wild and bristling thicket called the Grove of Erbon Pile. It was about as large as a forest, however, and extended to the farm, concealing, as all Breton thickets do, a network of ravines, paths, and sunken roads, labyrinths wherein the Republican armies frequently went astray. This execution, if execution it were, must have been a fierce one, for it had been rapid. Like all brutal deeds, it had been done like a flash. The atrocity of civil war admits of these savage deeds. While the Marquis, vainly conjecturing, and hesitating whether to descend or to remain, listened and watched, this crash of extermination ceased, or, to speak more accurately, vanished. The Marquis could see the fierce and jubilant troop as it scattered through the grove. There was a dreadful rushing to and fro beneath the trees. From the farm they had entered the woods. Drums beat an attack, but there was no more firing. It was like a batu. They seemed to be following a scent. They were evidently looking for someone. The noise was widespread and far-reaching. There were confused outcries of wrath and triumph, a clamor of indistinct sounds. Suddenly, as an outline is revealed in a cloud of smoke, one sound became clearly defined and audible in this tumult. It was a name, repeated by thousands of voices, and the Marquis distinctly heard the cry, Lantenac! Lantenac! The Marquis of Lantenac! They were looking for him. End of section 18section 19 of 93 by victor hugo translated by aline delano the librivox recording is in the public domain part 1 book 4 chapter 6 the vicissitudes of civil war around him suddenly from all directions the thicket was filled with muskets bayonets and sabers a tricolored banner was unfurled in the dim light and the cry lantenac burst forth on his ears while at his feet through the brambles and branches savage faces appeared. The Marquis was standing alone on the top of the height, visible from every part of the wood. He could scarcely distinguish those who shouted his name, but he could be seen by all. Had there been a thousand muskets in the wood, he offered them a target. He could distinguish nothing in the coppice, but the fiery eyes of all were directed upon him. He took off his hat, turned back the brim, and, drawing from his pocket a white cockade, he pulled out a long dry thorn from a furze bush, with which he fastened the cockade to the brim of his hat, then replaced it on his head, the upturned brim revealing his forehead and the cockade, and in a loud voice, as though addressing the wide forest, he said, I am the man you seek. I am the Marquis de Lantenac, Viscount de Fontenay, Breton Prince, Lieutenant General of the Armies of the King. Make an end of it. Aim. Fire and opening with both hands his goatskin waistcoat, he bared his breast. Lowering his eyes to see the leveled guns, he beheld himself surrounded by kneeling men. A great shout went up. Long live Lantenac! Long live our lord! Long live the general! At the same time hats were thrown up and sabres whirled joyously, while from all sides brown woolen caps hoisted on long poles were waving in the air. A Vendean band surrounded him. At the sight of him they fell on their knees. 
Legends tell us that the ancient Thuringian forests were inhabited by strange beings, a race of giants, at once superior and inferior to men, whom the Romans regarded as horrible beasts, and the Germans as divine incarnations, and who might chance to be exterminated or worshipped, according to the race they encountered. A sensation similar to that which may have been felt by one of those beings was experienced by the Marquis when, expecting to be treated like a monster, he was suddenly worshipped as a deity. All those flashing eyes were fastened upon him with a kind of savage love. The crowd were armed with guns, sabres, scythes, poles, and sticks. All wore large felt hats or brown caps, with white cockades, a profusion of rosaries and charms, wide breeches left open at the knee, jackets of skin, and leather gaiters. The calves of their legs were bare, and they wore their hair long. Some looked fierce, but all had frank and open countenances. A young man of noble bearing passed through the crowd of kneeling men and hastily approached the Marquis. He wore a felt hat with an upturned brim, a white cockade, and a skin jacket like the peasant's, but his hands were delicate and his linen was fine, and over his waistcoat was a white silk scarf, from which hung a sword with a golden hilt. Having reached the Huor, he threw aside his hat, unfastened his scarf, and, kneeling, presented to the Marquis both scarf and sword. "'Indeed we were seeking for you,' he said, "'and we have found you. Receive the sword of command. These men are yours now. I was their commander. Now am I promoted since I become your soldier. Accept our devotion, my lord. General, give me your orders.' At a sign from him, men carrying the tricolored banner came forth from the woods, and going up to the Marquis placed it at his feet. It was the one he had seen through the trees. "'General,' said the young man who presented the sword and the scarf, this is the flag which we took from the blues who held the farm herb on pile. My name is Gavard, my lord. I was with the Marquis de la Rouary. Very well, said the Marquis, and calm and composed he girded on the scarf. Then he pulled out his sword and, waving it above his head, he cried, Rise, and long live the king! All started to their feet. Then from the depth of the woods arose a tumultuous and triumphant cry, Long live the king! Long live our Marquis! Long live Lantenac! The Marquis turned towards Gavard. How many are you? Seven thousand. While they were descending the hill, the peasants clearing away the furze bushes to make a path for the Marquis de Lantenac, Gavard continued. All this may be explained in a word, my lord. Nothing could be more simple. It needed but a spark. The Republican placard in revealing your presence has roused the country for the king. Besides, we have been secretly notified by the mayor of Granville, who is one of us, the same who saved the Abbe Olivier. They rang the tocsin last night. For whom? For you. Ah, said the Marquis. And here we are, continued Gavard. And you number seven thousand? Today, but we shall be fifteen thousand tomorrow. It is the Breton contingent. When Monsieur Henri de la roche jacques went to join the Catholic army, they sounded the tocsin. And in one night six parishes, Isernay, Coqueux, Echaubrogne, Aubier, saint aubin and Noué, sent him ten thousand men. They had no munitions of war, but, having found at a quarryman's house sixty pounds of blasting powder, Monsieur de la roche jacques took his departure with that. We felt sure you must be somewhere in these woods, and we were looking for you. And you attacked the blues at the farm air bon pile. The wind prevented them from hearing the tocsin, and they mistrusted nothing. The population of the hamlet, a set of clowns, received them well. This morning we invested the farm while the blues were sleeping, and the thing was over in a trice. I have a horse here. Will you deign to accept it, General? Yes. A peasant led up a white horse with military housings. The Marquis mounted him without accepting Gavard's proffered assistance. Hurrah! cried the peasants. The English fashion of cheering is much in vogue on the Breton coast, for the people have continual dealings with the Channel Islands. Gavard made the military salute, asking as he did so, Where will you establish your headquarters, my lord? At first in the forest of Fougères. It is one of the seven forests belonging to you. We need a priest. We have one. Who is it? The curate of the Chapelle Herbray. I know him. He has made the trip to Jersey. A priest stepped out from the ranks and said, Three times. The Marquis turned his head. Good morning, Monsieur le Curé. 
there is work in store for you. So much the better, Monsieur le Marquis. You will have to hear the confessions of such as desire your services. No one will be forced. Marquis, said the priest, at Guimonet, Gaston compels the Republicans to confess. He is a hairdresser. The dying should be allowed free choice in such a matter. Gavard, who had gone away to give certain orders, now returned. I await your commands, General. In the first place, the rendezvous is in the forest of Fougères. Direct the men to separate and meet there. The order has been given. Did you not say that the people of Erbon Pile were friendly to the Blues? Yes, General. Was the farm burned? Yes. Did you burn the hamlet? No. Burn it. The Blues tried to defend themselves, but they numbered one hundred and fifty while we were seven thousand. What Blues are they? Those of Santerre. He who ordered the drums to beat while they were beheading the king. Then it is a Parisian battalion. A demi-battalion. What was it called? Their banner has on it Battalion of the Bonnet Rouge. Wild beasts. What is to be done with the wounded? Put an end to them. What are we to do with the prisoners? Shoot them. There are about eighty of them. Shoot them all. There are two women. Treat them all alike. And three children. Bring them along. We will decide what is to be done with them. And the Marquis spurred his horse forward. End of section 19. Section 20 of 93 by Victor Hugo. Translated by Aline Delano. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part 1, Book 4, Chapter 7. No Mercy, No Quarter. While these events were transpiring in the vicinity of Tanis, the beggar had gone towards Coulon. He plunged into the ravines under wide leafy bowers, heedless of all things, noticing nothing. As he himself had expressed it, dreaming rather than thinking, for the thinker has an object, but the dreamer has none. Wandering, rambling, pausing, munching here and there a sprig of wild sorrel, drinking at the springs, raising his head from time to time as distant sounds attracted his attention, then yielding again to the irresistible fascination of nature, presenting his rags to the sunlight, hearing human sounds by chance, but listening to the singing of birds. He was old and slow. As he told the Marquis of Lantenac, he could not go far. A quarter of a mile fatigued him. He made a short circuit toward croix au franchon and it was evening when he returned. A little beyond Macy, the path he followed led him to a sort of elevation, destitute of trees, which commanded a wide expanse of country, including the entire horizon from the west as far as the sea. A smoke attracted his attention. There is nothing more delightful than a smoke, and nothing more alarming. There are smokes signifying peace, and smokes that mean mischief. In the density and color of a column of smoke lies all the difference between war and peace, brotherly love and hatred, hospitality and the grave, life and death. A smoke rising among the trees may mean the sweetest thing in all the world, the family hearth, or the most dreadful of calamities, a conflagration. And the entire happiness or misery of a human being is sometimes centered in a vapor, scattered by the wind. The smoke which Telmarch saw was of a kind to excite anxiety. It was black with sudden flashes of red light, as though the furnace from whence it sprung burned fitfully and was gradually dying out, and it rose above Erbon Pile. Telmarch hurried along, walking towards the smoke. He was tired, but he wanted to know what it meant. He reached the top of a hillock, behind which nestled a hamlet and the farm. Neither farm nor hamlet was to be seen. A heap of ruins was still burning, all that remained of Erbon Pile. It is much more heartrending to see a cottage burn than a palace. A cottage in flames is a pitiful sight. Devastation swooping down on poverty, a vulture pouncing upon an earthworm. There is a sense of repugnance about it that makes one shudder. If we believe the biblical legend, the sight of a conflagration once turned a human being into a statue. For an instant a similar change came over Telmarch. The sight before his eyes transfixed him to the spot. 
The work of destruction went on in silence. Not a cry was heard. Not a human sigh mingled with the smoke. That furnace pursued its task of devouring the village with no other sound than the splitting of timbers and the crackling of thatch. From time to time the clouds of smoke were rent, the falling roofs revealed the gaping chambers, the fiery furnace displayed all its rubies, the poor rags turned scarlet, and the wretched old furniture, tinged with purple, stood out amid these dull red interiors. Telmarch was dazed by the terrible calamity. Several trees of a neighboring chestnut grove had caught fire and were in a blaze. He listened, trying to hear a voice, a call, or some kind of a noise. Nothing stirred but the flames. All was still save the fire. Had all the inhabitants fled? Where was the community that lived and labored at Erbon Pile? What had become of this little family? Telmarch descended the hillock. A gloomy enigma lay before him. He approached it slowly, gazing at it steadily. He advanced towards the ruin with the deliberation of a shadow, feeling like a ghost in this tomb. Having reached what had formerly been the door of the farm, he looked into the yard, whose ruined walls no longer separated it from the surrounding hamlet. What he had seen before was nothing as compared with what he now beheld. From afar he had seen the terror of it, now all its horrors lay before him. In the middle of the yard was a dark mass, vaguely outlined on one side by the flames, and on the other by the moonlight. It was a heap of men, and these men were dead. Around this mound lay a wide pool, still smoking, whose surface reflected the flames, but it needed not the fire to redden it. It was of blood. Telmarch went up to it. He examined, one after another, these prostrate bodies. All were corpses. Both the moon and the conflagration lighted up the scene. The dead bodies were those of soldiers. Every man had bare feet. Both their shoes and their weapons had been taken from them, but they still wore their blue uniforms. Here and there one could distinguish, amid the confusion of the limbs and heads, hats bearing the tricolore cockades, riddled with bullets. They were Republicans, the same Parisians who the previous evening had been living active men, garrisoned at the farm Erbon Pale. The symmetrical arrangement of the fallen bodies proved the affair to have been an execution. They had been shot on the spot and with precision. They were all dead. Not a sound came from the mass. Telmarch examined each individual corpse, and every man was riddled with shot. Their executioners, doubtless in haste to depart, had not taken time to bury them. Just as he was about to leave the place, his attention was attracted by the sight of four feet protruding beyond the corner of a low wall in the yard. These feet were smaller than those which he had previously seen. There were shoes upon them, and as he drew near he perceived that they were the feet of women. Two women were lying side by side behind the wall, also shot. Telmarch stooped over them. One of them wore a kind of uniform. Beside her was a jug, broken and empty. She was a vivandière. She had four balls in her head. She was dead. Telmarch examined the other, who was a peasant woman. Her eyes were closed, her mouth open, her face discolored, but there were no wounds in her head. Her dress, undoubtedly worn to shreds by long marches, was rent by her fall, exposing her bosom. Telmarch pushed it still further aside, and discovered on her shoulder a round wound made by a ball. The shoulder blade was broken. He gazed upon her livid breast. A nursing mother, he murmured. He touched her. She was not cold. The broken bone and the wound in the shoulder were her only injuries. He placed his hand on her breast and felt a faint throb. She was not dead. Telmarch raised himself and cried out in a terrible voice, Is there no one here? Is that you, Caimand? replied a voice so low that it could scarcely be heard. At the same time a head emerged from a hole in the ruin, and the next moment a second one peered forth from another aperture. These were the sole survivors, two peasants who had managed to hide themselves, and who now, reassured by the familiar voice of the Kaiman, crept out of the hiding places where they had been crouching. They approached Telmarch, still trembling violently. The latter had found strength to utter his cry, but he could not speak. Deep emotions always produce this effect. He pointed to the woman lying at his feet. Is she still alive? asked one of the peasants. Telmarch nodded. And the other woman? Is she living too? 
asked the second peasant. Telmarsh shook his head. The peasant who had been the first to show himself continued. All the others are dead, are they not? I saw it all. I was in my cellar. How grateful one is to God in times like these to have no family. My house was burned. Lord Jesus, everybody was killed. This woman had children, three little ones. The children cried, Mother! The mother cried, Oh, my children! They killed the mother and carried away the children. I saw all. Oh, my God! My God! Those who murdered them went off well pleased. They carried away the little ones and killed the mother. But she is not dead, is she? I say, come on. Do you think you could save her? Don't you want us to help you carry her to your carnichot? Telmarch nodded. The woods were near the farm. They quickly made a litter with branches and ferns, and placing the woman, still motionless, upon it, they started towards the grove, the two peasants bearing the litter, one at the head, the other at the foot, while Telmarch supported the woman's arm and constantly felt her pulse. On the way the two peasants talked, and over the body of the bleeding woman, whose pale face was lighted by the moon, they exchanged their frightened exclamations. To kill all. To burn all. Oh, my lord, is that the way they are going to do now? It was that tall old man who ordered it. Yes, he was the commander. I did not see him while the shooting went on. Was he there? No, he was gone, but it was done by his order all the same. Then it was he who did this? He said, kill, burn, no quarter. Is he a marquis? Yes, of course, he is our Marquis. What is his name? It is Monsieur de Lantenac. Telmarch raised his eyes to heaven, murmuring between his teeth, Had I been known? End of section 20「Section 21 of 93 by Victor Hugo, translated by Aline Delano. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part 2. At Paris. Book 1. Simodan. Chapter 1. The Streets of Paris at that time. People lived in public. They ate at tables spread outside the doors. Women sat on the church steps, making lint to the accompaniment of the Marseillaise. The Parc of Monceau and the Luxembourg were turned into parade grounds. At every street corner there was a gunmaker's shop, where muskets were manufactured before the eyes of the passers-by, to their great admiration. Patience, this is revolution, was on every lip. People smiled heroically. They went to the theater, as in Athens during the Peloponnesian War. At street corners were seen such playbills as these, advertising, The Siege of Thionville, A Mother Saved from the Flames, The Club of Sans Souci the oldest of the Pope's Joan, the military philosophers, the art of love-making in the village. The Germans were at the gates. It was rumored that the King of Prussia had secured boxes for the opera. Everything was terrible, yet no one was frightened. The gruesome law against the suspected, which was the crime of Merlin de Douai, held a vision of the guillotine suspended over every head. A lawyer, Zeron by name, learning that he had been denounced, calmly awaited his arrest, arrayed in his dressing-gown and slippers, playing the flute at his window. No one seemed to have any spare time. Everyone was in a hurry. All the hats bore their cockades, and the women cried, Are not red caps becoming to us? All Paris seemed in the act of changing its abode. The curiosity shops were filled with crowns, mitres, gilded scepters, and fleur-de-lis, spoils from royal dwellings, the signs of the destruction of monarchy. Copes and surplices might be seen hanging on hooks offered for sale at the old clothes shops. At the Porcheron and at Ramponneau's, men decked out in surplices and stoles bestrode donkeys caparisoned with chasubles, and drank wine from ecclesiastical ciboria. In the Rue Saint-Jacques, barefooted street pavers once stopped the wheelbarrow of a shoe peddler, and, clubbing together, bought fifteen pairs of shoes to send to the convention for our soldiers. Busts of Rousseau, Franklin, Brutus, and even, be it added, of Marat, abounded. In the Rue Clocheperce, below one of Marat's busts, in a black wooden frame under glass, hung a formula of prosecution against Malouet, with facts in support of the charges, and the following lines inscribed on the margin. 
These details were given to me by the mistress of Sylvain Bailly, a good patriot and who had a liking for me, signed Marat. The inscription on the Palais Royal fountain, Quanto se fundit in usus, was hidden under two large canvases painted in distemper, one representing Cahier de Gerville denouncing to the National Assembly the rallying cry of the Chiffonistes of Arles, the other, Louis XVI, brought back from Varennes in his royal carriage, and under the carriage a plank fastened by cords, bearing on each end a grenadier with leveled bayonet. Very few large shops were open. Perambulating carts containing haberdashery and toys, lighted by tallow candles, which, melting, dripped upon the merchandise, were dragged through the streets by women. Ex-nuns adorned with blonde wigs kept open shop. This woman, darning stockings in a stall, was a countess, that dressmaker a marchioness. Madame de Boufflet lived in an attic from which she had a view of her own hotel. Vendors ran about offering the news bulletins. People who muffled their chins in their neckcloths were called écouéleurs. Street singers swarmed. The crowd hooted Pitou, the royalist songwriter, a brave man to boot, for he was imprisoned twenty-two times and was brought before the revolutionary tribunal for slapping himself behind when he uttered the word civism. Seeing that his head was in danger, he exclaimed, But my head is not the offending member, which made the judges laugh and saved his life. This Pitou ridiculed the fashion of Greek and Latin names. His favorite song was about a cobbler and his wife, whom he called Kujus and Kujustam. The Carmagnole was danced in circles. They no longer said lady and gentleman, but citizen and citizeness. They danced in the ruined cloisters, beneath a chandelier made of two sticks fastened crosswise to the vaulted roof, bearing four candles, while the church lamps burned upon the altar, and tombs lay beneath the dancers' feet. They wore tyrant blue waistcoats, and shirt pins called Liberty's Cap, composed of red, white, and blue stones. The Rue de Richelieu was called Rue de la Loi, the Faubourg Saint-Antoine, the Faubourg de Gloire. A statue of nature stood in the Place de la Bastille. People pointed out to each other well-known personages, Châtelet, Didier, Nicolas, and Gamier de Lonay, who mounted guard at the doors of the joiner du Plaid. Voulant, who never missed a day of guillotining, and who followed the tumbrils of the condemned, calling it going to the Red Mass. Montflabert, a revolutionary juryman and marquis whom they called Dix Aout. They watched the pupils of the École Militaire file past, called Aspirants to the School of Mars, by the decrees of the Convention, and nicknamed by the people Robespierre's Pages. They read the proclamations of Freron, denouncing those suspected of the crime of négociantisme. Young scapegraces gathered about the doors of the mayoralties, crowding the brides and grooms as they came in sight and shouting, Municipal marriages! in derision of the civil ceremony. The statues of the saints and kings at the Anvalides were crowned with Phrygian caps. They played cards on curbstones at the crossings, and the very cards themselves were totally revolutionized. Kings were replaced by genii, queens by the goddess of liberty, knaves by equality, aces by emblems of law. The public gardens were tilled. They ploughed the Tuileries. With all this was intermingled, especially among the conquered party, an indescribably haughty weariness of living. A man wrote to Fouquier Tinville, Be so kind as to lift from me the burden of life. This is my address. Champsonnet was arrested for exclaiming at the Palais Royal, When are we to have a Turkish revolution? I should like to see the Republic à la porte. Translator's footnote. A pun meaning a Turkish republic and the Republic expelled. End of footnote. Newspapers abounded. Hairdressers' apprentices curled the women's wigs in public, while the master read the moniteur aloud. Others, surrounded by listeners, commented with expressive gesticulations on the journal, Entendons-nous, of Dubois Conseil, or the Trompette du Père Belrose. Sometimes a man was both a barber and a pork dealer, and hams and chitterlings would hang side by side with a golden-haired doll. The wines of the émigrés were sold by dealers on the streets. One merchant advertised wine of fifty-two different brands. Others retailed lyre-shaped clocks and sofas à la duchesse. A hairdresser had the following notice printed on his sign. I shave the clergy. I dress the hair of the nobility. I wait upon the tiers -état. People went to Martin, at number 173 in the Rue d'Anjou, formerly called Rue Dauphine, to have their fortune told. Bread, coal, and soap were scarce. Herds of milch cows on their way from the provinces were constantly passing. 
At La Vallée, lamb was sold at fifteen francs a pound. An order of the commune assigned to each person a pound of meat for every ten days. People stood in files at the shop doors. One file that reached from the door of a grocer's shop in the Rue des Petits Carreaux to the middle of the Rue Montorgueil has become a matter of tradition. Forming a queue was called holding the string, on account of the long cord held by those who stood in line one behind the other. In the midst of all this wretchedness women were brave and gentle. They passed whole nights waiting their turn to be served at the baker's. The revolution was successful in its expedients. It alleviated this widespread misery by two dangerous measures, the azignat and the maximum, in other words, the lever and the fulcrum. France was actually saved by empiricism. The enemy, both in Koblenz and in London, speculated in azignats. Girls went hither and thither offering lavender water, garters, and false hair, and selling stocks at the same time. There were stock jobbers on the steps of the Rue Vivienne, with muddy shoes, greasy hair, woolen caps with foxtails, and the dandies of the Rue de Valois, with their polished boots, a toothpick in their mouths, and beaver hats on their heads, to whom the girls said, Thee and Thou. The people hunted them down as they did thieves, whom the royalists called active citizens, robbery, however, seldom occurred. The fearful destitution was matched by a stoical honesty. With downcast eyes, the barefooted and the hungry went gravely past the shop windows of the jewelers of the Palais Egalité. During a domiciliary visit made by the section Antoine at Beaumarchais's house, a woman plucked a flower in the garden. The crowd boxed her ears. A cord of wood cost four hundred francs in coin. People were to be seen in the streets sawing up their wooden beds, in the winter the fountains froze, and two pails of water cost twenty sous. Every man was his own water carrier. A gold louis was worth three thousand nine hundred and fifty francs. A ride in a fiacre cost six hundred francs. After a day's ride the following dialogue might be heard. How much do I owe you, coachman? Six thousand livres. The trade of a greengrocer woman amounted to twenty thousand francs a day. A beggar was known to have said, Help me for charity's sake. I want two hundred and thirty livres to pay for my shoes. At the entrance of the bridges might be seen colossal figures, sculptured and painted by David, which Mercier insultingly called enormous wooden punchinellos. These figures represented federalism and coalition overthrown. No infirmity of purpose among the people. There was a gloomy sense of pleasure in having put an end to thrones. No lack of volunteers ready to lay down their lives. Every street furnished a battalion. The flags of the district went hither and thither, each one with its own device. On the banner of the Capuchin district might be read, No one will shave us! On another, No other nobility save that of the heart! On the walls were placards, large and small, white, yellow, green, and red, printed and written, on all which might be read this war cry, Long live the Republic! Little children lisped, Saira! These little children were the nucleus of a great future. Later on, a cynical city took the place of the tragical one. The streets of Paris have displayed two distinct revolutionary aspects, the one preceding the Ninth Thermidor and that which followed it. After the Paris of Saint-Just came the Paris of Tallien. Such are the constant antitheses of Almighty God. Immediately after Sinai, the courtier appeared. Paroxysms of popular folly may always be expected. The same thing had taken place eighty years before. After Louis XIV, as well as after Robespierre, the people needed breathing space. Hence the regency at the opening of the century, and the directory at its close, each reign of terror ending in a Saturnalia. France fled from the Puritan as well as from the monarchical cloister with the joy of a nation escaping from bondage. After the Ninth Thermidor, Paris was like one gone mad with gaiety. An unwholesome joy prevailed, exceeding all bounds. The frenzy of life followed the frenzy of death, and grandeur eclipsed itself. They had a Trimalcion whom they called Grimaud de la Reynière, also an Almanac de Gourmand. People dined to the accompaniment of trumpets in the entresols of the Palais Royal. The orchestras were composed of women beating drums and blowing trumpets. The rigadooner, bow in hand, reigned over all. They supped after the oriental fashion at Mayotte's surrounded by censers of perfume. The artist Bose painted his daughters, innocent and charming heads of sixteen, in guillotine, that is, bare-necked and in red chemises. 
The wild dances in ruined churches were followed by the balls of Ruggieri, Luque Wenzel, Maudui, and the Montansier. To the dignified citoyens making lint succeeded sultanas, savages, and nymphs. To the bare feet of the soldiers, disfigured by blood, mud, and dust, succeeded the bare feet of women adorned with diamonds. And together with shamelessness came dishonesty, which had its purveyors in high places and their imitators in the lower ranks. Paris was infested by swarms of sharpers, and every man had to watch his look, or in other words, his pocketbook. One of the amusements was to go to the place of the Palais de Justice to see the female acrobats on the tabouret. They were forced to tie their skirts down. At the doors of the theatres, street urchins offered cabs, crying, Citizen and citizeness, there is room enough for two! They sold no more copies of The Old Cordelier, or of L'Ami du Peuple, but in their stead they offered Punch's Letter and The Rogue's Petition. The Marquis de Sade presided at the section of the Pikes, Place Vendôme. The reaction was both jovial and ferocious. The Dragons of Liberty of 92 were revived under the name of Knights of the Dagger. At the same time there appeared on the stage the type Jocris. There was a Merveilleuse, and after the Merveilleuse, the Inconceivable. People swore fantastic oaths by Sa Paul Victime and by Sa Paul Verte. This was the recoil from Mirabeau to Bobesh. Paris vibrates like an enormous pendulum of civilization. Now it touches one pole, now the other, Thermopylae and Gomorrah. After 93, revolution suffered a singular eclipse. The century apparently forgot to finish what it had begun. A strange orgy, interposing, took possession of the foreground, and thrusting the dread apocalypse behind, it drew a veil over the monstrous vision, and shouted with laughter after its fright. Tragedy vanished in parody and rising from the horizon's edge the smoke of carnival obscured the outlines of Medusa. But in the year 93 the streets of Paris still retained the imposing and fierce aspect of the beginning. They had their orators, like Varlo, for instance, who travelled about in a booth on wheels, from the top of which he harangued the passers-by. Their heroes, one of whom was called the Captain of Ironshod Poles. Their favourites, like Gouffroy, the author of the pamphlet Rugif. Some of these celebrities were mischievous, others exerted a wholesome influence. One among all the rest was honest and filial. It was Seymour Dunn. End of section 21《Chapter 2. Simordan Simordan had a pure but gloomy soul. There was something of the absolute within him. He had been a priest, which is a serious matter. A man may, like the heavens, enjoy a gloomy serenity. It needs only an influence powerful enough to create night within his soul. And the priesthood had done this thing for Simordan. To be once a priest is to be a priest forever. Though there be night within us, we may still possess the stars. Simordan was a man of many virtues and truths, but they shone amid the darkness. His story may be told in a few words. He had been a village curate and tutor in an influential family, but falling heir to a small legacy, he had thereby gained his freedom. He was obstinate to the last degree. He employed meditation as the artisan uses his pincers. He believed it wrong to abandon an idea until he had fully developed it. His method of thought was intense. He was familiar with all the European languages, and had some acquaintance with other tongues. His devotion to study was a great help toward the preservation of his chastity, but there is nothing more dangerous than such a system of repression. Either from pride, circumstances, or loftiness of soul, he had been true to his priestly vows, but his faith he had not been able to keep. Science had crushed it. All his dogmas had gone from him. Then, looking into his own soul, he saw therein a mutilated being, and having no power to rid himself of his priesthood, he tried, after an austere fashion, to remould the man. For want of a family he adopted his country. A wife had been refused him. He had wedded humanity. There is a certain sense of emptiness in this all-embracing zeal. His parents, who were peasants, had thought to lift him above the common people by consecrating him to the priesthood. He had returned among them of his own accord, 
and with a feeling of passionate devotion watched the suffering with intense sympathy. From a priest he had become a philosopher, and from a philosopher an athlete. Even during the life of Louis XV, Simordan had vaguely fancied himself a Republican. But of what Republic? Perhaps of the Republic of Plato, and it might be of Draco also. Forbidden to love, he devoted himself to hating. He detested lies, monarchy, theocracy, and his priestly garb. He hated the present and eagerly invoked the future. He had a presentiment of what it would be, he foresaw it, he pictured it both terrible and grand. In order to put an end to this deplorable human misery, he felt the need of a leader who would appear not only as an avenger, but also as a liberator. He worshipped the catastrophe from afar. In 1789 this catastrophe came and found him ready. Simordan flung himself into that gigantic scheme for human regeneration on logical principles, which, for a mind constituted like his, is equivalent to saying, with inexorable determination, logic is not a softening influence. He had survived the great revolutionary years, and had been shaken by the blasts thereof. In 89, the fall of the Bastille, the end of the martyrdom of people, in ninety, on the 19th of June, the end of the feudal system. In 91, Varennes, and the end of royalty. In 92, the birth of the Republic. He had seen the rise of revolution. He was not the man to fear that giant. On the contrary, the universal growth had given him new life, and though already advanced in years, for he was fifty, and a priest ages faster than other men, he too began to develop. From year to year he had watched and kept pace with the progress of events. At first he had feared lest revolution might fail. He watched it. Since it had both logic and justice on its side, he expected its success, and his confidence increased in proportion to the fear it inspired. He would have this Minerva, crowned with the stars of the future, a palace likewise, bearing the Gorgon's head for her buckler. In case of need, he would have wished an infernal glare to flash from her divine eyes upon the demons, paying them back in their own coin. Thus he reached ninety-three. Ninety-three is the war of Europe against France, and of France against Paris. What then is revolution? It is the victory of France over Europe, and of Paris over France. Hence the immensity of that terrible moment ninety-three, grander than all the rest of the century. Nothing could be more tragic. Europe attacking France, and France attacking Paris, a drama with the proportions of an epic. Ninety-three is a year of intense action. The tempest is there in all its wrath, and grandeur. Simordan felt himself in his element. This scene of distraction, wild and magnificent, suited the compass of his outspread wings. Like a sea eagle, he united a profound inward calm with a relish for external danger. Certain winged natures, souls of the tempest, ferocious yet tranquil, seem eminently fitted for combating the storms of life. His sense of pity was never kindled save in behalf of the wretched. He devoted himself to those forms of suffering that are most repulsive. For him nothing was abhorrent. That was his kind of goodness. He was divine in his zeal to relieve the most loathsome sufferers. He searched for ulcers that he might kiss them. Those noble actions which are hideous to look upon are the most difficult to perform. For such he had a preference. One day at the Hôtel Dieu a man was at the point of death, suffocating with a tumor in the throat, a putrid, malignant, and perhaps contagious abscess, which must be opened at once. Simordan was there. He put his lips to the abscess, sucked it, spitting it out as his mouth filled, emptied the tumor, and saved the man. As he still was wearing his priestly garb at the time, Someone said to him, Had you done that for the king, you would be made a bishop. I would not do it for the king, replied Simudan. The act and the answer made him popular in the gloomy quarters of Paris to a degree that won for him unbounded influence over the classes that suffer, weep, and struggle for vengeance. When the public indignation, that fruitful source of blunders, rose high against the monopolists, it was Simudan who by a word prevented the sacking of a boat laden with soap at the St. Nicholas Quay and who dispersed the furious crowds that were stopping the carriages at the barrier Saint-Lazare. He it was who ten days after the 10th of August marshaled the people who went forth to overthrow the statues of kings, which as they fell cost some of them their lives. On the Place Vendôme, a woman, Reine Violet, 
pulling at the rope she had fastened around the neck of Louis XVI, was crushed to death beneath its weight. The statue had been standing for a hundred years. It was erected on the 12th of August, 1692. It was overthrown on the 12th of August, 1793. On the Place de la Concorde, one Guinguerlot, having called the demolishers canaille, was butchered on the pedestal of the statue of Louis XV. The statue itself was hacked to pieces. Later it was melted into Sioux. One arm alone escaped. The right arm, which Louis XV held outstretched with the gesture of a Roman emperor. By request of Simordan, the people sent a deputation to offer this arm to Latoud, a man who had been buried alive in the Bastille for forty years. When Latoud, with an iron collar around his neck and a chain round his loins, was rotting alive in that prison at the bidding of the king whose statue overlooked Paris, who could have prophesied to him that both prison and statue would fall, and that he would come forth from his tomb? He, the prisoner, would be the master of that hand of bronze which had signed his warrant, and that nothing would be left of this monarch of clay save his brazen arm. Simordan was one of those men who possess an inward monitor, and who, when they appear absent-minded, are simply listening to its voice. Simordan was both learned and ignorant. He was versed in science, and knew nothing whatever of life. Hence his severity. His eyes were bandaged like those of Homer's Themis. He possessed the blind certainty of an arrow, that, seeing not besides, flies straight to the goal. In revolution there is nothing so formidable as the straight line. Simordan went straight ahead with fatal results. He believed that in these social geneses the farthest point is solid ground, an error common to minds in which logic occupies the place of reason. He went beyond the convention, beyond the commune. He belonged to the Evesche. The society, called the Evesche because it held its meetings in a hall of the old Episcopal palace, was rather a medley of men than a society. There were present, as in the commune, those silent but important spectators who, as Garat expressed it, had about them as many pistols as they had pockets. The Evesche was a queer mixture, both cosmopolitan and Parisian. No contradiction in terms, since Paris is the place where throbs the heart of all nations. There at the Evesche was the great plebeian incandescence. As compared with the Evesche, the convention was cold and the commune lukewarm. It was one of those revolutionary formations which partake of the nature of a volcano. The Evesche combined everything— ignorance, stupidity, honesty, heroism, wrath, and policy. Brunswick had agents therein. It held men worthy of Sparta, and others fit only for the galleys. The greater number of them were mad, and honest. The Gironde, speaking in the person of Isnard, temporary president of the convention, had uttered this appalling prophecy. Parisians, beware, for in your city not one stone shall be left resting upon another, and the day will come when men will search for the place where Paris once stood. This speech had given birth to the Evesche. Certain men, and, as we have just said, men of all nations, had felt the need of drawing closer to Paris. Simordan joined this group. This party reacted against the reactionists. It sprang from that public necessity for violence which constitutes the formidable and mysterious side of revolutions. Strong in this strength, the Evesche at once defined its position. In the disturbances of Paris, it was the commune that fired the cannon, and the Evesche that sounded the alarm. In his inexorable sincerity, Simordan believed that all means are fair when devoted to the service of truth, a conviction which eminently fitted him for the control of extremists of all parties. Scoundrels perceived him to be honest and were satisfied. Crime is flattered to feel that virtue has taken it in charge. It is rather embarrassing, but pleasing nonetheless. Paloy the architect, who had taken advantage of the destruction of the Bastille to sell the stones for his own benefit, and who, being appointed to paint the cell of Louis XVI, had in his zeal covered the wall with bars, chains, and iron collars. Gonchon, the suspected orator of the Faubourg Saint-Antoine, whose receipts were found later. The American Fournier, who on the 17th of July fired a pistol shot at Lafayette, an act for which they said Lafayette himself had paid. Henriot, who had come from Bicetre, and who had been a lackey, a juggler, a thief, and a spy before he turned general and leveled his guns on the convention, La Reine, formerly Grand Vicar of Chartres, who had substituted Père Duchesne for his breviary, all these men were respected by Simurdan, 
and all that was needed to keep the worst of them from stumbling occasionally was to feel that really formidable and determined candor like a judgment before them. It was thus that Saint-Just terrified Schneider. At the same time, the majority in the Évêché, consisting for the most part of poor and violent men, sincere in their purposes, believed in Simardan and followed him. His vicar, or aide-de-camp, whichever you choose to call him, was Danjou, that other republican priest whose lofty stature endeared him to the people, who called him the Abbé Cipied. Simourdan could have led whithersoever he chose that fearless chief called General La Pique, and the bold Truchon, surnamed Grand Nicholas, who tried to save Madame de Lamballe, offering her his arm to assist her in leaping over the corpses, an attempt which would have proved successful had it not been for the barbarous joke of Chariot the Barber. The commune kept watch over the convention, and the évêché over the commune. Simourdan, an upright man, despising intrigues, had broken more than one mysterious thread in the hands of Pache, whom Burnonville called the Black Man. At the Évêché, Simourdan was on good terms with all. He was consulted by Dobson and Momoro. He spoke Spanish to Guzman, Italian to Pio, English to Arthur, Flemish to Pereira, German to the Australian Proli, the bastard of a prince. He reconciled all these discordant elements, hence his strong, though obscure, position. Hébert feared him. In those times and over those tragic assemblies, Simourdan possessed the power of the inexorable. He was a faultless man who believed himself to be infallible. He had never been seen to weep. His was an inaccessible and frigid virtue, a just but awful man. There are no half-measures possible for a revolutionary priest. A priest who embarks in an adventure so portentous in its aims is influenced either by the highest or the lowest motives. He must be either infamous or sublime. Simourdan was sublime, but isolated in rugged inaccessibility, inhospitably repellent, sublime in his surrounding of precipices. Lofty mountains possess this forbidding purity. Simourdan looked like an ordinary man, clothed in whatever happened to be convenient, rather poor in aspect. In his youth he had received the tonsure, and later in life had become bald. His few remaining locks were grey. Looking upon his forehead, expansive as it was, an observing eye could read his character. Simourdan had an abrupt way of speaking, at once passionate and solemn. His utterance was rapid, his tone peremptory, the expression of his mouth sad and bitter. His eyes were clear and deep, and his whole face bore the impress of an unspeakable indignation. Such was Simourdan. Today his name is unknown. History possesses these terrible incognitos. End of section 22section 23 of 93 by victor hugo translated by aline delano this librivox recording is in the public domain part 2 book 1 chapter 3 a corner not dipped into the sticks was such a man in very deed a man could the servant of all men feel a personal affection was he not too much of a soul to possess a heart that vast embrace, enfolding everything and everybody, could it be limited to one? Could Simurdan love? We answer yes. In his youth, when he was a tutor in an almost princely family, he had a pupil, the son and heir of the house, whom he loved. It is easy to love a child. What is there that one cannot forgive a child? One forgives him for being a lord, a prince, a king. His innocent age and his weakness make one forget the crimes of his race and the arrogance of his rank. He is so little that one pardons him for being great. The slave forgives him for being the master. The old negro idolizes the white nursling. Simourdan had conceived a passionate love for his pupil. Childhood is so ineffably charming, it absorbs all love. All the power of loving in Simourdan's nature had, so to speak, concentrated itself upon that child. The heart, condemned to solitude, fed upon this sweet and innocent creature, which it loved with the combined tenderness of a father, a brother, a friend, and a creator. To him he was indeed a son, not of the flesh, but of the soul. He was not his father, the author of his being, but he was his master, and this was his masterpiece. He had made a man of this little lord, 
possibly a great man, who knows? Thus run our dreams. Without the knowledge of the family, for does one require permission to create an intelligence, a well-directed will, and an upright character? He had communicated to the young Viscount, his pupil, all the advanced ideas that he himself held. He had inoculated him with the dread virus of his own virtue. He had infused into his veins his belief, his conscience, his ideal. Into the brain of this aristocrat, as into a mold, he had poured the soul of the people. Mind seeks nourishment, intelligence is abreast. There is an analogy between the nurse who gives her milk and the tutor who gives his thought. Sometimes the tutor is more of a father than the actual father himself, just as the nurse is more like a mother than the natural mother. Simurdan was closely bound to his pupil by the profound paternity of the soul. The very sight of the child touched him. Let us add this. It was an easy matter to replace the father, since the child had none. He was an orphan. His father and mother were both dead. There was only a blind grandmother, and a great-uncle who did not live at home to watch over him. The grandmother died. The great-uncle, who was the head of the family, was a military man, a member of the high nobility, who held various appointments at court. He avoided the old family dungeon, living at Versailles, changing his quarters with the army, and leaving the orphan alone in the solitary castle. Thus the preceptor was the master in every sense of the word. Furthermore, let us add, Simordan had witnessed the birth of his pupil. When almost a baby, the child had a serious illness. During the crisis, Simordan had watched over him night and day. The doctor prescribes, but it is the nurse who saves, and Simordan had saved the child. Not only was his people indebted to him for his instruction, his education, and his knowledge, he also owed him his convalescence and his health. Over and above the development of his mind, he owed him his very life. We worship those who are indebted to us for everything. Hence Simurdan worshipped the child. In the course of time, the natural separation between them took place. Having finished his education, Simurdan was obliged to leave the child, who had now become a young man. With what cold and careless cruelty such separations are planned! How calmly do families discharge the tutor, who leaves his soul behind him with the child, and the nurse who leaves her heart's blood! Simurdan, having received his salary and his dismissal, had left the higher for the lower sphere. The partition that separates the great from the little had closed once more. The young lord, an officer by birth, received a captain's commission at the outset, and had departed to join some garrison. The humble tutor, already a rebellious priest in his secret heart, had lost no time in returning to the obscure ground floor of the church, among the inferior clergy, and thus lost sight of his pupil. Revolution came. The recollection still brooding within him of that creature whom he had transformed into a man was by no means lost, although buried beneath the immense accumulation of public affairs. It is a noble deed to model a statue and breathe into it the breath of life, but to mold an intelligence and inspire it with the spirit of truth is far nobler. Simurdan was the Pygmalion of a soul. The mind may possess its offspring. The only being on earth whom he loved was this pupil, child and orphan as he was. Is such a man vulnerable to the influence of any affection whatsoever? We shall see. End of section 23section 24 of 93 by victor hugo translated by aline delano this librivox recording is in the public domain part 2 book 2 the pothouse of the rue de pon chapter 1 minos iacus and radamanthus in the rue de pon there was an alehouse called by courtesy a cafe and in this cafe a back room which has since become famous in history it was here that from time to time those men, so powerful and so closely watched that they dared not venture to speak to one another in public, held their secret meetings. It was there, on the 23rd day of October, 1792, that the Mountain and the Gironde exchanged their famous kiss. There, too, Garat, although he does not admit it in his memoirs, came for information during that rueful night when, after having placed Clavier in safety at the Rue de Beaune, he stopped his carriage on the Pont Royal to listen to the tocsin. On the 28th of June, 1793, in this back room, 
Three men were gathered around a table. Their chairs did not touch. Each man occupied one of the three sides of the table, leaving the fourth one vacant. It was about eight o'clock in the evening. Although it was still light in the street, the back room was dark, and a lamp, a luxury in those times, hanging from the ceiling threw its light upon the table. The first of those men was pale, young, and grave, with thin lips and a cold, unsympathetic expression. There was a nervous twitching in his cheek, which must have been a drawback to the act of smiling. He was powdered and gloved, and his well-brushed and carefully buttoned light blue coat fitted him without a wrinkle. He wore nankeen breeches, white stockings, a high cravat, a plaited shirt frill, and silver buckles on his shoes. Of the two other men, one was, so to speak, a giant, the other a dwarf. The tall man was negligently dressed in a loose coat of scarlet, with his neck bare, and a half-untied cravat hanging carelessly below his shirt frill. His waistcoat was unfastened for want of buttons. He wore top boots, and his hair, although disheveled and bristling, still showed signs of former dressing. His wig looked very much like a mane, and his face was marked by the smallpox. Between his eyebrows was a line betokening a fierce temper, and at the corner of his mouth another, rather suggestive of a kindly nature. His lips were thick, his teeth large. He had the fist of a porter, and flashing eyes. The short personage was a yellow-looking man, who, when seated, had the effect of one deformed. His head was thrown back, his eyes bloodshot. Livid patches covered his face. A handkerchief was tied over his straight, greasy hair. No forehead to speak of, but a monstrous and terrible mouth. He wore long trousers, slippers, a waistcoat that seemed originally to have been made of white satin, and over it a loose jacket, in the folds of which a hard, straight line revealed the presence of a poniard. The first of these men was Robespierre, the second Danton, the third Marat. They were alone in this room. Before Danton stood a bottle of wine covered with dust, reminding one of Luther's half-pint of beer, a cup of coffee before Marat, and papers were spread in front of Robespierre. Near the papers stood one of those round, heavy, ridged, leaden inkstands, which will be remembered by all who were schoolboys at the beginning of this century, and a pen had been thrown down beside it. A large brass seal bearing the words Paloifechit, and representing an exact miniature model of the Bastille, rested upon these papers. A map of France lay outspread in the middle of the table. Outside the door stood Marat's watchdog, one Laurent Basse, the same who was an agent at number 18 Rue de Cordelier, and who on the 13th of July, nearly a fortnight after this 28th of June, was to deal a blow with a chair upon the head of a woman named Charlotte Corday, who at this time was vaguely dreaming at Cayenne. Laurent Basse was the proof-carrier of L'Ami du Peuple. On that evening, having been brought by his master to the café of the Rue de Pan, he was ordered to keep the room closed where Marat, Danton, and Robespierre were seated, and to admit no one, unless it were some person from the Committee of Public Safety, the Commune, or the Eveche. Robespierre would not have it closed against Saint-Just, neither would Danton refuse admittance to Pache, or Marat to Guzman. The subject of the conference, which had already lasted a long time, lay in the papers spread out on the table, which Robespierre had been reading aloud. The voices were gradually rising higher and higher. Something very like anger was developing between these three men. From without one could catch, from time to time, fragments of excited speech. In those days the custom of public tribunals seemed to have created a certain right to listen. It was at the time when the copying clerk, Fabricius Paris, watched through the keyhole the proceedings of the Committee of Public Safety. Not an act of supererogation, be it observed, for it was this very Paris who notified Danton on the night of the 31st of March, 1794. Laurent Basse had his ear at the door of the back room in which Danton, Marat, and Robespierre were seated. He served Marat, but he belonged to the Eveche. End of section 24「Section 25 of 93 by Victor Hugo, translated by Aline Delano. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part 2, Book 2, Chapter 2, Magna Testantur Voce per Umbras. Danton had just risen, pushing back his chair impetuously. Listen, he cried, there is but one urgent business. The Republic is in danger. I have but a single purpose, that is, to deliver France from the enemy. And to accomplish this, all means are fair. All, all, all! 
I have to deal with every form of danger. I employ every variety of expedient. And when all is to be feared, then I venture all. My thought is a lioness. No half-measures, no squeamishness in revolution. Nemesis is not a haughty prude. Let us make ourselves terrible and likewise useful. Does the elephant stop to see where he puts his foot? Let us crush the enemy. Robespierre replied mildly, I am willing. Then he added, The question is to learn the whereabouts of the enemy. He is without, and it is I who have driven him there, said Danton. He is within, and I am watching him, said Robespierre. I will drive him out again, replied Danton. One cannot so easily expel an internal enemy. What then is to be done? He must be exterminated. I agree to that, said Danton in his turn, and he continued, But I tell you he is outside, Robespierre. And I tell you that he is within, Danton. Robespierre, he is on the frontier. He is in the Vendée, Danton. Calm yourselves, remarked a third voice. He is everywhere, and you are lost. It was Marat who spoke. Robespierre looked at Marat and quietly retorted, A truce to generalizations? Let us come to particulars. Here are the facts. He don't, growled Marat. Placing his hand on the paper spread out before him, Robespierre continued, I have just read you the despatches of Prieur de la Marne and also communicated the information given by Gilambre. Listen, Danton. Foreign war is as nothing compared with the dangers of civil war. A foreign war is like a scratch on the elbow, but civil war is an ulcer which eats away your liver. Here is the sum and substance of all that I have just read to you. The Vendée, which has hitherto been divided among many chiefs, is about to concentrate its forces. Henceforth it is to have one leader. A sort of central brigand, muttered Danton. It is the man who landed near Pontorson on the 2nd of June. You have seen what he is. Observe that this landing was contemporary with the arrest of the representatives Prieur de la Côte d'Or and Rome at Bayeux, by that treacherous district of Calvados which took place on the very same day, the 2nd of June. And the transfer to the castle of Cayenne, said Danton. Robespierre replied, I will proceed to sum up the despatches. They are organizing the warfare of the forest on a vast scale. At the same time, an English invasion is in preparation. Vendeans and Englishmen, Brittany joining hands with Britain. The Hurons of Finisterre speak the same language as the Tupinambas of Cornwall. I showed you an intercepted letter of Puisai where he says that twenty thousand red coats distributed among the insurgents will be the means of raising one hundred thousand more. When the peasant insurrection is fully organized, the English descent will take place. Here is the plan. Follow it on the map. And putting his finger on the map, Robespierre continued. The English have the choice of landing place from Cancal to Pampol. Craig would prefer the Bay of saint Brieuc, Cornwallis the Bay of saint Cast, but this is simply a matter of detail. The left shore of the Loire is guarded by the rebel Vendean army, and as to the twenty-eight miles of open country between Ancigny and Pontorson, forty Norman parishes have promised their assistance. The descent will be made at three points, Plairie, Nifignac, and Pleneuf. From Pleron they will go to saint Brieuc, and from Pleneuf to Lombal. On the second day they intend to reach Dinan, where there are nine hundred English prisoners, thus simultaneously occupying saint Juan and saint Mayenne, where they are to leave the cavalry. On the third day two columns will march, one to Juan on Bidet, the other to Dinan on Becherel, a natural fortress, and where they propose to set up two batteries. On the fourth day they expect to be at Rennes, which is the key to Brittany. Whoever has Rennes is master of the situation. Rennes, once taken, Chateauneuf and Saint-Malo are sure to fall. There are one million carriages and fifty field pieces at Rennes. Which they will sweep away, muttered Danton. Robespierre continued. To conclude, from Rennes three columns will descend, one upon Fougere and the second and third upon Vitré and Redon. As the bridges are destroyed, the enemy will be provided, as has already been stated, with pontoons and planks, and they will also have guides for such places as are affordable by cavalry. From Fougere they will diverge to Avranche, from Redon to Ancigny, from Vitré to Laval. Nantes will surrender Brest like boys. Redon opens the way to Villan, as Fougere to Normandy, and Vitré to Paris. In fifteen days they will have a brigand army of three hundred thousand men, and the whole of Brittany will belong to the King of France. You mean to the King of England? said Danton. No, to the King of France, replied Robespierre, adding, the king of France is worse, and it takes fifteen days to expel a foreign foe and eighteen hundred years to destroy a monarchy. Danton, who had reseated himself with his elbows resting on the table, supported his head on his hands and remained buried in thought. 
You perceive the danger, said Robespierre. Vitray opens for the English the way to Paris. Raising his head, Danton brought his two clenched fists down upon the map as though it were an anvil. Robespierre, did not Verdun open the way to Paris for the Prussians? What then? Well, we will drive the English as we drove the Prussians. And Danton rose again. Robespierre placed his cold hand on Danton's burning wrist. Danton Champagne did not take sides with the Prussians as Brittany does with the English. Retaking Verdun was foreign war, but to recapture Vitre will be civil war. And Robespierre murmured in a cold, sepulchral tone, A serious difference. Then he continued, Sit down, Danton, and look at the map instead of battering it with your fists. But Danton was wholly carried away with his own ideas. Well, this goes beyond everything, he exclaimed, to be on the alert for a catastrophe in the West when it is actually in the East. I grant you, Robespierre, that England looms up on the ocean, but Spain rises from behind the Pyrenees, Italy from the Alps, Germany from the Rhine, and the big Russian bear is behind them all. Robespierre, danger surrounds us like a circle, and we are in its center. Coalition abroad, treason at home. In the south, Servant holds the door of France ajar for the king of Spain. In the north, Dumouriez goes over to the enemy. However, he always threatened Holland less than Paris. Near wind has wiped out Jemap and Valmy. The philosopher Robot saint Etienne, a traitor like the Protestant he is, corresponds with the courtier Montesquieu. The army is decimated. No battalion has now over four hundred men, and the brave regiment of Dupont is reduced to one hundred and fifty. The camp of Pamars has surrendered. Givet has but five hundred bags of flour left. We are falling back on Landau. Worms are presses Kleber. Mayence makes a valiant defense. Condé yields ignobly, and Valenciennes likewise. But this in no way alters the fact that their defenders, Ferraud and Chancel, are two heroes, not to mention Meunier, who defended Mayence. But all the others are betraying us. Darville plays the traitor at Aix la Chapelle, Mouton at Brussels, Valence at Breda, Neuilly at Limbourg, Miranda at Maastricht, Stengel, Lanou, Ligonier, Menu, Dillon, traitors all! Hideous coin of Dumouriez. Examples are needed. I am suspicious of Custine's countermarches. I am inclined to believe that he preferred the lucrative capture of Frankfurt to the more useful one of Coblentz. Suppose that Frankfurt is able to pay a war indemnity of four millions. What is that in comparison with crushing a nest of émigrés? I call it treason. <sighs> Meunier died on the 13th of June, and Kleber is now alone. Meanwhile, Brunswick gains strength and marches onward. He raises the German flag in every French place that he captures. The Margrave of Brandenburg is today the arbiter of Europe. He is pocketing our provinces. You will soon see him appropriating Belgium. One might think that we were working for Berlin. And if this continues and we take no means to prevent it, the French Revolution will result in the aggrandizement of Potsdam. Its chief consequence will be the advancement of the little state of Frederick II, and we shall have killed the King of France for the benefit of the King of Prussia. Here Danton, terrible in his wrath, burst into a fit of laughter, which made Marat smile. You have each your hobby. Yours, Danton, is Prussia, and yours, Robespierre, is the Vendée. I will also mention a few facts. You do not see the real danger which is centered in the cafés and the gaming houses. The Café de Choiseul is Jacobin. The Café Paton, Royalist. The Café Rendezvous attacks the National Guard, and the Café de la Porte Saint-Martin defends it. The Café de la Régence is opposed to Brissot. The Café Corraza favors him. The Café Procope swears by Diderot, and the Café du Théâtre Français by Voltaire. At the Rotonde, they tear up the Assignats. The Café saint Marceau are in a state of perfect fury. The Café Manoury is agitating the flower problem. At the Café de Foy, there is a perpetual racket and brawling, and at the Perron, the hornets of finance are buzzing. All this is a serious matter. Danton no longer laughed, but Marat still continued to smile. The smile of a dwarf is worse than the laugh of a giant. Are you sneering, Marat? growled Danton. Marat twitched his hip convulsively, that motion peculiar to himself which has been so often described, and his smile died away. Ah, I recognize you, citizen Danton. You are the man who in full convention called me that individual Marat. Listen, I forgive you. We are in times when men play the fool. Sneering, did you say? What kind of a man do you think I am? I have denounced Chazot, 
pétion, caissante, mouton, du priche valasé, ligonnier, menu, barneville, jansonnet, byron, lidon, and chambon. Was I wrong? I sent the treason of the traitor before the deed is done, and I find it useful to denounce the criminal in advance. It is my habit to say in the evening what the rest of you say the next day. I am the man who proposed to the Assembly a complete scheme for criminal legislation. What have I done up to the present moment? I asked to have the sections instructed that they might be disciplined for revolution. I had the seals of thirty-two boxes broken. I reclaimed the diamonds placed in the hands of Roland. I proved that the Brissotons had given to the Committee of General Safety blank warrants. I noted certain omissions in Linde's report concerning the crimes of Capet. I voted for the execution of the tyrant in the course of twenty-four hours. I defended the battalions of Mauconseil and the Republican. I prevented the reading of Narbonne's and Malouet's letters. I motioned in favor of the wounded soldiers. I caused the suppression of the Committee of Six. I foresaw the treason of Dumouriez in the affair of Mons. I demanded to have one hundred thousand relatives of the refugees taken as hostages for the commissioners delivered to the enemy. I proposed to declare traitor any representative who crossed the frontier. I unmasked the faction of Roland in the disturbances at Marseilles. I insisted that a price should be set on the head of Egalité's son. I defended Bouchot. I called for a nominal vote to expel Isnard from the chair. It was I who instigated the declaration that Parisians had deserved well of their country. That is why Louvet calls me a dancing puppet, and why Finisterre demands my expulsion. For this the city of Loudun wishes me to be exiled, and the city of Amiens proposes to muzzle me. Coburg requires my arrest and Le Quante Pueravo suggests to the Convention that it would be well to pronounce me insane. Bah! Citizen Danton, why did you ask me to come to your conventicle if you did not wish for my advice? Did I ask permission to belong to it? Far from it. I have no inclination for a tete-a-tete -tete with such counter-revolutionists as Robespierre and yourself. Oh, however, I might have expected this. You have not understood me, neither you nor Robespierre. Are there then no statesmen here? You need a spelling lesson in politics and someone to dot your eyes for you. This is the meaning of what I told you. You are both mistaken. The danger comes neither from London nor from Berlin, as you two believe. It is in Paris. It is in the absence of unity in the right of every man to pull his own way, beginning with you yourselves, in the leveling of intellects, in the anarchy of will. Anarchy! interrupted Danton. Who is it that causes anarchy if not yourself? Marat paid no attention. Robespierre, Danton, the danger is in this multitude of cafés, in these countless scheming houses, this crowd of clubs. Club des Noirs, Club des Fédères, Club des Dames, Club des Impatios, which dates from Clermont Tonnerre and which was the monarchical club of 1790, a social circle originated by the priest Claude Fauché, the Club des Bonnets de Laine, founded by the journalist Proudhon, etc., without counting your Jacobin Club, Robespierre, and your Club of Cordeliers, Danton. The danger is in the famine that made the port sac blin hang François Denis, the baker of Palu Market, to the lamp-post of the Hôtel de Ville, and likewise in the justice that hung port sac blanc for hanging Baker Denis. The danger lies in the depreciation of the currency. One day on the Rue du Temple an assignat of a hundred francs fell to the ground, and a passer-by, a man of the lower class, remarked, it is not worth while to pick it up. The danger comes from the stockbrokers and the monopolists. Fine progress we have made when we hoist the black flag over the Hôtel de Ville. You have arrested Baron Trenck, but that is not sufficient. 
I want to see you wring the neck of that old prison intriguer. Do you think that the business is accomplished because the president of the convention places a civic crown on the head of La Bertèche, who received forty-one saber thrusts at Chimop, and of whom Chenier makes himself the showman, comedies and idle shows? Ah, you take no heed of Paris. You are looking for danger at a distance when it is close at hand. Of what use are your police, Robespierre? You have your spies, Payan in the Commune, Coffinhal at the Revolutionary Tribunal, David in the Committee of Public Safety, Couthon in the Committee of Public Well-Being. You perceive that I am well informed? Now then, learn this. The danger is hanging over your heads and rising beneath your feet. Conspiracies! 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 The people passing along the streets read the papers to one another and nod their heads significantly. Six thousand men having no civic papers, the returned émigrés, muscadins, and the Mathevons, are hidden in the cellars and garrets and in the wooden galleries of the Palais Royal. They are ranged in files in front of the bake shops. Women stand on the door sills and, clasping their hands, cry, when shall we have peace? It is of no use to close the doors of the executive committee against the public. Every word you utter is known. And as a proof, Robespierre, I will repeat the words you spoke last night to Saint-Just. Barbaroux's paunch grows apace. That will inconvenience him in his flight. Danger, I tell you, lurks on every side, but chiefly in the centre. In Paris, while the ci devants are weaving their plots, the patriots go barefoot. The aristocrats arrested on the ninth of March are already released. The fine private horses that bespatter us with mud in the streets ought to be harnessed to the cannons on the frontier. A loaf of bread weighing four pounds is sold for three francs and twelve sous. Indecent plays are given on the stage, and Robespierre will sooner or later send Danton to the guillotine. Fiuch! exclaimed Danton. Robespierre was attentively studying the map. What we need is a dictator, cried Marat fiercely. You know, Robespierre, that I want a dictator. Robespierre raised his head. Yes, I know, Marat, it must be either you or I. I or you, you mean, retorted Marat. The dictatorship, I advise you to try it, grumbled Danton between his closed teeth. Marat perceived Danton's frown. Stop, he said. Let us make one last effort to come to an agreement. The situation is well worth it. Was there not an understanding for the 31st of May? The question of mutual agreement is even more important than Girondism, which is a matter of detail. There is a certain amount of truth in your statements, but truth itself, the whole truth, the real truth, lies in, I say, federalism in the South, royalism in the West, a deadly struggle between the Convention and the Commune in Paris, and on the frontier the backsliding of Custine and the treason of Dumouriez. What will be the result? The end will be nothing less than dismemberment. And what do we require? Unity. Therein lies our salvation. But we have no time to lose. Paris must undertake the control of the revolution. If we waste one hour, the Vendeans may be in Orléans tomorrow, and the Prussians in Paris? Ah, I grant one thing to you, Danton, and another to Robespierre. So be it, and the conclusion must be dictatorship. Let us, we three who represent the revolution, grasp the dictatorship. We are the three heads of Cerberus. One is a talking head, and that is you, Robespierre. The second head does the roaring, and that is you, Danton. And the other bites, and that is you, Marat, said Danton. All three bite, said Robespierre. For a time there was silence. Then this dialogue full of gloomy and violent utterances proceeded. The 
Listen, Mara, people should know each other before they marry. How did you find out what I said to Saint-Just yesterday? That is my affair, Robespierre. Marat! It is my duty to gain information. Marat! I like to know what is going on. Marat! Robespierre, I know what you say to Saint-Just, as I know what Danton says to Lacroix. I know what happens on the Quai of the Théâtons, at the Hôtel La Brief, a den frequented by the nymphs of the emigration, as well as I know what is going on at the House of Thiers, near Gonesse, which now belongs to Valmarange, the former administrator of the postal service, where Maury and Casalis were in the habit of going, a house which Sieyes and Vergniaud has since frequented, and where at the present time a certain person goes once a week, in saying a certain person, Marat looked significantly at Danton. "'If I had but two farthings worth of power, this would be terrible!' cried Danton. "'I know what you say, Robespierre,' continued Marat, "'just as I knew what was going on in the Tower of the Temple when they were fattening Louis Sixteenth, and the wolf, the she-wolf, and the cubs during the month of September alone devoured eighty-six baskets of peaches.' At that time, the nation was starving. I know it, as I know that Roland was concealed in a lodging looking out on a backyard in the Rue de la Harpe, as I know that six hundred pikes used on the 14th of July were manufactured by Fauré, the locksmith of the Duke of Orléans, as I know what they do at the house of Saint-Hilaire, the mistress of celery. On the days when there is to be a ball, old Sillery himself chalks the parquet floors of the yellow salon in the Rue Neuve des Maturons. Bouzot and Kersant dined there. Saladin dined there on the 27th. And with whom do you guess, Robespierre? With your friend, La Source. Idle talk, muttered Robespierre. La Source is not my friend, he added thoughtfully. In the meantime, there are eighteen manufactories of false assignats in London. Marat went on in a voice calm but somewhat tremulous, an ominous sign with him. You are the faction of the all-importance. Yes, I know everything in spite of what Saint-Just calls the silence of state. Marat emphasized this word, looked at Robespierre, and continued. I know the conversation that takes place at your table on the days when Lebas invites David to eat the food prepared by his betrothed, Elizabeth Duplay, your future sister-in-law, Robespierre. I am the all-seeing eye of the people, and from the depths of my cave I observe. Yes, I hear, I see, and I know. You are contented with small things. You admire yourself. Robespierre shows himself off before his Madame de Chalabre, the daughter of the Marquis who played whist with Louis XV on the evening of Damien's execution. Yes, heads are carried high in these days. Saint Just never unbends. Legendre is a scrupulous devotee to fashion with his new frock coat and white waistcoat and a frill that people may forget his apron. Robespierre imagines that history will be interested to know that he wore an olive-coloured coat a la Constitution and a sky-blue coat a la Convention. He hangs his portrait on every wall around his room. Robespierre interrupted him in a voice even more quiet than that of Marat himself. And you drag yours through all the sewers, Marat. They continued this conversation in tones whose very deliberation emphasized the violence of the attacks and retorts, and added a certain irony to the implied threats. Robespierre, you called those who are in favor of the abolition of monarchy the Don Quixotes of mankind. And you, Marat, after the 4th of August, and number 559 of your Abbé du Peuple, you see, I remember the number, a useful item. You requested to have the titles of the nobles restored to them. You said, once a duke, always a duke. Robespierre, in the session of the 7th of December, you defended Roland's wife against Biard. 
Just as my brother defended you, Marat, when you were attacked at the Jacobins, what does that prove? Nothing at all. Robespierre, we all know the cabinet at the Tuileries where you said to Garas, I am tired of the revolution. Marat, in this very alehouse on the 20th of October, you embraced Barbaroux. And you said to Buzot, Robespierre, what does the Republic signify? Marat, you invited three men from Marseille to breakfast with you here in the sale house. Robespierre, you go about escorted by a strong fellow from the market armed with a club. And you, Marat, on the eve of the 10th of August, you asked Buzot to assist you in escaping to Marseille disguised as a jockey. During the prosecutions of September, you took good care to hide yourself, Robespierre. And you, Marat, were not backward in making a display of yourself. Robespierre, you flung the red cap on the ground. Yes, when a traitor hoisted it. Dumouriez defiles Robespierre. Robespierre. You refused to throw a veil over the head of Louis XVI when Chateauvieux's soldiers were passing. I did better than veil his head. I cut it off. Danton interposed, but it was like pouring oil upon the flames. Robespierre, Marat, calm yourselves, he said. Marat did not like to be mentioned in the second place. He turned round. What affair is this of Danton? What affair of mine, I will tell you. There must be no fratricides. We must have no strife between two men, both of whom serve the people. It is enough to have to deal with foreign and civil wars, and it would be too much if we were to have a family conflict. It is I who made the revolution, and I do not choose to have it destroyed. This is why I feel called upon to interfere. Marat replied without raising his voice. You had better be attending to the settlement of your own accounts. My accounts, cried Danton. Go ask for them in the passes of Argonne, in Champagne delivered, in Belgium conquered, in the armies where I have exposed my breast four times already to the grape-shot. Inquire in the Place de la Révolution, on the scaffold of the 21st of January, of the throne lying on the ground, of the guillotine that would o- Here Marat broke forth, interrupting Danton. The guillotine is a virgin who gives death unto men, but not life. What do you know about it? I will make her fruitful. We shall see. And he smiled. Danton saw the smile. Marat, he cried, you are the man who prefers to hide. I am a man who rejoices in broad daylight, in the open air. I despise the life of a reptile. It would not suit me to be a woodlouse. You live in a cave, I live in the street. You hold no communication with mankind. The chance passerby may see and speak with me. Handsome youth, will you ascend to my abode? growled Marat. And no longer smiling, he continued in a peremptory tone. Danton, give an account of the thirty-three thousand crowns cash that were paid you by that Montmoron in the name of the king, under the pretext of indemnifying you for the post of solicitor of the Châtelet. I belong to the 14th of July, said Danton haughtily. And the guard meuble, and the crown diamonds. I was also of the 6th of October. And the thefts of your alter ego, La Croix, in Belgium. I was of the 20th of June. And the loans to Montansier. I influenced the people to bring about the return from Varennes. And the opera house built with the money that you furnished. I armed the sections of Paris. And the hundred thousand livres in secret funds of the Ministère de la Justice. The 10th of August was my work. And the two millions secret expenses of the assembly, a quarter of which fell to your share. I arrested the progress of the enemy and barred the road to the allied kings. Prostitute, cried Marat. Danton was terrible in his wrath. Yes, he cried, you have spoken the word. I have sold my virtue, but I saved the world. Robespierre, meanwhile, continued to bite his nails. He could neither laugh nor smile. He possessed not the lightning-like laughter of Danton, nor the sting of Marat's smile. 
Danton continued. I am like the ocean. I have my flood and ebb. When the tide is low, you can see the shoals, but at high tide you see only the waves. Which one might call your froth, said Marat. My tempest, rather, replied Danton. They both sprang to their feet, and Marat burst forth. The adder suddenly assumed the shape of a dragon. Ah, Robespierre, ah, Danton, he exclaimed. You will not listen to me. I tell you, you are lost. Your policy brings you up against a wall. Every issue is closed to you, and you go on committing deeds that will finally leave you with no outlet save that of the grave. And that lies the very essence of our greatness, said Danton, shrugging his shoulders. Marat went on. Danton, beware. Vernieu has a wide mouth, thick lips and frowning brows like yourself. He is also pitted like you and Mirabeau. Yet this did not prevent the 31st of May. Ah, you shrug your shoulders. A shrug of the shoulders has been known to cost a man his head. I tell you, Danton, your loud voice, your loose cravat, your top boots, your late suppers, your ample pockets. Louisette will have something to say about all that. Louisette was Marat's pet name for the guillotine. He continued. And as for you, Robespierre... You are a moderate, but that will avail you nothing. Go on, powder and dress your hair, brush your clothes, play the coxcomb, wear fine linen, be a model of propriety, frizzed and be dizened. Sooner or later you will go to the Place de la Greve. Read Brunswick's proclamation and make up your mind to be treated like the regicide d'Amiens and you are arrayed in fine style to be drawn and quartered. Echo of coblets, muttered Robespierre between his teeth. Robespierre, I echo no one. I am the cry of the whole world. Ah, you are young, both of you. How old are you, Danton? Thirty-four. And you, Robespierre, thirty-three. Well, as for myself, I have lived from the beginning of time. I am the embodiment of the ancient misery of mankind. I am six thousand years old. That is true, replied Danton. For six thousand years, Cain has been preserved in hatred like a toad in a stone. The stone breaks and Cain leaps forth among men to be known as Marat. Danton, cried Marat, and a livid glare shone in his eyes. Well, what is it? said Danton. Thus conversed these three terrible men, conflicting thunderbolts. End of section 25
During Marat's outbreak, someone had entered, unperceived, through the door at the back of the room. Is that you, Citizen Seymour Dan? said Marat. Good day. It was Seymour Dan. I tell you that you are wrong, Marat, he repeated. Marat turned green, which was his way of growing pale, and Seymour Dan added, You are useful, but Robespierre and Danton are indispensable. Why do you threaten them? Let us have union, citizens. The people wish us to be united. This entrance was like a dash of cold water, or the arrival of a stranger upon the scene of a family quarrel. It produced a calming effect upon the surface if it did not reach the depths. Seymour Dan advanced towards the table. Both Danton and Robespierre knew him. They had often noticed, in the public tribunals of the convention, this obscure but influential man whom the people greeted with respect. Robespierre, however, always ceremonious, inquired, How did you get in, citizen? He belongs to the Abiché, replied Marat, in an unusually meek tone of voice. Marat braved the convention and led the commune, but he feared the Abiché. This is a law. Mirabeau, in some mysterious faraway depth, is conscious of the existence of Robespierre. Marat, too, is aware of Hébert, Hébert of Babeuf. So long as the subterranean strata remain quiet, the politician can move at his ease. But there is a subsoil under the most revolutionary, and the boldest men will quail when they feel beneath their feet the movement which they themselves have started overhead. To be able to distinguish between the disturbance that springs from covetousness and that which is founded on principle, to combat the one and to aid the other, constitutes the genius and merit of great revolutionists. Oh, citizen Seymour Dan is not unwelcome, Danton said, as he extended his hand to Seymour Dan, adding, Farble, let us explain the situation to citizen Seymour Dan. He comes in just in time. I represent the Mountain, Robespierre the Committee of Public Safety, Marat the Commune, and Seymour Dan represents the Efficé. He will give us the casting vote. So be it, replied Seymour Dan, in his serious and simple manner. What is the subject under consideration? The Vendée replied Robespierre. The Vendée, echoed Simourdan, then went on. There lies the great danger. If revolution expires, the Vendée will have given it its death blow. One Vendée is more to be feared than ten Germanies. If France is to be saved, we must destroy the Vendée. These words run Robespierre to his side, but still the latter put the question, Were you not formerly a priest? For the priestly aspect had not escaped his observation, he recognized in another what he had within himself. Yes, citizen, replied Seymour Dan. What does that matter? cried Danton. When priests are good, they are better than other men. In time of revolution, priests are melted into citizens, just as bells are melted into Sioux and Cannon. Danjou and Danon are both priests. Thomas Lindet is Bishop of Evreux. At the convention, Robespierre, you sit side by side with Monsieur, Bishop of Beauvais. The vicar general, Vaugeois, belonged to the insurrection committee of the 10th of August. Chabot is a Capuchin. Domgueil devised the oath of the tennis court. The Abbé Audran declared the National Assembly superior to the king. The Abbé Goutte asked the legislature to remove the dais from the chair of Louis XVI, and the Abbé Grégoire instigated the abolition of royalty. A motion seconded by the comedian Collot d'Herbois. They too did the business. The priest overturned the throne. The comedian deposed the king. Let us return to the Vendée, said Robespierre. Well, what is it? asked Seymour Dan. What is the Vendée doing now? This, replied Robespierre. It has found a leader. It will become terrible. Who is this leader, citizen Robespierre? He is a seed of old Marquis de Lantenac, who styles himself a Breton prince. Seymour Dan made a movement. I know him, he said. I was chaplain at his house. He reflected for a moment and then continued. He was fond of women before he became active in military affairs. Like Byron, who was a Lausun, said Danton. Seymour Dan added thoughtfully, Yes, formerly a man devoted to pleasure. He must be terrible. Frightful, said Robespierre. He burns villages, kills the wounded, massacres prisoners, and shoots women. Women? Yes, among others, he ordered a woman to be shot who was the mother of three children. No one knows what became of the children. Moreover, he is really a leader. He understands the art of warfare. True, replied Seymour Dan. When he was in the Hanoverian War, the soldiers used to say, Richelieu above, Lantenac below. 
but the latter was the actual general. Ask your colleague Dussault about it. Robespierre remained for a moment absorbed in thought. Then the conversation between Simodan and himself was renewed. Well, citizen Simodan, this man is in the Vendée. How long since? Three weeks ago. He must be outlawed. That has been done. A price must be set upon his head. That also has been done. A large sum of money must be offered for his capture. The offer has been made. It must not be in Asignats. Certainly not. But in gold. It has been so promised. And he must be guillotined. That shall be done. By whom? By you. By me. Yes. You will be delegated by the Committee of Public Safety with ample powers. I accept, said Simordan. Robespierre was rapid in his decisions, a statesmanlike quality. He took from the portfolio that lay before him a sheet of white paper, at the head of which the following words were printed. French Republic, one and indivisible, Committee of Public Safety. I accept, continued Simordan. Let the terrible encounter the terrible. Lantanac is ferocious. I will be equally so. It shall be war unto death with that man. I shall rid the Republic of him if it be God's will. He stopped, then continued. I am a priest. I believe in God. God has grown antiquated, said Danton. I believe in God, repeated Simordan, unmoved. Robespierre gloomily nodded his approval, and Simordan continued. To whom shall I be delegated? Robespierre replied. To the commandant of the exploring division sent against Lautenach, but I give you warning that he is a nobleman. That is another thing that excites my contempt, cried Danton. A nobleman? Well, what of that? It is all the same whether a man be a priest or a nobleman. If he is a good man, he is excellent. Nobility is a prejudice, but we ought to deal impartially with it, granting both its merits and its demerits. Is not Saint-Just a nobleman, Robespierre? Florel de Saint-Just, parbleu! Anacarsis Clutes is a baron. Our friend Charles Hesse, who never misses a single session of the Cordeliers, is a prince, brother to the reigning landgrave of Hesse Rosenberg. Montot, Marat's intimate friend, is Marquis de Montot. In the Revolutionary Tribunal there is one juror, Villat, who is a priest, and another, Leroy, Marquis de Montflabert. Both are trustworthy men. And you forget, added Robespierre, the foreman of the Revolutionary Jury. Antonel. Marquis Antonel, corrected Robespierre. And that Dompierre, who was lately killed before Condé by the Republic, rejoined Danton, was a nobleman, and Beaurepaire, too, who blew his brains out rather than open the gates of Verdun to the Prussians. And in spite of all that, grumbled Marat, on the day when Condorcet exclaimed the Kraki were nobles, Danton cried out, All nobles are traitors, beginning with Mirabeau and ending with thee. Here the serious voice of Simordan rose above the others. Citizen Danton, citizen Robespierre, you may perhaps be justified in your confidence, but the nation distrusts and it has reason to do so. When a priest is charged with the surveillance of a nobleman, the responsibility is a double one, and it is the duty of the priest to be inflexible. That is true, said Robespierre. And inexorable, added Simordan. Well said, citizen Simordan, rejoined Robespierre. It is a young man with whom you will have to deal, and you will have the advantage over him from the fact that you are twice his age. He must be guided, but with the utmost discretion that he may not suspect it. It seems that he has military ability. All reports are unanimous on that point. He forms part of a corps which has been detached from the army of the Rhine and sent into the Vendée. He has lately returned from the frontier, where he distinguished himself by his bravery and intelligence, and is now in command of the exploring division, which he handles like an expert. For fifteen days he has held the old Marquis de Lantanac in check. He restrains him, and at the same time compels him to give way. He will end by forcing him to the sea and pitching him into it. Lantanac has the cunning of an old general, while his opponent possesses the boldness of a young captain. This young man has already won for himself enemies, and detractors who are envious of him. Adjutant General Lachelle is jealous of him. This Lachelle wants to be commander-in-chief, interrupted Danton. He has only a pun in his favor. It leads a ladder to mount into a cart. Meanwhile, Charette defeats him. And he is not willing that anyone else should defeat Lantanac, added Robespierre. The misfortune of the Vendée and war is the existence of these rivalries. 
Our soldiers are heroes led by inferior commanders. Chevron, a mere captain of hussars, enters Samor with trumpets playing sa ira. He takes Samor. He might go on and take Cholet, but having received no orders, he pauses. Every position of command in the Vendée ought to be reconstructed. The garrisons are scattered, the forces dispersed. An army that is scattered is paralyzed. It is like a rock crumbling into dust. Nothing but tents are left at Comte de Parame. Between Treguier and Dinan there are a hundred useless little encampments out of which a division could be formed to cover the entire coast. L'Echelle, supported by Perrin, robs the northern coast under the pretext of protecting the southern and thus exposes France to the English. Half a million of peasants in revolt and a descent of England upon France, such as Lantenac's plan. The young commander of the exploring column presses his resistless sword against Lantenac's loins until he forces him to yield, and this without asking leave of L'Echelle. Now L'Echelle is his chief, therefore he denounces him. Opinions are divided regarding this young man. L'Echelle would like to have him shot, and Pierre de Lamar wishes to make him adjutant general. He seems to me to possess great qualities, observed Simordan. But he has one defect. This interruption came from Marat. And what is that? asked Simordan. Clemency, replied Marat, and he went on. He is firm in the assault, but after the victory he shows his weakness. He grants indulgences. He is too merciful and forgiving. He protects religieuses and nuns. He saves the wives and daughters of the aristocrats. He releases prisoners and lets the priests go free. A grave fault, murmured Simurdan. A crime you would do better to call it, said Marat. Oh, sometimes, said Danton. Often, said Robespierre. Almost always, insisted Marat. Yes, when one has to deal with the enemies of one's country, it may always be called a crime, said Simordan. Marat turned towards the latter. And what, then, would you do with a Republican chief who would set a royalist leader at liberty? He inquired. I should agree with Lichelle. I would have him shot. Or guillotined, said Marat. He might take his choice, said Seymour Dan. Danton began to laugh. The <laughs> one seems to me as good as the other. You are quite sure to have one or the other muttered Marat, and averting his eyes from Danton, he fixed them again on Simordan. So, citizen Simordan, if you caught a Republican chief stumbling, you would have him beheaded? Within twenty-four hours. Well, resumed Marat, I agree with Robespierre. Citizen Simordan must be sent as a delegate from the Committee of Public Safety, to the commander of the exploring division of the coast army. What is this commander's name, by the way? Robespierre, beginning to turn over his papers, replied, He is a seat of a nobleman. It is an excellent plan to set a priest to guard a nobleman, said Danton. Either one of them, singly and alone, I am inclined to distrust, but when taken together I have no fear of them. They keep a mutual watch over each other and go on very well. The expression of indignation peculiar to Seymour Dan's face grew more pronounced, but doubtless aware that the observation was based upon truth, he did not turn towards Danton as he lifted his severe voice. If the Republican commander entrusted to my care makes a false step, he will suffer the penalty of death. Robespierre, with his eyes still resting on his portfolio, said, Here is the name. The commander in charge of whom you will be placed to conduct yourself in his regard at your own discretion is a former Viscount called Govan. Simordan turned pale. Govan, he exclaimed. Marat observed Simordan's pallor. The Viscount Govan, repeated Simordan. Yes, said Robespierre. Well, exclaimed Marat, gazing steadfastly at Simordan. There was a brief silence, broken by Marat. Citizen Simordan, do you accept the appointment of commissioner-delegate to the commander, Govan, with the condition which you yourself have laid down? Is it agreed? It is, replied Simordan, with increasing pallor. 
Robespierre took the pen that lay beside him, and in his slow and regular handwriting traced four lines on the sheet of paper headed, Committee of Public Safety. After signing it, he passed the pen and paper to Danton, who signed, and the signature of Marat, who had not once removed his eyes from the pale face of Seymour Dan, was added to the others. Robespierre, taking back the sheet, dated it and gave it to Seymour Dan, who read on it the following. Year two of the Republic. Full powers are granted to citizen Seymour Dan, commissioner delegated from the Committee of Public Safety, to a citizen Govan, in command of the exploring division of the Army of the Coast. Robespierre, Danton, Marat. And below the signatures, June 29th, 1793. The revolutionary calendar, called the civil calendar, had no legal existence at that time, and was only adopted by the convention on the 5th of October, 1793 in response to the proposition of Rome. While Seymour Dan was reading, Marat continued to watch him. Then, in a tone half inaudible, as though speaking to himself, he said, All this must be confirmed by a decree from the convention, or by a special resolution of the Committee of Public Safety. Something still remains to be done. Citizen Seymour Dan, where do you live? asked Robespierre. Cour de commerce. Indeed, then you are a neighbor of mine, I live there also, said Danton. Robespierre continued, There is not a moment to lose. Tomorrow you will receive your formal commission signed by all the members of the Committee of Public Safety. This is a confirmation of the commission accrediting you specially to the act of Representatives Philippeau, Pierre de Lamon, Le Quant, Alquier, and others. We know you. Your powers are unlimited. It rests with you to make Gauvin a general or send him to the scaffold. You will receive your commission tomorrow at three o'clock. When will you start? At four o'clock, said Seymour Dan, and they separated. On returning home, Marat informed Simone Evrard that he should go to the convention tomorrow. End of section 26section 27 of 93 by Victor Hugo, translated by Aline Delano. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part 2. Book 3. The Convention. Chapter 1. The Convention. 1. We are approaching the summit. The Convention is before our eyes, and in the presence of this lofty eminence the gaze grows steady. Nothing more towering ever rose above the human horizon. There is but one Himalaya, but one Convention. The convention may perhaps be called the culminating point in history. During its lifetime, an assembly actually lives, one did not realize what it was. Its supreme grandeur was not appreciated by its contemporaries, who were too much terrified to be dazzled. Mediocrities and moderate hills levy no severe tax on one's admiration, but the majestic inspires a holy horror, whether it be the majesty of genius or of a mountain, an assembly or a masterpiece. Too close proximity excites alarm. Every peak seems exaggerated, the ascent is fatiguing, and one loses breath in climbing its sharp acclivities, misses his footing on the slopes, and is wounded by the cragged surfaces, which in themselves are beauties. The foaming torrent indicates the presence of the chasm, the summit is veiled in clouds. Whether ascending or descending, it is equally frightful, hence one feels the influence of terror rather than of admiration a kind of aversion to grandeur, which is a strange enough sensation. While gazing on the abyss, one cannot always appreciate its sublimity. The monster is more evident than the miracle. It was thus that men first judged the convention. The purblind undertook to fathom an abyss whose depths could only be sounded by the eagle. Today we behold it in the perspective outlining the granite profile of the French Revolution against the calm and tragic background of the faraway heavens. 2. The 14th of July set the nation free. The 10th of August hurled its thunderbolts. The 21st of September founded a new era. For the 21st of September was the equinox, the equilibrium, Libra, the balance scales of justice. According to the remark of Rome, the Republic was proclaimed beneath this sign of equality and justice, heralded, so to speak, by a constellation. The convention is the first avatar of the people. It was the convention that turned the new and glorious page, introducing the future of today. 
Every idea requires a visible embodiment. Every principle needs a habitation. A church means the four walls within which the Almighty has his dwelling place. Every dogma must have its temple. When the convention became a fact, the first problem was to locate it. At first it was established in the Manege, but afterwards at the Tuileries. Here they raised a platform and arranged scenery, painted in grey, by David. Also rows of benches and a square tribune. There were parallel pilasters with massive plinths, and long rectangular stems, and square enclosures, into which the multitude crowded, and which were called public tribunes. A Roman velarium and Grecian draperies. And amid these right angles and straight lines the convention was installed, a tempest confined within geometrical limits. On the tribune the red cap was painted in grey. At first the royalists ridiculed this grey bonnet rouge, this artificial hall, this pasteboard monument, this sanctuary of papier-mâché, this pantheon of mud and spittle. How quickly it was destined to vanish! The pillars were made of barrel staves, the arches of thin deal boards, the bas-reliefs were mastic, the entablature was of pine, the statues were of plaster, the marble was painted, the walls were of canvas. And in this provisional shelter France has recorded deeds that can never be forgotten. During the early sessions of the convention, the walls of the Hall of the Manège were covered with the advertisements with which Paris swarmed at the time of the return from Varennes. On one might be read, The king returns. Whoever applauds him will be chastised. Whoever insults him will be hung. On another, Peace, keep your hats on your heads. He is about to pass before his judges. On another, the king took aim at the nation, but his weapon hung fire. Now the nation has its turn. On another, the law! The law! It was within these walls that the convention sat in judgment on Louis XVI. At the Tuileries, now called the Palais National, where the convention had held its sessions from the 10th of May, 1793, the assembly hall occupied the space between the Pavilion de l'Horloge, called Pavilion Unité, and the Pavilion Marsan, called Pavilion Liberté. The Pavilion de Flore was now called Pavilion Égalité. The assembly hall was accessible by the grand staircase of Jean Boulant. The entire ground floor of the palace below the first story, occupied by the assembly, was a kind of long guard room, littered with the luggage and camp beds of the various troops mounting guard over the convention. The assembly had a special guard of honor called the Grenadiers of the convention. A tricolored ribbon divided the palace occupied by the assembly from the garden where the people passed in and out. 3. Let us finish our description of the assembly hall. Everything concerning this terrible place is of interest. The first object to attract one's attention on entering was a tall statue of liberty, placed between two large windows. This hall, which was formerly the king's theater, had now become the stage of revolution. It was forty-two meters long, ten meters in width, and eleven in height. This elegant and superb hall, built by Vigorani for the use of the courtiers, was hidden beneath the rude timber work which served to support the weight of the people in ninety-three. The only point of support upon which this timber work of the public tribunes rested was a single post, which well deserves honorable mention. This post consisted of one solid piece, ten meters in circumference, and few Caryatids have done an equal amount of work. For years it bore the severe pressure of revolution. It has supported applause, enthusiasm, insult, clamors, and tumults, the tremendous chaos of wrath, the fury of insurrection, and never given way beneath its burden. After the convention it witnessed the Council of the Ancients. On the 18th Brumaire it was relieved. At that time Percier replaced this wooden pillar by columns of marble that did not last so long. An architect's ideal is sometimes peculiar. That of the architect of the Rue de Rivoli was the curved path of a cannonball in its flight. The architect of Karlsruhe conceived the ideal of a fan, and the conception of the architect who built the hall where the convention established itself on the 10th of May, 1793, was apparently a huge bureau drawer, for it was long as well as high and flat. A great semicircle had been added to one of the long sides of the parallelogram. This was the amphitheater with seats for the representatives, but neither tables nor desks. Garan Coulon, who wrote a great deal, used to write resting his paper on his knee. Facing the benches was the tribune, before it the bust of Le Pelletier saint Fargeau, and behind it the president's armchair. The head of the bust projected slightly above the edge of the tribune, 
which afterwards was the cause of its removal. The amphitheatre consisted of nineteen semicircular benches, rising one above the other, some of which had been lengthened in order to fit into the corners, by means of other benches cut off for the purpose. In the semicircle beneath, at the foot of the tribunal, were the places of the ushers, and on the other side of the tribune hung a placard nine feet high, set in a black wooden frame, and bearing on its two pages, separated by a kind of scepter, the Declaration of the Rights of Man. On the other side was an empty space which was afterwards occupied by a similar frame, containing this constitution of the year two, with the two pages separated by a sword. Above the tribune, over the head of the orator, from a deep loge divided into two compartments and filled with people, floated three immense tricolored banners, arranged in a horizontal position, resting on an altar upon which could be read the following words, THE LAW. Behind this altar rose, like the sentinel of freedom of speech, an enormous Roman fasces as tall as a column. Two colossal statues, placed erect against the wall, faced the representatives, Lycurgus on the president's right hand, Solon on his left, with Plato towering above the mountain. The statues stood on simple wooden blocks, resting on a long projecting cornice that encircled the hall, separating the people from the assembly. The spectators leaned their elbows on this cornice. The black wooden frame enclosing the proclamation of the rights of man reached to the cornice, interfering with the symmetry of the entablature, an infraction of the straight line that made Chabot growl. It is ugly, he said to Vadier. The heads of the statues were decorated with wreaths of oak and laurel. Green curtains, on which similar wreaths were painted in a deeper shade of the same color, fell in heavy folds from the surrounding cornice, draping the entire lower floor of the hall occupied by the assembly. Above this drapery the wall was white and bare. In this wall, as if carved by a chisel, without molding or ornament, were two stories of public tribunes, the square ones below, the round ones above. According to the rule, for the influence of Vitruvius was still acknowledged, the archivolts were superimposed upon the architraves. There were ten tribunes on each of the long sides of the hall, and two huge boxes at both ends, twenty-four in all. There sat the assembled crowd. The spectators in the lower tribunes overflowed their bounds, grouping themselves on every projection along the cornice. A long iron bar, firmly fastened at the point of support, served as a rail to the upper tribunes, and protected the spectators from the pressure of the crowds that ascended the stairs. Once, however, a man who was pitched suddenly into the assembly below escaped death by falling partly upon Monsieur, Bishop of Beauvais, whereupon he exclaimed, Really, a bishop has his use, then, after all. The hall of the convention was large enough to contain two thousand persons, and on the days of insurrections even three thousand. The convention held two sessions, one during the day and one in the evening. The back of the president's chair was round, studded with gilt nails. His table was supported by four winged monsters with a single foot, who might have been supposed to have come forth from the apocalypse to witness the revolution. They seemed to have been unharnessed from Ezekiel's chariot to drag the tumbril of Samson. On the president's table stood a huge bell, almost as large as a church bell, a big copper inkstand, and a parchment portfolio, which contained the record of proceedings. The blood from many a severed head, borne aloft on the end of a pike, has dripped upon this table. Nine steps led to the tribune. These steps were high, steep, and difficult of ascent. Jean Sonnet once tripped in the act of mounting them. It is like the staircase of a scaffold, he said. It is well to serve your apprenticeship, cried Carrier. In the corners of the hall, where the walls seemed rather bare, the architect had placed Roman fasces as ornaments, with the axe bound on the outside. On the right and left of the tribune pedestals supported two candelabra twelve feet high, each bearing four pairs of argand lamps. For each public box there was a similar candelabra, and on the pedestals of these candelabra circles were carved, which the people called guillotine collars. The seats of the assembly, rising almost to the cornice of the tribunes, gave the representatives and the people an opportunity to chat with one another. The exits of the tribunes opened into a labyrinth of corridors, often echoing with wild and tumultuous sounds. The convention, outgrowing the limits of the palace, overflowed into the neighboring hotels of Longueville and Coigny. If we may credit Lord Bradford's letter, it was to the Hotel Coigny that the royal furniture was removed after the 10th of August. It took two entire months to empty the Tuileries. The committees were lodged in the vicinity of the hall. 
those of legislation, agriculture, and commerce at the Pavilion Egalité, those of the navy, the colonies, finance, assignats, and public safety at the Pavilion Liberté. The Committee of War was at the Pavilion Unité. The lodgings of the Committee of General Safety were accessible to those of the public safety through a dark corridor, lighted night and day by a lantern, a passageway for the spies of all parties who came and went, talking in whispers. The bar of the convention had been changed several times. Usually it was at the right hand of the president. At both ends of the hall the two vertical partitions that shut off the concentric semicircles of the amphitheater on the right hand and on the left allowed space enough between partition and wall for two long and narrow passages closed at either end by square doors, which afforded entrance and exit. A door opening upon the terrasse des Fouillantes and leading directly into the hall served for the admittance of the representatives. This hall, ineffectually lighted during the day by windows, whose insufficient glimmer was replaced by livid torches when twilight fell, seemed ever shrouded in a night. The lamplight sessions were lugubrious, the artificial light seeming really to increase rather than diminish the darkness. No man could see his neighbor. From all parts of the hall indistinct groups of faces seemed to be mocking each other. People passed one another without recognition, one day Lanyolo, hastening to the tribune, jostled someone in the descending passage. "'I beg pardon, Robespierre,' he said. "'For whom do you take me?' replied a hoarse voice. "'Excuse me, Marat,' said Lanyolo. Below, one tribune on either side of the president was reserved, for, strange to say, privileged spectators were admitted to the convention. The draperies of these tribunes, the only ones thus adorned, were caught back to the middle of the architrave by golden cords and tassels. The tribunes of the people were bare. The general effect was stern, unconventional, and yet correct. The union of propriety and fierceness is the essence of a revolutionary life. The hall of the convention presented a perfect example of what artists have since called the Mesidor architecture. It was at once massive and frail. The builders of that period mistook symmetry for beauty. The Renaissance had said its last word under Louis XV, and a reaction had set in. The standards of nobility and purity had been so exaggerated that that which was really noble had degenerated into insipidity, and purity itself had become inexpressibly wearisome. Prudery may exist in architecture. After the dazzling orgies of form and color of the 18th century, art had begun a system of diet and allowed itself only a straight line. This style of improvement resulted in ugliness, and art was thereby reduced to a skeleton, a phenomenal condition which is the drawback to this kind of wisdom and abstinence. The style is so strict that it becomes meager. Apart from all political emotion, the mere sight of this architecture made one shiver. Dimly recalling the old theatre, with its garlanded boxes, its ceiling of azure and crimson, its chandelier and girandoles with their prismatic reflections glittering like diamonds, its dove-colored upholstery, the profusion of cupids and nymphs on its curtain and draperies, all that royal and amorous idol, painted, sculptured, and gilded, which once irradiated this gloomy place with its smile, and then casting one's eyes upon these severe rectangular lines, cold and sharp as steel, made one think of Boucher guillotined by David. 4. He who looked upon the assembly utterly forgot the hall. He who witnessed the drama was oblivious to the theatre, Nothing more misshapen, and at the same time sublime. A crowd of heroes, a herd of cowards, wild beasts on the mountain, reptiles in the swamp. There all those combatants, the ghosts of today, swarmed, elbowed each other, quarreling, threatening, fighting, and living out their lives. A convocation of titans. On the right the Gironde, a legion of thinkers. On the left the mountain, a group of athletes. Here might be seen Brousseau, to whom the keys of the Bastille had been delivered, Barbaroux, who ruled the Marseillaise, Kerveligan, who had entire control of the battalion of Brest, quartered in the Faubourg Saint-Marceau, Jean Sonnet, who had established the supremacy of representatives over generals, Godet, that man of ill omen, to whom the queen one evening at the Tuileries had shown the sleeping dauphin. Godet kissed the child on the forehead and beheaded the father. The chimerical Salle, who denounced the intrigues of the mountain with Austria, Sillery, the cripple of the right, and Couthon, the paralytic of the left, Laus de Dupere, who, upon being called a villain by a certain journalist, invited him to dinner, saying, Oh, villain simply means a man whose opinions differ from our own. 
Rabot Saint Etienne, who began his almanac in 1790 with these words, The revolution is over. Quinet, one of those who hastened the downfall of Louis XVI. The Jansenist Camus, who compiled the civil constitution of the clergy, believed in the miracles of the deacon of Paris, and prostrated himself every night before an image of Christ seven feet high, nailed to his chamber wall. The priest Fauché, who, together with Camille de Moulon, was instrumental in bringing about the 14th of July. Isnard, guilty of saying, Paris will be destroyed, at the very moment when Brunswick was saying, Paris will be burned. Jacob Dupont, who was the first man to proclaim himself an atheist, and to whom Robespierre replied, Atheism is aristocratic. Langevinet, a stern, sagacious, and valiant Breton. Ducot, the Orealis of Boyer Fonfred. Ribéqui, the Pylades of Barbarou, who tended his resignation because Robespierre had not as yet been guillotined. Richaud, who was opposed to the permanency of sections. La Source, who uttered the murderous apothem, Woe be unto grateful nations, and who at the foot of the scaffold was to contradict himself by those haughty words flung to the members of the mountain, We are dying because the nation slumbers. When it awakes, your turn will come. Diroteau, who in abolishing the inviolability of the crown unconsciously forged his own axe and reared his own scaffold. Charles Villat, who shielded his conscience behind this protest, I will not vote beneath the axe. Louvet, the author of Faublas, who was to end as a librarian at the Palais Royal, with Lodoisca at the desk. Mercier, the author of the Tableau de Paris, who exclaimed, Every king felt of his neck on the 21st of January. Marek, who had the care of the faction of ancient limits. The journalist Kara, who at the foot of the scaffold said to the executioner, It is provoking to die. I should like to have seen the result. Viget, who called himself a grenadier of the 2nd Battalion of mayenne et loire and who, when threatened by the public tribunes, cried, I move that at the first murmur of the tribunes we all withdraw and, sabre in hand, march upon Versailles. Bouzeau, who was doomed to die of hunger, and Valaze to fall by his own dagger. Condorcet, who was to die at bourg la reine or bourg Egalité, as it was called at that time, betrayed by a volume of Horace that he carried in his pocket. Pétion, whose fate it was to be adored by the populace in 1792, and devoured by the wolves in 1794, and twenty more besides, Ponticulant, Marbose, Lidon, Saint-Martin, Dussault, the translator of Juvenal, who had made the Hanover campaign, Boileau, Bertrand, Lesterp Beauvais, Lesage, Gomère, Gardienne, Manvielle, Duplantier, Lacaze, Antiboule, and, foremost among them all, Barnave, whom men called Verniaud. On the other side, Antoine Louis Leon Florel de Saint Just, a youth of twenty three, whose pallid face, low forehead, regular profile, and deep, mysterious eyes conveyed an impression of profound melancholy. Merlin de Thionville, whom the Germans called Feuerteufel, the fire devil, Merlin de Douai, the guilty author of the law of the suspects, Subrani, whom the Parisians, in the riot of the first prairial, demanded for their general, the former curé, Le Bon, who now held a sabre in the hand that had once sprinkled holy water, Bilot de Varenne, who foresaw the magistracy of the future when arbitrators would take the place of judges, Fabre de Glantin, who chanced upon the happy invention of the Republican calendar, and Rouget de Lille, the composer of the Marseillaise. No second inspiration ever visited either of these two men. Manuel, the attorney of the commune, who had said, A dead king is no less a man. Goujon, who marched into Tripstadt, Neustadt, and Spire, and who witnessed the flight of the Prussian army. Lacroix, a lawyer transformed into a general and made knight of Saint-Louis six days before August 10th. Fréron Thersite, son of Fréron Zoile. Ruth, the inexorable searcher of the iron cupboard, predestined to a great Republican suicide, who was to kill himself on the day of the death of the Republic. Fouché, with the soul of a demon and the face of a corpse. Cambula, the friend of Père Duchesne, who used to say to Guillotin, You belong to the club of the Foyants, but your daughter belongs to the club of the Jacobins. Jagot, who replied to those who pitied the nakedness of the prisoners in those savage words, A prison is a dress of stone. Javogue, the frightful desecrator of the tombs of Saint-Denis. Ocelon, himself a proscriber, who sheltered one of the proscribed, Madame Chari, in his own house. Pontabol, who, while presiding over the assembly, gave the tribunes the signal for applause or disapproval. The journalist Robert, Mademoiselle Caraglio's husband, who wrote, 
Neither Robespierre nor Marat comes to my house. Robespierre is welcome to come whenever he chooses. Marat never. Garon Coulon, who, when Spain interceded on the occasion of the trial of Louis XVI, had haughtily requested that the assembly should not condescend to read the letter of one king pleading for another. The bishop Grégoire, who in the earlier part of his career was worthy to have belonged to the primitive church, but who afterwards, during the period of the empire, renounced his republican principles. Amar, who said, The whole earth condemns Louis XVI. To whom then shall we appeal for judgment? To the planets. Rouillère, who on the 21st of January opposed the firing of the cannon of the Pont Neuf, saying, A king's head ought to make no more noise in falling than the head of any other man. Chenier, brother of the poet André. Vadier, one of those who placed a pistol on the tribune. Tanis, who used to say to Momoro, I want Marat and Robespierre to embrace at my table. Where do you live? At Charenton. It would have surprised me had you said elsewhere, was Momoro's reply. Legendre, who was the butcher of the French Revolution, as pride had been of the English Revolution. Come and be slaughtered, he cried to Langevinet, to which the latter replied, First pass a degree that I am an ox, if you please. Collot de Bois, that gloomy comedian, wearing, as it were, the antique mask with the double mouth, one of which said yes, while the other said no, approving on the one hand and blaming on the other, defaming Carrier and Nantes, and deifying Chaldier and Lyon, sending Robespierre to the scaffold and Marat to the Pantheon. Genicieux, who asked that the penalty of death should be imposed on whosoever should be found wearing a medal that bore the inscription, Louis XVI, martyred. Leonard Bourdon, the schoolmaster, who had offered his house to the old man of Mount Jura, Topsent, the sailor, Goupilot, the lawyer, Lorient Le Quantre, merchant, Duhem, the doctor, Sejant, the sculptor, David, the artist, and Joseph Egalité, the prince, and others besides. Le Quantre Puyravaux, who called for a formal decree pronouncing Marat insane. Robert Lindet, the troublesome author of that devilfish whose head was the Committee of Public Safety, and whose twenty-one thousand arms embraced France in the shape of revolutionary committees. Le Boeuf, on whom Giré du Pré, in his Noël des Faux Patriotes, wrote this line. Le Boeuf vit le gendre et bugla. Thomas Paine, the benevolent American. Anacarsis Klutz, the millionaire, a German baron, who, although an atheist, was still a man of sincere purpose and a follower of Hébert the upright Lebas, a friend of the Duplais, Rovere, one of those men whom one occasionally meets who indulge in wickedness for its own sake, a variety of amateur more common than we might imagine, Charlier, who wished to address aristocrats with the familiar vous, the elegiac and cruel Talien, who was to bring about the ninth Thermidor out of pure love of it, Cambacés, a lawyer who finally became a prince, Carrier, another lawyer who turned into a tiger, La Planche, who once exclaimed, I demand priority for the alarm gun. Thuriot, who wished the jurors of the Revolutionary Tribunal to vote aloud. Bourdon de Loise, who provoked Chambon to challenge him, denounced Payne, and in his turn was denounced by Hébert. Fayot, who proposed to despatch an incendiary army into the Vendée. Tavot, who on the 13th of April acted as a sort of mediator between the Gironde and the Mountain. Bernier, who suggested that the leaders of the Gironde and the Mountain should be sent to serve as common soldiers. Rubel, who shut himself up in Mayence. Bourbot, whose horse was killed under him at Saumur. Guimberto and Jard de Panvilliers, the commanders of the army of the Cherbourg coast and that of La Rochelle. Le Carpentier, who was in charge of the squadron of Cancal. Robergeau, for whom the ambush of Rastat was lying in wait. Pierre de la Marne, who wore in camp his former major's epaulettes. La Vassour de la Sarthe, who by a single word induced Serent, commander of the battalion of Saint Armand, to kill himself, Rivechon, Moret, Bernard de Sainte, Charles Richard, de Quignot, and towering above them all a Mirabeau whom men called Danton. Belonging to neither of these parties, and yet holding both in awe, rose the man Robespierre. 5. Below crouched dismay, which may be noble, and fear, which cannot fail to be contemptible. Beneath all these passions, this heroism and devotion, this rage, might be seen the gloomy multitude of the anonymous. The shoals of the assembly were called the plain, comprising the entire floating element. Men who are in doubt, who hesitate, retreat, temporize, mistrustfully watching one another. The mountain and the Gironde were the chosen few, the plain was the crowd. The plain was summed up and expressed in Sieyes. 
Caius was a man of a naturally profound mind, full of chimerical projects. He had paused at the third estate, and had never been able to rise as high as the people. Certain minds are constituted to rest midway. Caius called Robespierre a tiger, who returned the compliment by calling him a mole. He was a philosopher who had attained prudence, if not wisdom. He was a courtier, rather than the servant, of the revolution. He took a spade and went to work with the people in the Champ de Mars, hauling the same cart with Alexandre de Beauharnais. He urged others to energetic labors which he never performed himself. He said to the Girondists, Put the cannon on your own side. There are philosophers who are natural wrestlers, and they, like Condorcet, joined the party of Verniaud, or like Camille de Moulin, that of Danton. There are philosophers who value their lives, and those who belonged to this class followed Sieus. The best vats have their dregs. Still lower even than the plain was the marsh, whose stagnation was hideous to look upon, revealing as it did transparent egotism. There shivered the timid and silent expectation. Nothing could be more wretched, ignominious to the last degree, and yet feeling no shame, hiding their indignation, living in servitude, cherishing covert rebellion, possessed by a certain cynical terror, they had all the desperation peculiar to cowardice. They really preferred the Gironde, and yet they chose the mountain. When the final result depended on them, they went over to the successful side. They surrendered Louis XVI to Verniaud, Danton to Robespierre, and Robespierre to Tallien. They put Marat in the pillory during his lifetime, and deified him after his death. They showed themselves the partisans of the very cause which they suddenly turned against. They seemed to possess an instinct for jostling the infirm. Since they had joined the cause with the understanding that it was a strong one, any sign of wavering seemed to them equivalent to treason. They were the majority, the power, and the fear. Hence springs the audacity of the base. Hence the 31st of May, the 11th Germinal, the 9th Thermidor. Tragedies where dwarfs untied the knots of giants. 6. And among these passionate men were to be found others, fanciful dreamers. Utopia was there in all its varied forms, from the warlike, which admitted the scaffold, to the mild, which would fain abolish the penalty of death. A spectre or an angel, according as one viewed it from the throne or from the side of the common people. Men eager for the fray stood face to face with others who were contented to brood over their dreams of peace. The brain of Carnot created fourteen armies while Jean de Brie was revolving in his head a scheme of universal democratic federation. Amid this furious eloquence, amid these howling and thundering voices, some men there were who preserved a fruitful silence. Lacanal was silent, preoccupied with his system for national public education. Lanthenas held his peace, absorbed in his plans for primary schools. Revelier Le Pau was silent, dreaming of philosophy when it should attain the dignity of religion. Others busied themselves with matters of minor importance and the details of everyday life. Guiton Morveau was interested in the improvement of the sanitary condition of hospitals, Mayer in the abolishment of existing servitudes, Jean Bonsant André in the suppression of arrest and imprisonment for debt, Rom in Schaap's proposition, Dubois in the filing of the archives, Corin Fustier in the foundation of the Cabinet of Anatomy and the Museum of Natural History, Guillaumard in the navigation of rivers and the damming of the Scheldt. Men were fanatical about art, even monomaniacs on the subject. On the 21st of January, at the very time when the head of monarchy was falling on the Place de la Révolution, Bézard, the representative of the Oise, went to see a picture of Rubens which had been found in a garret in the Rue Saint-Lazare. Artists, orators and prophets, giants like Danton, and men as childlike as Clutes, gladiators and philosophers, were all straining for the same goal, progress. Nothing disconcerted them. The greatness of the convention consisted in its efforts to discover what degree of reality there might be in that which men call the impossible. At one end stood Robespierre with his eyes fixed upon the law, and at the other Condorcet gazing with equal steadiness on duty. Condorcet was a man enlightened, but given to dreaming. Robespierre possessed executive ability, and sometimes, in the final crises of worn-out conditions, execution signifies extermination. Revolutions have two slopes— the one ascending, the other descending, whereon we meet at different stages each season in its turn, from the freezing to the flowery, and each zone produces men suited to the climate, from those who live under the hot rays of the sun to those who dwell with the thunderbolt. 7. 
People pointed out to each other the bend in the left-hand passage, where Robespierre whispered to Clavier's friend Garat that terrible epigram, Clavier a conspiré partout où il a respiré. In this same bend, well adapted for privacy and suppressed indignation, Fabreg d'Eglantine quarrelled with Rome, reproaching him for having disfigured his calendar by changing Fervidor into Thermidor. People pointed out the corner where, elbow to elbow, sat the seven representatives of haute Garonne, who being the first called upon to pronounce their verdict upon Louis XVI, had thus answered one after the other, Marais, death, Delma, death, Perjean, death, Calais, death, Iral, death, Julien, death, Desabi, death, eternal reverberation that fills all history, and since the birth of human justice has continued to send forth a funereal echo from the walls of the tribunal. Amid this stormy sea of faces, one man would point out to another the individuals whose tragic votes had caused that fearful din. Paganel, who cried, Death! A king serves no purpose save by his death. Milode, who said, If death had never been known, we must today have invented it. Old Raffron de Trouillet, who exclaimed, A speedy death! Goupilot, who cried, The scaffold at once! Delay but aggravates the pain of death! Sieus, who with solemn brevity uttered the single word, Death. Thurio, who, rejecting the appeal to the people proposed by Buzot, said, What? The primary assemblies? Forty-four thousand tribunals? An endless trial. The head of Louis Sixteenth would have time to grow grey before it fell. Augustin von Robespierre, who exclaimed after his brother, I ignore that humanity which massacres the people and pardons despots. Death! The demand for a reprieval means a substitution of the appeal to tyrants for the appeal to the people. Fusidoir, who took the place of Bernardin de Saint-Pierre, saying, The shedding of human blood is abhorrent to me, but the blood of a king is not human blood. Death. Jean Bon Saint-André, who said, No nation can be free until the tyrant dies. La Vicomterie, who expressed himself in this formula, So long as the tyrant breathes, liberty is strangled. Death. Chateauneuf Rondon, who cried, The death of Louis the Last! Guillardon, who suggested, let him be executed at the Barrière en Versailles. The Barrière en Versailles was the Barrière du Trône. Tellier, who said, let us forge a cannon of the caliber of Louis XVI's head to fire upon the enemy. And among those inclined to mercy, Gentil was one who said, I vote for imprisonment. He who makes a Charles I makes a Cromwell likewise. Bancal, who said, exile. I should like to see the first king of the earth sentenced to earn his living at a trade. Albuis, who said, Exile, let this living spectre wander around among the thrones. Zandiacome, who said, I vote for imprisonment. Let us keep Capet alive for a scarecrow. Chayon, who said, Let him live. I do not approve of killing a man for Rome to canonize. While sentences like these fell one after the other from these severe lips, making their way into history, bedizened women in low-necked dresses sat in the boxes, and with list in hand counted the votes as they were given, pricking each name with a pin. Where tragedy has entered in, horror and pity remain. To see the convention, at whatsoever epoch of its reign, was to witness anew the judgment of the last of the Capes. The legend of the 21st of January seemed to be interwoven with all its acts. The formidable assembly was composed of those men whose fatal breath put out the ancient torch of monarchy, which had burned for eighteen centuries. The decisive trial of all kings in the person of one seemed to be the starting point of the great war which it waged against the past. At whatsoever session of the convention one might be present, the shadow cast by the scaffold of Louis XVI never failed to make itself evident. The spectators told each other about the resignations of Cassant and Roland, and also about Duchatel, the deputy of the Deux Sèvres, who, being ill, caused himself to be carried to the assembly, and on his deathbed voted against the execution of the king, an act which excited Marat to laughter. People looked for the representative forgotten today who, after a session that had lasted thirty-seven hours, overcome by fatigue, fell asleep on his bench, and being roused by the usher when his turn came to vote, half opened his eyes, murmured, death, and fell asleep again. At the time when the death sentence of Louis XVI was passed, Robespierre had eighteen months to live, Danton fifteen, Vergniaud nine, Marat five months and three weeks, and Le Pelletier saint Fargeau one day. Brief and terrible was the breath of life in those days. 8. The people had a window opening on the convention in the shape of the public tribunes, and when this window proved inadequate, they opened the door, 
and the street population poured in upon the assembly. The invasions of the crowd into this senate presented one of the most striking spectacles known to history. Generally, these eruptions were amicable. The street fraternized with the curule chair. But friendship with a people who had once, in the course of three hours, taken the cannon of the Envalides and forty thousand muskets besides, was a somewhat formidable relationship. At every moment a procession interrupted the session. There were deputations admitted to the bar, petitions, expressions of respect, offerings. The pike of honor of the Faubourg Saint-Antoine was brought in, borne by women. The English offered twenty thousand pairs of shoes for our barefooted soldiers. Citizen Arnoux, said the moniteur, the curé of Aubignan, in command of the battalion of the Drome, requests permission to march to the frontier, and begs that his parish may be kept for him. The delegates from the sections came, bringing in wheelbarrows, dishes, patens, chalices, monstrances, heaps of gold, silver, and gilt, offerings to the country from this ragged crowd, who asked, as a reward, permission to dance the Carmagnole before the convention. Chenard, Narbonne, and Valier came to sing stanzas in honor of the mountain. The section of Mont Blanc brought the bust of the pelletier, and a woman placed a red cap on the head of the president, who embraced her. The citoyens of the section du Mail strewed flowers before the legislators. The peoples of the country, escorted by music, came to thank the convention for having paved the way for the prosperity of the century. The women of the section of the Gardes Françaises brought roses. The women of the section of the Champs Élysées presented a crown of oak leaves. The women of the section of the temple came to the bar and took an oath to wed only true republicans. The section of Molière presented a medal of Franklin, which, by a formal decree, was suspended from the wreath of the Statue of Liberty. The foundlings, who had been declared the children of the republic, filed by, dressed in the national uniform. Young girls of the 93rd section came arrayed in long white gowns, and the next day the moniteur contained this line, the president receives a bouquet from the innocent hands of a fair young girl. The orators saluted the crowds and sometimes flattered them, saying to the multitude, Thou art infallible, thou art irreproachable, thou art sublime. The lower classes are childlike, they are fond of sugar plums. Sometimes a riot would invade the assembly, entering in a fury and departing pacified, like the Rhone flowing through Lake Leman, which is muddy enough on its entrance, but flows out as blue as the sky. If it continued turbulent, Henriot would now and then order his furnaces for heating the bullets to be brought up to the entrance of the Tuileries. 9. While this assembly was throwing off the shackles of revolution, it was also promoting civilization. It was a furnace, to be sure, but it was likewise a forge. In this cauldron where terror was bubbling, progress also fermented. From that chaos of shadows and tempestuous whirlwind of clouds spread immense rays of light parallel with the eternal laws rays that have since rested on the horizon, forever visible in the sky of the nations, and which are called justice, tolerance, goodness, reason, truth, and love. The convention proclaimed this grand axiom, the liberty of one citizen ends where that of another begins, thus summing up in two lines the essence of social science. It proclaimed the sanctity of the poor, as well as of the infirm in the persons of the blind and of the mutes, whose guardianship had been assumed by the state. It honored maternity in the person of the girl mother whom it comforted and lifted up, childhood in the orphans adopted by the state, and innocence in the accused, who was indemnified by the government after his acquittal. It branded the traffic in blacks and abolished slavery. It proclaimed civil consolidation. It decreed gratuitous instruction. It organized national education by the establishment of the normal school in Paris, the central school in the cities, and the primary school in the communes. It founded conservatories and museums. It systematized the code as well as the weights and measures, and the method of calculation by decimals. It established the finances of France upon a firm basis, and brought about an era of public credit after the long monarchical bankruptcy. It established communication by telegraph. It provided almshouses for old age and the improved hospitals for sickness. It gave the polytechnic school to the cause of education, the Bureau of Longitude to science, and the Institute to the domain of human intellect. It was at once cosmopolitan and national. Of the 11,210 decrees issued by the Convention, the proportion of philanthropic as compared with the political was as two to one. It proclaimed universal morality to be the basis of society, and universal conscience the basis of the law. And it must be remembered that all these reforms, the abolition of slavery, 
the proclamation of universal brotherhood, the protection of humanity, the elevation of the human conscience, the law of labor changed into a privilege, thus transforming the burden into a comfort, the consolidation of the national wealth, the enlightenment and protection of children, the dissemination of knowledge and science, a light set upon all the mountain tops, help proffered to the suffering, and the promulgation of all principle, were accomplished by the convention, with the Vendée gnawing like Hydra at its entrails, and the kings of the world leaping like tigers upon its shoulders. 10. Astonishing assembly! The human, the inhuman, and the superhuman, every type in short might be found there. An epic accumulation of antagonisms, Guillotin avoiding David, Bazir insulting Chabot, Godet mocking Saint-Just, Vagnot despising Danton, Louvet attacking Robespierre, Bouzeau denouncing Egalité, Chambon branding Pache, all hating Marat. And how many more names might yet be registered? Armonville, called Bonnet Rouge because at the sessions he invariably wore a Phrygian cap, a friend of Robespierre, who demanded that the latter should be guillotined after Louis XVI to restore the equilibrium, Monsieur, a colleague and counterpart of the kindly Lamourette, the bishop, destined to leave his name to a kiss. Le Hardy de Morbihan, stigmatizing the priests of Brittany. Barrère, the man of majorities, who presided when Louis XVI appeared at the bar, and who bore the same relation to Pamela as Louvet to Lodouisca. The orator Donou, who said, Let us gain time. Dubois Conseil, who listened to Marat's whispered confidences. The Marquis de Chateauneuf. Laclos. Hérault de Seychelles, who fell back before Henriot, crying, Gunners to your pieces! Julien, who compared the mountain to Thermopylae. Gamon, who demanded that a public tribune should be reserved exclusively for women. Laloy, who awarded the honors of the session to Bishop Gobel, who came to the convention to exchange his mitre for the red cap. Le Comte, who cried, So we pay homage to the priest who unfrocks himself! Ferraud, whose head was saluted by Boissy d'Anglas, leaving to history the solution of the query, did Boissy d'Anglas salute the victim in the person of the head or the assassins in the form of the pike? The two brothers Duprat, one a member of the mountain, the other a Girondist, who hated each other as did the two brothers Chenier. Many a word has been uttered in this tribune in moments of excitement, which has sometimes unconsciously to the speaker aroused the fatal spirit of revolution, and so influenced the existing circumstances that a sense of discontent and passion suddenly sprang to life. As if displeased with what they heard, events seemed to take offense at the words of men, and catastrophes were precipitated by human speech. The reverberation of a voice in the mountain is sufficient to start an avalanche. The utterance of one superfluous word may be followed by a landslide, which might not have happened had no word been spoken. One might almost fancy that events develop a certain irascibility. Thus a mistaken word falling by chance from the lips of an orator crossed Madame Elizabeth her head. Intemperance of language was the rule of the convention. In the discussions threats flew back and forth, crossing one another like sparks from a conflagration. Pétion. Come to the point, Robespierre. Robespierre. You are the point, Pétion. I shall come. You need have no fear. A voice. Death to Marat! Marat. When Marat dies, the city of Paris will be no more. And when Paris is gone, there is an end to the Republic. Biod Varenne rose to say, We wish to. Barrère interrupted him. You speak in the plural like a king. And another day, Philippot, One of the members drew his sword upon me. Alduan. President, call the assassin to order. The president. Wait. Pani. President, I call you to order. A sally followed by an outburst of rude laughter. Le Quintre. The curé of chant de Boue complains that his bishop Fauché forbids him to marry. A voice. I see no reason why Fauché, who has mistresses, should try to prevent other men from having wives. Another voice. Priest, take to thyself a wife. The tribunes mingled in the conversation and said thou to the members. One day the representative romps mounted to the tribune and, one of his sips being much larger than the other, a spectator called out to him, Turn that one towards the right, since you have a cheek a la David. Such were the liberties that the people took with the convention. Once, however, during the uproar of the 11th of April, 1793, the president caused the disorderly person in the tribunes to be arrested. One day, during a session at which the venerable Buonarotti was present, Robespierre had the floor and spoke for two hours, never removing his eyes from Danton, sometimes looking straight at him, which was unpleasant enough, 
but when he looked at him sideways it was even more disagreeable. His thunders of eloquence were not without effect, ending by an indignant outburst full of ominous words. We know the intriguers and those who strive to corrupt as well as those who are corrupted. We know the traitors also. They are present in this assembly. They hear our voice. Our eyes are upon them and our gaze pursues them. Let them look above their heads and they will discover the sword of the law. Let them look into their conscience and there behold their own infamy. Let them beware. When Robespierre had finished, Danton, with his half-closed eyes turned upwards and one arm hanging over the back of his chair, threw himself back and began to hum. Gardez Roussel fait des discours qui ne sont pas longs quand ils sont courts. Imprecations fell thick on every side. Conspirator! Assassin! Scoundrel! Seditious! Moderate! They denounced one another in the presence of the bust of Brutus standing there. Exclamations, insults, challenges. Angry glances interchanged, much shaking of fists, flashing of pistols and half-drawn daggers. An awful outblazing from the tribune. Some talked as if they were pushed up against the guillotine. Heads waved to and fro, frightened yet terrible. The multitude was like a volume of smoke blown always at once. Men of the mountain, Girondists, Foyantists, Moderates, Terrorists, Jacobins, Cordeliers, and the eighteen regicide priests. All these men, a mass of smoke driven about in every direction. 11. Spirits at the mercy of the wind, but a wind of preternatural power. It might be truthfully said, even of the chief among them, that to be a member of the convention was like being a wave of the ocean. The impetus came from above. There was an inherent force in the convention which might be called a will, not in the sense of an individual quality, but belonging to the assembly as a body. And this will was an idea, indomitable and boundless, which from the heavens above descended into the darkness below. Men called it revolution, and wherever it passed, some men were overthrown and others exalted. One would be scattered like foam, while another was dashed to pieces against the rocks. It kept its goal well in mind as it drove the maelstrom before it. To impute revolution to men is like attributing the tides to the waves. Revolution is a manifestation of the unknown. You may call it good or evil, according as you aspire to the future or cling to the past, but leave it to its authors. It would seem to be the joint product of great events and great individualities, but is in reality the result of events alone. Events plan the expenditures for which men pay the bills. Events dictate, men sign. The 14th of July was signed by Camille de Moulin, the 10th of August by Danton, the 2nd of September by Marat, the 21st of September by Grégoire, and the 21st of January by Robespierre. But de Moulin, Danton, Marat, Grégoire, and Robespierre are merely clerks. The majestic and mysterious compiler of those grand pages was Almighty God, wearing the mask of destiny. Robespierre believed in God. He did, indeed. Revolution is one form of the eternal phenomenon that circumscribes us on all sides, and which we call necessity. In the presence of this mysterious complication of benefits and wretchedness rises the wherefore of history. Because, this answer may be the reply of one who knows nothing, as well as that of one who knows all. In the presence of these monstrous catastrophes which both devastate and revivify civilization, one hesitates to sit in judgment on the details. To blame or to praise men on account of the result is very much like praising or criticizing the ciphers on account of the sum total. The inevitable is sure to happen. If the wind is to blow, it will blow. But the eternal serenity remains untouched by these blasts. Like the starlit sky above the tempest, truth and justice sit enthroned above all revolutions. 12. Such was this immeasurable convention like an entrenched encampment of the human race attacked simultaneously by all the powers of darkness, the campfires of an army of ideas besieged by its foes, an immense bivouac of human intellect on the slope of a precipice. Nothing in history can be compared to this assembly, which contained within itself senate and people, conclave and street crossing, areopagus and public square, tribunal and accused. The convention always yielded to the wind, but this wind came from the mouth of the people, and it was the breath of God. And today, after the lapse of eighty years, every time the convention presents itself to the mind of any man whomsoever, whether philosopher or historian, he cannot but pause and meditate, since no man can be indifferent to that grand procession of shadows. End of section 27
Section 28 of 93 by Victor Hugo, translated by Aline Delano. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part 2, Book 3, Chapter 2, Marat in the Green Room. On the day following the interview in the Rue du Paon, Marat, according to the intention which he had announced to Simon Everard, went to the convention. There chanced to be present a certain Marquis, Louis de Manteau, an admirer of Marat, the same who afterwards presented to the convention a decimal clock surmounted by a bust of Marat. Just as Marat entered, Chabot approached Monteau. C'est devant, he said. Monteau looked up. Why do you call me C'est devant? Because that's what you are. I? Of course, since you were once a marquis. Never! Nonsense! My father was a soldier, my grandfather was a weaver. What folly is this, Monteau? My name is not Monteau. What is it, then? My name is Maribon. <laughs> Very well, declared Chabot. It is all one to me. And he added between his teeth, Every man nowadays pretends that he is no Marquis. Marat stopped in the left-hand corridor and looked at Monteau and Chabot. Whenever he came in, a murmur would pass through the crowd, but always at a respectful distance. It was quiet in his immediate vicinity. Marat paid no attention whatever. He scorned the croaking of the frogs. In this dim shadow obscuring the lower benches, Conpe de Loise, Prunel, Viars, a bishop who afterwards became a member of the French Academy, Boutrou, Petit, Plachard, Bonnet, Thibaudot, Valdruche, pointed him out to one another. Look, there is Marat. He's not ill, then. Probably he is, since he is here in a dressing gown. In a dressing gown? Certainly. What liberties he allows himself? That he should dare to come to the convention in such a garb. <sighs> since he came one day crowned with laurels, he might be expected to appear in a dressing gown. With his face of copper and teeth of verdigris. His dressing gown seems new. What is it made of? A kind of rup. Striped? Just see the lapels. They're made of fur. Tiger skin? No, ermine. Imitation. He has stockings on. Remarkable! And shoes with buckles. Silver buckles. Condola Sabo will not soon forgive him that. On the opposite branches they pretended not to see Marat, but continued to talk of other matters. Santa Knox accosted Dussault. Have you heard Dussault? What? The ci devant Count de Brienne. The one who was at La Force with the ci devant Duc de Villeroy? Yes. I knew them both. What about them? You know, they were so frightened that they saluted all the red caps of the turnkeys, and one day refused to take a hand at piquet, because a pack of cards with kings and queens was offered them. Well? They were guillotined yesterday. Both of them? Yes. Well, how did they behave in prison? Like cowards. And what sort of a figure did they cut on the scaffold? Intrepid. Whereupon Dussault exclaimed, It's easier to die than to live. Barère had begun to read a report on the subject of the Vendée. Nine hundred men from Morbihan had started with cannon to relieve Nantes. Redon was threatened by the peasants, and Pambeuf had been attacked. A fleet was cruising in the vicinity of Mandrin to prevent invasions. From Ingrand to Maur, the entire left bank of the Loire bristled with royalist batteries. Three thousand peasants had taken possession of Pornic. They cried, Vive les Anglais! Barère read a letter from Santerre to the convention, ending with the following words. Seven thousand peasants attacked Vannes. We repulsed them, and they retreated, leaving four cannon in our hands. And how many prisoners? interrupted a voice. Barère went on. Postscript. We have no prisoners, because we have ceased to take them. Marat, as usual, stood motionless, paying no attention to what was going on, apparently absorbed in deep preoccupation. He held a paper in his hand, crumpling it between his fingers. Had it been unfolded, certain words in the handwriting of Momoro, in answer no doubt to some question of Marat, might have been read. Nothing can be done in opposition to the supreme authority of the delegated commissioners, especially those of the Committee of Public Safety. Although Genesia said in the session of May 6th, each commissioner is more than a king, it had no effect. Life and death are in their hands. Massad at Angers, Toulard at Saint-Amand, Neon with General Marseille, Parrain in the Army of the Sables, Miliere in the Army of Niort are all powerful. 
The Jacobin Club has gone so far as to appoint Paré and Brigadier General. Circumstances excuse everything. A delegate of the Committee of Public Safety may hold in check a commander-in-chief. Marat ceased crumpling the paper, put it in his pocket, and walked slowly towards Monteau and Chabot, who had continued their conversation and had not seen him enter. Chabot was just saying, Maribon or Monteau, listen to this, I have just left the Committee of Public Safety. And what are they doing there? They are setting a priest to watch a noble. Ah. A noble like yourself? I am not a noble, said Monteau. To be watched by a priest. Like you. I am not a priest, said Chabot. And both men began to laugh. Please give us a more definite account. Well, here is the tale. A priest, Simourdan by name, has been delegated with full powers to a Viscount Govan, who is in command of the exploring division of the Army of the Coast. Now, the difficulty is to prevent the nobleman from cheating and the priest from betraying. There will be no trouble about that. You have only to make death the third party. That is what I came for, said Marat. They looked up. Good day, Marat, said Chabot. We seldom see you at our sessions. My doctor has ordered baths, replied Marat. Ah, you had better beware of baths, continued Chabot. Seneca died in a bath. Marat smiled. There is no Nero here, Chabot. I should say there was, since you are here, said a gruff voice. It was Danton, who was passing on his way towards his seat. Marat did not turn round. He thrust his head in between the faces of Monteau and Chabot. Listen. I have come on serious business. One of us three must propose the draft of a decree to the convention today. I am not the man, said Monteau. They pay no attention to me. I am a marquis. Neither will they listen to me. I am a capuchin, said Chabot. Nor to me, for I am Marat. A silence ensued. Marat, absorbed in his own thoughts, was not accessible to questions. Still, Monteau ventured upon one. What decree would you like the assembly to pass, Marat? A decree inflicting the penalty of death on any military chief who allows a rebel prisoner to escape. Chabot interposed. There is such a decree already. It was made a law at the end of April. That amounts to nothing whatever, said Marat. Everywhere throughout the Vendée prisoners are helped to escape, and any man may shelter them with impunity. That is because the decree is no longer in force, Marat. It must be revived, Chabot. No doubt it needs to be revived. And to accomplish this, we must address the convention. There will be no need to do that, Marat. The Committee of Public Safety will suffice. The object will be attained, added Monteau, if the Committee of Public Safety order the decree to be placarded in every commune of the Vendée, and make two or three suitable examples. Of men in authority, rejoined Chabot, of the generals. Marat mumbled between his teeth. Yes, I suppose that will answer. Marat, continued Chabot, go and say that to the Committee of Public Safety yourself. Marat gazed steadily at him, which was not pleasant even for a Chabot. Chabot, he said, the Committee of Public Safety meets at Robespierre's house. I do not visit Robespierre. Then I will go myself, said Monteau. Very well, replied Marat. The next day a mandate from the Committee of Public Safety was sent in all directions, ordering the authorities of the cities and villages of the Vendée not only to publish but also strictly to execute a decree awarding the penalty of death to all who were known to aid and abet the escape of brigands and rebel prisoners. This decree was but the first step. The convention was to go still farther than that, Several months later, on the 11th Brumaire, in the year 2, November 1793, when Laval opened its gates to the Vendean fugitives, 
It decreed that every city that sheltered rebels should be demolished and destroyed. The princes of Europe on their side, in the manifesto of the Duke of Brunswick, suggested by the émigrés and drawn up by the Marquis of Linon, steward to the Duke of Orléans, declared that every Frenchman taken with arms in his hand should be shot, and if but a hair fell from the head of the king, Paris should be razed to the ground. Cruelty against barbarity. End of section 28section twenty nine of ninety three by victor hugo translated by aline delano this librivox recording is in the public domain part three in the vendee book one the vendee chapter one the forests there were in brittany at that time seven much dreaded forests the vendean war was a rebellion among priests and the forest was their auxiliary the spirits of darkness help one another the seven black forests of Brittany were the forest of Fougères, which bars the passage between Dole and Avranches, the forest of Prancé, eight miles in circumference, the forest of Pampont, abounding in ravines and brooks, and almost inaccessible in the direction of Bagnon, with an easy retreat towards Concornet, which was a royalist town, the forest of Rennes, whence could be heard the toxin of the republican parishes, always numerous in the neighborhood of cities, there it was that Puisay lost Focard, the forest of Machicoul, where Charette dwelt like a wild beast, the forest of La Garnache, belonging to the Tremois, the Gauvans, and the Rohans, and the forest of Brocéliande, that had been appropriated by the fairies. One nobleman in Brittany was called the Seigneur de Cette Forêt, and he was the Viscount de Fontenay, a Breton prince. For the Breton prince was a creation quite distinct from the French prince, the Rohans were Breton princes. Gamier de Sainte, in his report to the convention of the 15th Niveaux, year two, thus describes the Prince de Talmont, that Capet of Brigands, the sovereign of Maine and Normandy. The events that transpired in Breton forests from 1792 to 1800 would form a history in themselves, blending like a legend with the stupendous affair of the Vendée. There is truth in legend as well as in history, but the nature of legendary truth differs from that of historic truth. The former may be invention, but its result is reality. Both, however, have the same aim, inasmuch as each strives to depict the eternal type of mankind under the transitory specimen. The Vendée cannot be fully understood unless legend is allowed to supplement history. History must present the total effect, legend describe the details. We cannot refuse to acknowledge that the Vendée is well worth the trouble, for it is a prodigy. That war of the ignorant, so dull and yet so splendid, so detestable and at the same time so magnificent, was at once the despair and the pride of the nation. In the act of wounding France, the Vendée covered her with glory. There are times when human society presents enigmas whose meaning becomes evident to the wise, while for the ignorant it remains obscure signifying nothing more than violence and barbarism. A philosopher is slow to accuse. He takes into consideration the disturbances caused by these problems, which never pass without casting a shadow like a cloud. He who would understand the Vendée must picture the antagonism of the French Revolution on the one hand, and the Breton peasant on the other. Face to face with these unparalleled events, this tremendous promise of every advantage at once, this fit of rage on the part of civilization, this excess of infuriated progress, to be accompanied by an improvement that could neither be measured nor understood, stands this serious and peculiar savage, this man with the keen eyes and long hair, who lives on milk and chestnuts, whose ideas are bounded by his roof, by his hedge, and by his ditch, who can distinguish each village by the sound of its bells, who drinks nothing but water, yet wears a leather waistcoat worked with silken arabesques, a man uncultivated, dressed in embroidered garments, who tattoos his clothes, as his ancestors the Celts used to tattoo their faces, who respects his master in the person of his executioner, who speaks a dead language which is equivalent to keeping his mind in a tomb, goading his oxen, sharpening his scythe, hoeing his black grain, kneading his buckwheat cake, reverencing first his plough and secondly his grandmother, believing in the Blessed Virgin and in the White Lady no less, worshipping before the altar and also before the tall mysterious stone set up in the midst of the moor, a labourer in the plain, a fisherman on the coast, a poacher in the thicket, 
devoted to his kings, his priests, his lords, and to his very lice. A man of pensive mood, often standing motionless for hours on the wide, deserted shore, listening gloomily to the sounding sea. Is it then strange that this blind man failed to appreciate the light? End of section 29「The peasant has confidence in the field that nourishes him, no less than in the wood that serves to hide him. It is no easy matter to conceive an idea of the forests of Brittany. They were cities in themselves. Nothing could be more secret, more silent, or more impenetrable than those tangled thickets of briars and branches offering shelter, repose, and silence. No solitude could seem more death-like and sepulchral. If one could, like a flash of lightning, have felled the entire forest at a single stroke, a swarm of human beings would have stood forth revealed within those shades. Concealed on the outside by coverings of stones and branches were wells, round and narrow, sinking at first vertically and then horizontally, widening under the ground like funnels, and ending in dark chambers. Wells like those discovered by Westermann in Brittany were also found in Egypt by Cambyses, with this difference, that while the Egyptian caves in the desert held dead men only, those in the forests of Brittany contained living human beings. One of the wildest glades in the woods of Misdon, intersected by subterranean passages and cells, wherein a mysterious population moved to and fro, was called La Grande Ville. Another glade, just as deserted above ground, and no less populous below, was called La Place Royale. This subterranean life in Brittany had existed from time immemorial. Man had there sought refuge from his brother man. Hence these hiding places, like the dens of reptiles, hollowed out under the trees. They dated from the times of the Druids, and some of the crypts were as old as the dolmens. All the evil spirits of legend and the monsters of history passed over this gloomy land. Tratates, Caesar, Hoel, Neomene, Geoffrey of England, Alain of the Iron Glove, Pierre Mauclerc, the French House of Blois, and the English House of Montfort, kings and dukes, the nine barons of Brittany, the judges of the great days, the counts of Nantes who wrangled with the counts of Rennes, highwaymen, banditti, freelances, Ronay II, the Viscount de Rohan, the king's governors, the good Duc de Chaulne, who hung the peasants under the windows of Madame de Sévigné, the seigneurial butcheries in the 15th century, religious wars in the 16th and 17th, and the 30,000 dogs trained to hunt men in the 18th. During this wild trampling, the people made up their minds that it would be better for them to disappear. One after the other, the troglodytes seeking to escape from the Celts, the Celts from the Romans, the Bretons from the Normans, the Huguenots from the Catholics, and the smugglers from the excise officers, had sought refuge first in the forests, then underground. It is thus that tyranny forces the nations to the last resource of the hunted beast. For two thousand years had despotism, in all its varied forms, of conquest, vassalage, fanaticism, and taxation, hunted down this unfortunate and distracted Brittany, it was like an inexorable Batu constantly changing its method of attack. Men disappeared underground. While that terror which is a sort of rage was brooding in human souls, and the dens in the forests were in waiting for them, the French Republic sprang into existence. Brittany, thinking this compulsory deliverance but a new form of oppression, broke into open rebellion, a mistake usually made by enslaved peoples. End of section 30 Section 31 of 93 by Victor Hugo, translated by Aline Delano. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part 3, Book 1, Chapter 3, Connivance of Men and Forests. Thus the tragic forests of Brittany once more resumed their ancient role of servant and accomplice to revolution. The subsoil of such a forest was like a madrepore pierced and intersected in all directions by a secret labyrinth of mines, cells, and galleries. Each of these hidden cells was large enough to shelter five or six men. The only difficulty was in breathing. Certain mysterious ciphers have been preserved that give us a clue to this powerful organization of the peasant rebellion. In ille Vilan, 
in the forest of Pertre, where the Prince de Talmont had taken refuge, not a breath could be heard, not a trace of human life was visible, and yet Focard had there mustered six thousand men. In Morbihan, in the forest of Murlac, not a man of all the eight thousand there was to be seen. These two forests, the Pertre and Murlac, are not, however, to be reckoned among the great Breton forests. It would have been dangerous walking over their explosive soil. These treacherous copses, with their multitudes of combatants lurking in a sort of subterranean labyrinth, were like great black sponges, from which, beneath the pressure of revolution's giant foot, civil war gushed forth. Invisible battalions were lying in wait. This army, unknown to the world, wound its way along under the feet of the republican armies, leaping out of the ground at times in vast numbers and disappearing as suddenly, possessing the power of vanishing at will no less than the gift of ubiquity. It was like the descending avalanche that leaves but a cloud of dust behind, colossi with a marvelous genius for contraction, giants in warfare, dwarfs in flight, jaguars with the habits of moles. Moreover, there were woods as well as forests. As the village ranks below the city, so the woods bear a similar relation to the forests, which they serve to connect after the fashion of a labyrinth. Old castles, fortresses once upon a time, hamlets that had been camps, farms covered with ambushes and snares, divided by ditches and fenced in by trees, formed the meshes of the net in which the republican armies were caught. All this was called the bocage. There was the wood of Mizdon, with a pond in its midst, held by Jean Chouan. The wood of Gen, held by Taillefer. The wood of La Huisserie, held by Gouge le Bruant. The wood of La Charny, held by Courtille le Batard, called the Apostle Saint Paul, chief of the camp of the Vache Noire. The wood of Burgault, in possession of that enigmatical Monsieur Jacques, who was to meet with a mysterious death in the vault of Juvardet. The wood of Charot, where Pimous and Petit Prince, when attacked by the garrison of Chateauneuf, captured the grenadiers from the ranks of the Republicans in a hand-to-hand -hand encounter. The wood of La Heureuserie, which witnessed the defeat of the military post of Longueville. The wood of Lone, whence the road between Rennes and Laval could be watched. The wood of La Gravelle, won by a prince of La Tremoille in a bowling match. The wood of Lorge in the Côte du Nord, where Charles de Boishardy succeeded Bernard de Villeneuve. The wood of Bagnard, near Fontenay, where Lescure offered battle to Chalbeau, a challenge accepted by the latter, although they were five to one against him. The wood of La Durandaille, over which Alain, Le Redru, and Erispou, sons of Charles the Bald, quarreled in former times. The wood of Croqueloup, on the edge of that moor where Couperot used to shear the prisoners. The wood of La Croix Bataille, witness to the Homeric insults hurled against each other by Jean d'Argent and Morière the wood of La Saudrai, which the reader will remember was reconnoitred by the Paris battalion, and many others besides. In several of these forests and woods there were not only subterranean villages grouped around the borough-like headquarters of the chief, but actual hamlets composed of low cabins hidden under the trees, in such numbers that the forest was often filled with them. Sometimes the smoke betrayed their presence. Two among these hamlets in the forest of Mistone have become famous. Laurier, near Letang, and the group of huts called La Rue de Bau, in the direction of saint ouen les trois The women lived in the huts, and the men in the caves. The galleries of the ferries and the old Celtic mines were utilized for purposes of warfare. Food was conveyed to the dwellers underground, and the some there were who, forgotten, died of hunger. They, however, were awkward fellows who had not sense enough to uncover their wells. This cover, usually made of moss and branches, and arranged so skillfully that it was impossible to distinguish it on the outside from the surrounding grass, was yet easily opened and closed from the inside. A den like this, known under the name of La Loge, was hollowed out with great care, and the earth taken therefrom thrown into some neighboring pond. The inside walls and the floor were afterwards lined with ferns and moss. It was fairly comfortable, save for the lack of light, fire, bread, and air. To rise from underground and appear among the living without due precaution, possibly to disinter themselves at an inappropriate moment, would be a serious business. They might chance to encounter an army on the march. Those were dangerous woods, snares with a double trap. The blues dared not enter, and the whites dared not come out. End of section 31《ニトリ》第1章「ニトリ」第1章「ニトリ」第1章「ニトリ」第1章「ニトリ」第1章「ニトリ」第1章「ニトリ」第1章「ニトリ」第1章「ニトリ」第1章「ニトリ」第1章「ニトリ」第1
Part Three, Book One, Chapter Four, Their Life Underground. The men, wearied of living in these beasts' lairs, would sometimes venture to come out by night and dance on the neighboring moor, or else they said prayers by way of killing time. Jean Chouan made us say our beads from morning till night, says Bourdoiseau. It was almost impossible, when the season arrived, to prevent the men of Bas-Maine from going to the Fête de la Gerbe. They clung to their own ideas. Tranche Montagne says that Denise disguised himself as a woman to go to the play at Laval, after which he returned to his den. All at once they would rush out in search of death, changing one tomb for another. Sometimes they would lift the cover of their grave and listen for any chance sounds of battle in the distance, following it with their ears, guided by the steady fire of the Republicans and the intermittent shots of the Royalists. When the platoon firing suddenly ceased, they knew that the Royalists had lost the day. But if the scattering shots continued, receding into the distance, it was a sign that the victory was theirs. The whites always pursued. The blues never did so because the country was against them. These underground belligerents were wonderfully well informed. Nothing could be more rapid or more mysterious than their means of communication. The bridges and wagons had all been destroyed, yet they found means to keep one another informed of all that went on and to send timely warning. Messenger stations of danger were established from forest to forest, from village to village, from hut to hut, from bush to bush. A stupid-looking peasant might be seen passing along. He carried despatches in his hollow staff. Furnished by Voitidou, a former constituent, with the modern Republican passport, in which a blank space is left for the name, bundles of which were in the possession of that traitor, they were enabled to travel from one end of Brittany to the other. It was impossible to take them by surprise. Puisaya states that secrets confided to upwards of 4,000 individuals have been religiously kept. It seemed as though this quadrilateral, closed on the south by the line from Sable to Thouar, on the east by that from Thouar to Saumur, as well as by the river of Thouet, on the north by the Loire, and on the west by the ocean, possessed a system of nerves in common, and that no single part of the ground could stir without shaking the whole. In the twinkling of an eye they learned in Luçon what was going on in Noirmoutier, and the camp of La Loue knew what was passing in the camp La croix Morino. It was as if the birds had carried the news. On the seventh Messidor, in the year three, Hoche wrote, one might have supposed they had telegraphs. They formed clans, as in Scotland, and each parish had its own captain. My father fought in this war, and I know whereof I am speaking. End of section 32section 33 of 93 by victor hugo translated by aline delano this librivox recording is in the public domain part 3 book 1 chapter 5 their life in warfare many of them had nothing but pikes but good hunting rifles were plentiful and no marksmen were more expert than the poachers of the bocage and the smugglers of la rue they were eccentric terrible and intrepid fighters the proclamation of a decree to levy three hundred thousand men was the signal for ringing the tocsin in six hundred villages. The flames burst forth in all directions at once. Poitou and the Anjou revolted on the same day. Let us remark that the first rumbling was heard on the 8th of July, 1792, a month previous to the 10th of August, on the moor of Kerbader. Alain Redeler, whose name is now forgotten, was the forerunner of La roche jacques -Alain and Jean Chouan. The royalists forced all able-bodied men to march under penalty of death. They confiscated harnesses, wagons, and provisions. Sapinode at once assembled three thousand soldiers, Cartelineau ten thousand, Stoufflet twenty thousand, and Charette took possession of Noirmoutier. The Vicomte de Scipot roused the Haute Anjou, the Chevalier de Dieuzy the Antervillain et Loire, Tristan Lermite the Barmen, the Barber Gaston the city of Guémenet, and Abbé Bernier all the others. It required but little to excite the masses. A great black cat was placed in the tabernacle of a priest who had taken the civil oath, a priest-juror, as he was called, whence it suddenly leaped forth in the middle of the mass. "'It's the devil!' cried the peasants, and a whole district rose in revolt. Sometimes flames would be seen issuing from the confessionals. For assailing the blues and crossing the ravines, they had sticks fifteen feet long called the fert, a weapon of defense which was likewise available for flight. 
in the very heat of the conflict when the peasants were attacking the republican squares if they chanced to see on the battlefield a cross or a chapel all fell on their knees and said their prayers under the fire of the enemy and after finishing the rosary those who had not been killed rushed upon the enemy alas what giants were these they loaded their muskets on the run that was their special talent they could be made to believe anything their priests showed them other priests whose necks had been reddened by a tightly drawn cord saying to them these are the guillotined come to life again they had their fits of chivalrous emotion they paid military honors to fesk a republican standard-bearer who had allowed himself to be sabred without once losing hold of his banner these peasants were at times derisive they called the married republican priests sans calottes devenus sans culottes translator's note the uncapped become unbreached and translator's note at first they stood in awe of the cannon but after a while they dashed upon them with no other weapons than their sticks and captured several the first one they took was a fine bronze cannon which they baptized the missionnaire another gun dating from the times of the catholic wars and which had richelieu's arms and an image of the virgin engraved upon it they named marie jean when they lost fontenay they lost marie jean around which six hundred peasants fell fighting with unflinching courage later they recaptured fontenay in order to recover marie jean which they brought back under the fleur-de-lis flag covering it with flowers and making the women who passed by kiss it but two cannon were insufficient it was stofflet who had captured marie jean catelineau envying him left pont and mange attacked jalais and took possession of a third one forest fell on saint florent and captured a fourth two other commanders choup and saint paul were still more successful they manufactured imitation cannon from the trunks of trees using mannequins for gunners and with this artillery over which they made merry they forced the blues to retreat to maroy at that time they were in the height of their glory later when chalbot defeated la marsonniere the peasants left behind them on the dishonored battlefield two cannon bearing the arms of england at that time the french princes were paid by england who as nantiat writes on the tenth of may seventeen ninety four I remitted funds to Monseigneur because Mr. Pitt was told that it was the proper thing to do. Melinet, in a report of the 31st of March, says, The cry of the rebels is, Long live the English! The peasants tarried for purposes of pillage, for those devotees were thieves. Savages have their vices, and it is to these that civilization appeals. Puisaye says, Several times I have saved the town of Plélan from pillage. And again he says that he refrained from entering Montfort i made a circuit in order to avoid the sacking of the houses of the jacobins they pillaged cholet they sacked chalon passing by granville they robbed ville dieu they called the country people who joined the blues the jacobin herd and exterminated them more fiercely than they did their other foes they enjoyed carnage like soldiers and reveled in massacre like brigands to shoot the patouts was their delight they called it breaking their fast at fontenay one of their priests named barboton killed an old man with a blow from his sabre. At Saint-Germain-sur-Ile, one of their captains, a nobleman, shot the solicitor of the commune and took his watch. At Machicoul, for the space of five weeks, they made a practice of slaughtering the republicans at the rate of thirty a day. Each string of thirty they called a rosary. Behind this row of men there was a trench prepared, into which the men fell back as they were shot. And when, as sometimes happened, a man was still alive, he was buried as if he were dead such acts have been witnessed in our own times joubert president of the district had his wrists sawed off they had handcuffs for the blues made expressly to cut the flesh they slaughtered them in the public squares sounding the halloo charette who signed himself fraternity chevalier charette and who like marat wore a handkerchief knotted around his brows burned the city of pornic with the inhabitants in their dwellings meanwhile carrier was frightful terror answered unto terror the Breton rebel looked very much like the Greek insurgent, clad as he was in a short jacket, with a gun slung across his shoulders, leggings, wide trousers of a material not unlike fustian. The lads resembled a Greek cleft. Henri de la roche jacques went into this war at the age of twenty-one, armed with a pair of pistols and a stick. There were one hundred and fifty-four divisions in the Vendean army. They laid regular sieges. The city of Bressuire was invested by them for three days. On a good Friday, ten thousand peasants bombarded the city of Des Sables with red-hot cannonballs. They succeeded in destroying in one day the fourteen Republican cantonments from Montigny to Courbevay. On the high wall at Thouars, the following astonishing dialogue was heard between La Roche-Jacquelon and a lad. Fellow! Here I am! 
Lend me your shoulders to climb up on. Take them. Give me your gun. Here it is. And La Roche Jacqueline leaped into the city. And thus, without the aid of scaling ladders, they captured the very towers once besieged by de Guesclin. They rallied a cartridge far beyond a gold louis. They burst into tears whenever they lost sight of their village of Elfry. To run away seemed to them the simplest affair in the world. At such times their leaders would exclaim, Throw away your sabots, but keep your guns! When munitions failed, they said their beads, and proceeded to take the powder from the caissons of the Republican artillery, and afterwards Dolbey demanded powder from the English. On the approach of the enemy they concealed their wounded in the tall grain, or among the brakes, and came back for them after the engagement was over. They wore no uniform, and their clothing was falling to pieces. Noblemen as well as peasants wore any rags that came to hand. Roger Moulinier was arrayed in a turban and dolman taken from the wardrobe of the Théâtre de la Flèche. The Chevalier de Beauvilliers had a barrister's gown and a lady's bonnet over a woolen cap. All wore the white belt and scarf. The different grades were indicated by a knot. Stoufflet wore a red knot, La Roche Jacqueline a black one. Wimpfen, a semi-Girondist, and who moreover had never been out of Normandy, wore the armlets of the Carabeau of Cayenne. They had women in their ranks, Madame de Lescure, who afterwards became Madame de La Roche Jacqueline, Thérèse de Molienne, mistress of La Rouarie, she who burned the list of parishes, Madame de la Rochefoucauld, young and beautiful, who sabre in hand rallied the peasants at the foot of the tower of the Chateau Puy Rousseau, and Antoinette Adams, styled the Chevalier Adams, so brave that when captured she was shot standing out of respect for her courage. This epic period was a cruel one. Men behaved like maniacs. Madame de Lescure deliberately walked her horse over the Republicans who lay disabled on the battleground. She said they were dead, but very possibly they may have been only wounded. There was occasionally a traitor among the men, but never among the women. It is true Mademoiselle Fleury of the French theatre forsook La Rouerie for Marat, but that was for love's sake. The commanders were often as ignorant as the soldiers. Monsieur de Sapinot could not spell correctly. He wrote, Nous aurions de notre côté. The leaders hated one another. The captains of the Marais cried, Down with the mountaineers! Their cavalry was few in numbers and difficult to form. Poussaille wrote, A man who would cheerfully give me his two sons grows cool when I ask for one of his horses. Poles, pitchforks, scythes, muskets old and new, poacher's knives, spits, iron-pointed cudgels studded with nails, such were their weapons. Some carried a cross made of two human bones. They rushed to the attack with shouts, springing up at once from all quarters, from woods, hills, underbrush, and hollow roads, ranging themselves in a circle, killing, exterminating, striking terror, and then disappearing. Whenever they passed a Republican town, they cut down the liberty pole, set it on fire, and, forming in a circle, danced around it. All their activity was displayed by night. The rule of the Vendean is to be always unexpected. They would march fifteen leagues in utter silence, without so much as stirring a blade of grass. At night, their chiefs having determined in a council of war at what point the Republican posts were to be surprised the next day, they loaded their muskets, mumbled their prayers, and, taking off their sabots, filed through the woods in long columns, barefoot across the heather and moss, noiseless, without uttering a sound or drawing a breath, like a procession of cats in the darkness. End of section 33section 34 of 93 by victor hugo translated by aline delano this limbervox recording is in the public domain part 3 book 1 chapter 6 the soul of the earth passes into man the number of the rebels in the vendee including men women and children cannot be estimated at less than 500,000 tufan de la rouerie states the sum total of the combatants to have been half a million the Federalists helped them, and the Vendée had the Gironde on its side also. Lozère sent 30,000 men into the Bocage. Eight departments formed a coalition, five in Brittany, three in Normandy. Evreux, who fraternized with Cayenne, was represented in the rebellion by Chaumont, its mayor, and Gardimba, a man of note. Bouzot, Gorsas, and Barbarou at Cayenne, Brousseau at Moulin, Chassan at Lyon, Rabot saint etienne at Nîmes, Milan and Duchatel in Brittany all fanned the flames of the furnace. There were two Vendées, the great army fighting in the forests, and the smaller one carrying on the war in the bushes. And this marks the difference between Charette and John Chouan. 
The little Vendée was simple-minded and true. The great Vendée was corrupt. The little Vendée was the better of the two. The rank of Marquis, lieutenant general of the king's armies, was bestowed upon Charette, and he received the Grand Cross of Saint Louis. Jean Chouan remained Jean Chouan. Charette resembles a bandit. Jean Chouan is more like a paladin of old. As to those magnanimous chiefs, Bonchamp, Lescure, La Roche Jacqueline, they were mistaken. The great Catholic army was an insane attempt, upon whose heels disaster was sure to follow. Imagine a crowd of peasants storming Paris, a coalition of villages besieging the Pantheon, a chorus of Christmas hymns and prayers striving to drown the Marseillaise, a cohort of rustics rushing upon a legion of enlightened minds. Mons and Savenay chastised this folly. The Vendée could not cross the Loire. That was a stride beyond its power. Civil war can make no conquests. Crossing the Rhine confirms the power of Caesar and adds to that of Napoleon. Crossing the Loire kills La roche jacqueline The genuine Vendée is the Vendée at home. There it is more than invulnerable. It is unconquerable. At home the Vendée is smuggler, laborer, soldier, shepherd, poacher, sharpshooter, goatherd, bell-ringer, peasant, spy, assassin, sacristan, and wild beast. La roche jacqueline is only an Achilles, while John Chouan is a Proteus. The Vendée failed. Other revolts have been successful, that in Switzerland, for instance. The difference between mountain insurgents like the Swiss and forest insurgents like the Vendéan exists in the fact that almost invariably, owing to some fatal influence of his surroundings, the former fights for an ideal, while the latter fights for a prejudice. The one soars, the other crawls. The one fights for humanity, the other for solitude. The one demands liberty, the other isolation. The one defends the commune, the other the parish. The commons! The commons! cried the heroes of Marat. The one has to do with precipices, the other with quagmires. The one is the man of torrents and foaming streams, the other of stagnant pools whence fever rises. One has the blue sky above his head, the other a thicket. One is on the mountain top, the other among the shadows. An education that is gained upon the heights is quite a different affair from that of the shallows. A mountain is a fortress, a forest is an ambush. The former inspires courage, the latter teaches trickery. The ancients placed their gods upon a pinnacle, and their satyrs within copses. The satyr is a savage, half man, half beast. Free countries had their Apennines, Alps, Pyrenees, and Olympus. Parnassus is a mountain. Mont Blanc was the giant auxiliary of William Tell. Looking beyond and above these titanic contests between human intellect and the darkness of night, which form the subjects of the poems of India, one sees Himalaya towering overhead. Greece, Spain, Italy, Helvetia have the mountains for their inspiration. Cimmeria, whether it be Germany or Brittany, has but the woods. The forest tends to barbarism. The formation of the soil influences man in many of his actions. It is more of an accomplice than one might imagine. When we consider certain wild scenery, we feel tempted to exonerate man and accuse nature. We are conscious of an occult provocation on the part of nature. The desert has sometimes an unwholesome influence upon the conscience, especially on one that is not enlightened. A conscience may be gigantic. Take, for example, Socrates or the Christ. It may be dwarf-like, in which case we find Atreus and Judas. A narrow conscience soon displays the attributes of the reptile. It delights to haunt the dim forests. It is attracted by the brambles, the thorns, the marshes underneath the branches, and absorbs the evil influences of the place. Optical illusions, mysterious mirages, the terrors of the hour and the place, inspire a man with that sort of half-religious, half-animal fear, which in everyday life begets superstition, and in times of wild excitements degenerates into brutality. Hallucination holds the torch that lights the path to murder. A vertigo seizes the brigand. Nature, marvelous as she is, holds a double meaning that dazzles great minds and blinds the savage soul. When man is ignorant, and the desert is alive with visions, the gloom of solitude is added to the blindness of the intelligence, hence the abyss that sometimes yawns in the human soul. There are certain rocks, ravines, copses, weird spaces between the trees, revealing the blackness of the night, that incite man to mad and cruel deeds. 
one might say that the evil fiend possesses such spots. What tragic scenes has not the gloomy hill between Banyon and Plelan beheld? Wide horizons tend to enlarge the mind. Limited horizons, on the contrary, circumscribe it. Hence men are naturally kind-hearted, such, for instance, as Jean Chouan, grow narrow-minded. It is the hatred of narrow minds for liberal ideas that fetters the march of progress. The Vendean War, a quarrel between the local and the universal idea, the contest of peasant and patriot, may be summed up in two words, the village community and the fatherland. End of section 34《ニトリ》Victor Hugo, translated by Aline Delano. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part three, book one, chapter seven. The Vendée has ruined Brittany. Brittany is an old rebel. In all her revolts in the past two thousand years, she has had the right on her side until now. In her last rebellion, she was wrong. And yet, after all, whether she was fighting against revolution or against monarchy, against the acting representative or against the ruling dukes and peers, against the financial resource of the Azignats or the oppression of the salt tax. Whoever might be fighting, whether it were Nicolas Rapin, François de la Noue, Captain Pluviau, and the Lady of La Garnache, or Stoufflet, Coquereau, and the Chandelier de Pierreville, and whether they were fighting under Monsieur de Rohan against the king, or under Monsieur de la Rochejacquelon for the king, it was practically the same war that of local government against centralization. These ancient provinces might be compared with a pond. Stagnant water is not inclined to flow. The wind, instead of rousing it to life, simply irritates it. France ended at Finisterre. That was the limit of the space granted to man, and there the forward march of generations ceased. Pause, cries the ocean to the land, and barbarism to civilization. Whenever it feels the influence of any excitement in Paris, whatever may be the occasion thereof, monarchy or republic, despotism or liberty, it is an innovation, and Brittany bristles with alarm and says, Let us alone! What do you want of us? The Marais seizes its pitchfork, and the Bocage grasps its musket. All our attempts at reform in matters of education and legislation, our philosophical systems, our men of genius, our triumphs, fail before the Uru. The tocsin of Bazouge holds the French Revolution in awe. The moor of Faou defies the stormy assemblies on our public squares, and the belfry of haute de Pre declares war against the tower of the Louvre. Terrible blindness. The Vendean insurrection was a melancholy misunderstanding. An affray on a gigantic scale, wrangling among titans, a colossal rebellion, fated to bequeath but one word to history, the Vendée, a glorious though melancholy word, devoting itself to death for the absent, sacrificing itself to egotism, squandering its dauntless courage, offering itself in the cause of cowards, with neither foresight nor strategy, without tactics, plan, or aim, following no leader, accepting no responsibility, showing how powerless the human will may become, uniting the spirit of chivalry with the deeds of the savage, absurdity at its height, darkness screening itself from the light, Ignorance offering a determined resistance to truth, justice, right, reason, and deliverance. The terror of eight years, the devastation of fourteen departments, the ravages in the fields, the destruction of crops, the burning of villages, the ruin of cities, the massacre of women and children, the torch applied to the thatch, the sword plunged into the heart, the terror of civilization, the hope of Mr. Pitt. Such was this war, an unreasoning attempt at parricide. On the whole, the Vendée has served the cause of progress by showing the necessity of scattering the ancient shadows of Brittany by discharging into its thickets all the arrows of enlightenment. Catastrophes have a gloomy way of settling affairs. End of section 35 Section 36 of 93 by Victor Hugo Translated by Aline Delano This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part Three in the Vendée, Book Two, The Three Children, Chapter One, Plus Quam Civilia Bella. The summer of seventeen ninety two had been a very rainy one, but that of seventeen ninety three was so extremely warm that, although the civil war had gone far towards ruining the roads in Brittany, the people, thanks to the fine weather, were able to travel from place to place. 
for a dry soil makes the best road. At the close of a clear July day, about an hour after sunset, a man on horseback, riding from the direction of Avranche, stopped before the little inn called the Croix Blanchard, situated at the entrance of Pontorson. For some years its sign had borne the following inscription, Good cider obtained here. The day had been a very warm one, but now the wind was beginning to rise. The traveller was wrapped in an ample cloak that fell over his horse's back. He wore a broad-brimmed hat, ornamented with a tricoloured cockade, which was rather a bold thing to do in a country like this, with its hedges and sharpshooting, for which a cockade offered an excellent target. The cloak fastened around his neck was pushed back, leaving his arms free, and revealing at the same time a tricoloured belt and the butts of two pistols protruding from it, while a sabre hung down below the cloak. At the sound of the horse's hoofs stopping before the inn, the door opened, and the landlord came out, holding a lantern in his hand. It was just at twilight, when it is still light out of doors, although dark within. The host glanced at the cockade. Do you mean to stop here, citizen? No. Where are you going, then? To Dole. In that case, you would do better to return to Avranche, or else remain at Pontorson. Why so? Because they are fighting at Dole. Ah, oh, said the rider. Then he continued, Give my horse some oats. The host, having brought the trough and poured the oats into it, proceeded to unbridle the horse, which began at once snuffing and champing while the dialogue went on. Is this one of the requisition horses, citizen? No. Does it belong to you? Yes, I bought him and paid for him. Where do you come from? From Paris. Not directly? No. I should say not. The roads are blocked, but the post still runs. As far as Alençon, I left it there. Ah, it will not be long before we shall have no more posts in France. The horses are all gone. One worth three hundred francs costs six hundred, and the price of fodder is beyond all reason. I used to be a postmaster, and now, you see, I keep a tavern. Out of thirteen hundred and thirteen postmasters, two hundred have resigned. Have you been travelling according to the new tariff, citizen? You mean the tariff of the first of May, yes. Twenty sous a post for a carriage, twelve for a gig, five for a van. Did you not buy this horse at Alençon? Yes. And you have been travelling all day? Yes, since dawn. And yesterday? And the day before. I should think so. You came by the way of Domfront and Morten. And of Ranche. You had better take my advice and rest, citizen. Are you not tired? Your horse certainly is. Horses may be tired, but men have no right to give way to fatigue. Again the host gazed at the traveller, whose face, grave, calm, and severe, was framed by grey hair. Casting a glance along the road, that was deserted as far as the eye could reach, he said, And so you are travelling alone. I have an escort. Where is it? My sabre and pistols. The innkeeper went for a pail of water, and while he was watering the horse he contemplated the traveller, saying to himself, He looks like a priest all the same. The rider continued, You say there is fighting at Dole. Yes, they are just about ready to begin. Who is fighting? One sea devant against another. How is that? I mean that the sea devant who is a republican is fighting against another who takes sides with the king. But there is no longer a king. There is the little fellow. But the strangest part is that the two sea devants are related to each other. Here the rider listened attentively, while the innkeeper continued, One is a young man, and the other an old one. It is the grand-nephew fighting against his great-uncle. The uncle is a royalist, while the nephew is a patriot. The uncle commands the whites, the nephew the blues. <sighs> they will show no mercy to each other, you may be sure. It is a war to death. Death. Yes, citizen. Perhaps you might like to see the polite speeches they fling at each other's head. Here is a placard, which the old man has managed to post on all the houses and trees, and which I found had been stuck on my very door. The host held up his lantern to a square bit of paper glued upon one of the panels of his door, and as it was written in very large characters, the rider was able to read it as he sat in his saddle. The Marquis de Lantenac has the honour to inform his grand-nephew, the Viscount Gauvin, that if the Marquis is so fortunate as to take him prisoner, Monsieur le Viscount may rest assured that he will be speedily shot. And here is the reply, continued the innkeeper. 
He turned so as to throw the light of his lantern upon a second placard on the other panel of the door, directly opposite the first one. Govan warns Lantanac that if he catches him, he will have him shot. Yesterday the first placard was posted on my door, said the host, and this morning came the second. He was not kept waiting for his answer. The traveller, in an undertone, as though speaking to himself, uttered certain words which the innkeeper caught without fully understanding their meaning. Yes, this is more than waging war against one's native land. It is carrying it into the family, and it must needs be done. Great regenerations are only to be purchased at this price. And the traveller, with his eyes still riveted to the second placard, lifted his hand to his hat and saluted it. The host continued, You see, citizen, this is the way matters stand. In the cities and in larger towns we are in favour of revolution, but in the country they are opposed to it, which amounts to saying that we are Frenchmen in the cities and Bretons in the villages. It is a war between the peasants and the townspeople. They call us Batauds, and we call them Rustauds. They have the nobles and the priests on their side. Not all of them, interrupted the rider. That is true, citizen, for here we have a viscount fighting against a marquis. And I verily believe, he added aside, that I am speaking to a priest at this minute. Which of the two is likely to gain the day? I should say the viscount so far, but he has a hard time of it. The old man is a tough customer. They belong to the Gobans, a noble family in these parts, of which there are two branches. The Marquis de Lantenac is the head of the older, and the Viscount Govan of the younger branch. Today the two branches are fighting each other. You never see this among trees, but often among men. This Marquis de Lantenac is all-powerful in Brittany. The peasants regard him as a prince. On the very day he landed he rallied eight thousand men. In a week three hundred parishes had risen. If he had only been able to establish a foothold on the coast, the English would have made a descent. Luckily Govan, who, strange to say, is his grand-nephew, was on the spot. He is a Republican commander, and has got the upper hand of his great-uncle. And then, as good luck would have it, this Lantanac at the time of his arrival, when he was massacring a multitude of prisoners, gave orders to have two women shot, one of whom had three children who had been adopted by a Paris battalion. This roused the rage of the battalion, which is called the Bonnet Rouge. There are but few of the original Parisians left, but they are desperate fighters. They have been incorporated into Commandant Govan's division. Nothing can resist them. Their great object is to avenge the women and recapture the children. And no one knows what the old Marquis did with the little ones, and that is what infuriates the Parisian grenadiers. Had not these children been mixed up in it, this war would not have been what it is. The Viscount is a good and brave young fellow, but the old man is a terrible Marquis. The peasants call this the War of Saint-Michel against Beelzebub. You know, maybe, that Saint-Michel is the patron of these parts. There is a mountain named after him in the middle of the bay. They give him credit for conquering the devil and burying him under another hill not far away, called Tombelan. Yes, murmured the rider, Tomba Belene, the tomb of Belenus, Belus, Bel, Belial, Beelzebub. I see that you are well informed, and the host said to himself, He knows Latin, surely he must be a priest. Then he added, well, citizen, this war is beginning all over again for the peasants. No doubt they think the royalist general is Saint-Michel and the patriot commander Beelzebub. But if there is a devil, it is Lantanac, and Govan is an angel if there ever was one. Will you take nothing, citizen? I have my gourd and a bit of bread, but you have not told me what is going on at Dole. To be sure. Well, Govan is in command of the exploring division of the coast. Now, Lantanac's plan was to stir up a general insurrection, to bring Lower Normandy to the aid of Lower Brittany, to throw open the door to Pitt, and to lend a helping hand to the great Vendean army, in the shape of twenty thousand English and two hundred thousand peasants. Govan has checkmated this plan. He holds the coast and drives Lantanac back into the interior, and the English into the sea. Lantanac was here, but Govan dislodged him, recaptured pont au -Beau, drove him out from Avranche and Villedieu, and prevented him from reaching Granville. He is manoeuvring now to force him to retreat into the forest of Fougere, and there to surround him. Yesterday everything was favourable, and Govan was here with his division. All at once, mind you, the old man, who is a shrewd one, made a point. The news came that he had marched on Dole. If he should take it, and succeeds in establishing a battery on Mont Dole, for he has artillery, that will give the English a chance to land, and then all is lost. That is the reason why Govan, who has a head on his shoulders, knowing there was not a moment to be lost, consulted no one. Nor did he wait for orders, but giving the signal to saddle, and harnessing his artillery, he collected his troops, drew his sabre, 
And while Lantanac is hurrying towards Dole, Govan is all ready to pounce upon Lantanac. And Dole is to be the place where these two Breton heads will clash, and a famous crash it will be. They are at it now. How long does it take to reach Dole? For troops with artillery carriages at least three hours, but they are there now. The traveller, as he listened, said, You are right. I think I can hear the cannon. The host, too, was listening. Yes, citizen, and the firing is steady. You had better spend the night here. There is nothing to be gained by going over there. I cannot stop. I must continue my journey. You are wrong. I do not know anything about your business, but the risk is great, and unless all that you hold dearest in the world is at stake... That is precisely the state of things, replied the rider. Now, supposing your son... You are very near the truth, said the rider. The innkeeper raised his head as he said to himself, And yet I thought this citizen was a priest. Then, after a moment's reflection, he added, But a priest may have children, after all. Put the bridle back on my horse, said the traveller. How much do I owe you? After receiving his pay, the host put the trough and bucket against the wall, and came back to the traveller. Since you are determined to go, take my advice. You must be going to saint Malo. Now then, do not go by the way of Dole. There are two roads, one leading through Dole, and the other along the coast. There is very little difference in their length. The road along the coast passes through Saint-Georges-de-Berhan, Cherouet, and iriel Vivier. You leave Dole to the south, and Cancal to the north, and at the end of this street, citizen, you will come to a place where the two roads fork. That of Dole to the left, that of Saint-Georges-de-Berhan to the right. Mark my words, if you go to Dole, you will plunge headlong into the massacre, so do not take the left hand turning, but keep to the right. Thank you, said the traveller, and he set spurs to his horse. As it was now quite dark, he soon vanished in the gloom, and the innkeeper lost sight of him. When the traveller reached the end of the street where the two roads forked, he heard the voice of the innkeeper calling to him from the distance, Turn to your right! He turned to the left. End of section 36 Section 37 of 93 by Victor Hugo, translated by Aline Delano. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part 3, Book 2, Chapter 2, Dole. Dole, a Franco-Spanish city in Brittany, as the old records call it, is not really a city, it is a street, a grand old Gothic street, with rows of houses supported by pillars on both sides of it, these houses are not built in straight lines, but stand irregularly, now and then elbowing into the street, which is, to be sure, a very wide one. The rest of the town is a mere network of lanes, all leading into this great diametrical street, emptying into it, one might say, like streams into a river, with Mont Dole towering above it. The city, with neither gates nor walls, could not have withstood a siege, but the street was quite capable of sustaining one. The houses, like promontories, which but fifty years ago were still standing, and the two pillared galleries bordering the street, made it a strong and well-nigh impregnable redoubt. Each of the houses was a fortress in itself, and the enemy would have found himself forced to capture them one by one. Almost in the middle of the street stood the old market. The innkeeper of the Croix Blanchard had told the truth. A furious battle was raging in Dole, even while he was speaking. A nocturnal duel between the whites who arrived in the morning, and the blues who appeared at night, had burst suddenly upon the town. The forces were unequal, the whites numbering six thousand, while the blues were only fifteen hundred, but they fought with equal fury. Surprising as it may seem, it was the fifteen hundred who attacked the six thousand. A mob pitted against a phalanx. On one side were six thousand peasants, with images of the Sacred Heart upon their leathern waistcoats, white ribbons on their round hats, Christian emblems on their leather cuffs, rosaries hanging from their belts, carrying pitchforks oftener than sabres, and carbines without bayonets, dragging along cannon by means of ropes, wretchedly equipped, undisciplined, with no suitable weapons, yet mad with rage. On the other side were fifteen thousand soldiers, wearing three-cornered hats with the tricolored cockade, long-tailed coats with broad lapels, and shoulder belts crossed, short sabres with copper hilts, muskets with long bayonets, well-drilled and disciplined, obedient though savage, knowing how to obey like men who couldn't need command, volunteers like the others, but patriots withal, although barefooted and in rags, paladins in the shape of peasants fighting in defense of monarchy, 
barefooted heroes in the ranks of the revolution, while the life and soul of both royalists and republicans was centered in their leaders, Lantanac, the man advanced in years, and the young Gauvin. Standing side by side in the revolution with young giants like Danton, Saint-Just, and Robespierre, were the ideal and youthful forms of Hoche and Marceau, and like unto them was Gauvin. Gauvin was thirty years of age, with the chest of Hercules, the solemn eye of a prophet, and the laugh of a child. He never smoked. He neither drank nor swore. He carried a dressing case with him throughout the entire war, and took great care of his nails, his teeth, and his luxuriant brown hair. Whenever they halted, it was his habit carefully to shake his commander's uniform, riddled with balls and whitened with dust as it was. Though always rushing headlong into the thickest of the fray, he had never been wounded. His voice, unusually melodious, could assume at need the imperative ring of command. He set the example of sleeping on the ground, in the wind, the rain, and the snow, wrapped in his cloak, with his charming head resting on a stone. His was a heroic and innocent soul. Let him but take a saber in his hand, he was straightway transformed. He had that effeminate aspect that changes to something formidable in battle. A thinker and philosopher withal, in short a youthful sage. Beautiful to look upon as Alcibiades, his speech showed the wisdom of Socrates. In that grand improvisation which men called the French Revolution, this young man at once became a leader. The division which he had formed was like a Roman legion, an army on a small scale, complete in itself. It consisted of infantry and cavalry. It had its scouts, its pioneers, its sappers, its engineers. And as the Roman legion had its catapults, this army had its cannon. Three well-mounted pieces strengthened the division, while leaving it easy to handle. Lantanac was also a military leader, but a more accomplished one, more cautious and at the same time more daring. The veritable old hero is cooler than a younger man, because he is farther removed from the heyday of life, and more daring from the consciousness that he is nearer death. What has he to lose? So slight a matter. This explains the bold and yet scientific maneuvers of Lantanac. Yet on the whole, in this obstinate wrestling match between the old and the young, Gauvin almost always had the advantage, and he owed this rather to chance than to anything in himself. Every sort of good fortune, even though it may be terrible, falls to the lot of youth. A victory has something feminine in its nature. Lantanac was exasperated with Gauvin, first because his nephew had defeated him, and second because he was his nephew. What possessed him to be Jacobin, a Gauvin? Unruly youngster that he was, his heir, for the Marquis had no children, a great-nephew, almost a grandchild. Ah! cried this quasi-grandfather. If he falls into my hands, I will kill him like a dog. The Republic, moreover, had good reason to feel uneasy about this Marquis de Lantanac. He had no sooner landed than its terror began. The mere utterance of his name was like a powder train spread through the Vendean insurrection, of which he straightway became the centre. In a revolt of this kind, where each one is jealous of his neighbour, where each has his bush or his ravine, if a superior leader appears, the separate chiefs who have been on a level will rally round him and submit themselves to his authority. Nearly all the forest captains had joined Lantanac, and whether near or remote, they all obeyed him. Only Gavard, who had been the first to join him, had departed. And why was this? Because he had enjoyed the confidence of the Republic and been in a position of authority. Gavard had held all the secrets and had adopted the old-fashioned system of civil war, which Lantanac had come to change and replace. A successor can hardly agree with a man of that stamp. The shoe of La Rouerie was not a fit for Lantanac, and so Gavard had gone to join Bonchamp. Lantanac belonged to the military school of Frederick II. He understood the art of warfare, which consists of combining the greater with the lesser. He favored neither the great Catholic and royal army, that mass of confusion, destined to be crushed, nor the guerrilla troops scattered through the thickets and hedges, useful to harass but powerless to crush. There is either no end to guerrilla warfare, or else it comes to an unfortunate one. It begins by attacking the Republic and ends by robbing a diligence. Lantanac did not propose to carry on the Breton War altogether in the open country, like La roche jacques -Alon, nor yet in the forest like Chouan. He neither approved of the Vendée nor of the Chouannerie. He believed in real warfare. He was willing to use the peasant, but he wished to support him by the soldier. He required bands for strategy and regiments for tactics. The village armies, so easily disbanded, he considered excellent for an attack, an ambush, or a surprise, but he felt that they lacked solidity. They were like water in his hands. 
he sought a solid foundation for this unstable and diffusive warfare. To the savage army of the forest he proposed to add regular troops as a sort of pivot about which to maneuver the peasants. Had this scheme, deep laid and terrible as it was, proved successful, the Vendée would never have been conquered. But where could regular troops be found? Where look for soldiers? Where seek for regiments and find a ready-made army? In England. Hence Lantenac's determination that the English should effect a landing. Thus do parties compromise with their consciences. He quite lost sight of the red coat, eclipsed as it was by the white cockade. Lantenac had but one idea, first to seize upon some point on the coast, and then to deliver it into the hands of Pitt. It was with this object that, seeing Dole unprotected, he had thrown himself upon it, knowing that once in possession of Dole, he could readily gain Mordole, and by means of the latter gain a footing on the coast. The spot was well chosen. From Mordole, the cannon would sweep Frenois on one side, and saint Brelade on the other, would keep the fleet of Cancal at a distance, and leave the whole beach, from Raz sur Couinon to saint Melois des ondes open to an attack. In order to ensure success, Lantenac had brought with him six thousand of the most active men in the regiment at his disposal, together with all his artillery, ten sixteen-pound culverins, one demi-culverin, and one four-pounder. He proposed to establish a strong battery on Mont Dole, on the principle that a thousand shots fired from ten cannon do more execution than fifteen hundred fired from five cannon. With six thousand men he felt sure of success. In the direction of Avranche they had nothing to fear but Gauvin with his fifteen hundred men. Towards Dina there was Lachelle, to be sure, with twenty-five thousand, but he was twenty leagues away. In regard to the latter, Lantenac felt quite safe, the distance offsetting the numbers. And as for Gauvin, though he was quite near, his force was very small. We may here remark that Lachelle was a fool, who afterwards allowed his twenty-five thousand men to be slaughtered on the moors of croix Bataille, a mistake for which he strove to atone by suicide. So Lantenac felt quite safe. His entrance into Dole had been sudden and stern. The Marquis de Lantenac enjoyed a hard reputation, and knowing him to be merciless, the terrified inhabitants shut themselves up in their houses without attempting resistance, and the six thousand Vendeans installed themselves in the city after the disorderly fashion of a band of rustics. It was almost like a market ground. In default of quartermasters, they chose their own quarters, camping at haphazard, cooking in the open air, dispersing hither and yonder through the churches, dropping their muskets to take up their rosaries. Lantenac, accompanied by a few artillery officers, proceeded without delay to reconnoitre Montdol, leaving Gouge le Bruant, whom he had appointed field sergeant, in command. This Gouge le Bruant has left but an indistinct trace in history. He had two nicknames, Brise Bleu, in token of his massacre of the patriots, and Imanus, because there was something indescribably horrible about him. Imanus is derived from Imanis, an old low Norman word which expresses a superhuman degree of ugliness, almost godlike in its terror, a demon, a satyr, an ogre. An old manuscript says, With my own eyes I beheld Imanus. Today the old people in Brittany no longer know who Gouge le Bruant was, nor what Brise Bleu means, but they have a vague idea of the Imanus, whose name is interwoven with all the local superstitions. He still is spoken of in Tremorel and Plumogat the two villages where Gouge le Bruant has left the impress of his ill-omened footstep. In the Vendée, where all the inhabitants were savages, Gouge le Bruant was the barbarian. He was a sort of cacique, tattooed all over with crucifixes and fleur-de-lis. Upon his face was the hideous, almost supernatural glow of a soul unlike that of any other human being. He was as brave in battle as Satan himself, and atrociously cruel when the battle was over. His heart, full of mysterious determinations, now urged him to acts of devotion, now to deeds of wildest fury. Did he use his reason? Yes, after a serpentine fashion. Heroism was his starting point, murder his goal. It was impossible to conceive how his resolutions, often grand in their very monstrosity, could have entered his mind. He was capable of any horror when least expected. His ferocity was on a scale of epic grandeur. Hence his peculiar surname, Imanus. The Marquis de Lantenac relied upon his cruelty, but while none could dispute the fact that he excelled in cruelty in matters of strategy and tactics he was less efficient, and it may perhaps have been a mistake on the part of the Marquis when he made him his field sergeant. But, however that may be, he left him behind in charge, with the injunction to look after matters in general. Gouge le Bruant was more of a fighter than a soldier, and guarding a town was not so much in his line as massacring a clan would have been. Still, he posted sentries. 
When at nightfall the Marquis, having decided upon the position of his battery, was returning to Dole, he suddenly caught the sound of cannon. Looking in the direction of the sound, he saw a red smoke rising from the street. This meant a surprise, an invasion, an attack. Fighting was going on in the town. Although not easily taken by surprise, he was now utterly amazed, for he had anticipated nothing of the sort. What could it mean? Evidently not, Gauvin, for a man would hardly attack an enemy outnumbering him four to one. Could it be L'Echelle? But was it possible for him to have made such a forced march? L'Echelle was improbable, Gauvin impossible. Lantenac urged on his horse. On the way he met some of the inhabitants in the act of flight, but when he questioned them they seemed beside themselves with terror, crying, The Blues! The Blues! And on his arrival he found the situation a bad one. This is what had happened. End of section 37《Section 38 of 93 by Victor Hugo, translated by Aline Delano. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part 3, Book 2, Chapter 3, Small Armies and Great Battles. On their arrival at Dole, the peasants, as we have seen, had dispersed through town, each man guided by his own fancy, as it often happens when on obeyed d'amitié, as the Vendéans expressed it a form of obedience that may produce heroes, but not well-disciplined soldiers. They had stored their artillery, together with the baggage, under the arches of the old market, and, feeling weary, when they had eaten and drunk and said their beads, they stretched themselves out in the middle of the principal street, that was encumbered rather than guarded. As night came on, most of them fell asleep, pillowing their heads on their knapsacks, some having their wives beside them, for it often happened that the peasant women followed the men, in the Vendée, women about to become mothers frequently acted as spies. It was a mild July night. The constellations shone forth against the deep blue sky. The entire bivouac, which might have been mistaken for the halt of a caravan rather than for a military encampment, gave itself up to quiet slumber. Suddenly, by the glimmering twilight, those who were still awake perceived three cannon leveled at the entrance of the principal street. It was Govan. He had surprised the guard, had entered the town, and with his division held the entrance of the street. A peasant started up, crying, Who goes there? and fired off his musket. A cannon shot, followed by a terrific volley of musketry, was the reply. The whole sleeping crowd sprang up with a start. It was a rude shock to be roused by a volley of grape shot from a peaceful sleep beneath the stars. The first moment was terrific. There is nothing more tragic than the confusion of a panic-stricken crowd. They snatched their weapons. Many fell as they ran, yelling to and fro. Confused by the unexpected assault, the lads lost their heads and fired madly at one another. The townspeople, bewildered by all this confusion, rushed in and out of their houses, shouting to each other as they wandered helplessly about, a dismal struggle in which women and children played a part. The balls whistling through the air left streaks of light in the darkness behind them. Amid the smoke and tumult a constant firing issued from every dark corner. The entanglement of the baggage wagons and cannon carriages was added to the general confusion. The horses, rearing, trampled upon the wounded, whose groans could be heard on every side. Some were horror-stricken, others stupefied. Officers were looking for their men and soldiers for their officers. In the midst of all this, some there were who displayed a stolid indifference. One woman, seated on the fragment of a wall, was nursing her newborn babe while her husband, with bleeding wounds and a broken leg, leaned against it as he calmly loaded his musket and fired at random in the darkness, killing or not as it happened. Men lying flat on the ground fired between the spokes of the wagon wheels. At times there rose a hideous din of clamors, and again the thundering voice of the cannon would overwhelm all. It was frightful, like the felling of trees when one falls upon the other. Govan, from his ambush, aimed with precision and lost but few men, but at last the peasants, intrepid in spite of the disaster, ended by taking the defensive. They fell back on the market, which was like a great dark fortress with its forest of stone pillars. There they made a stand. Anything that resembled a forest inspired them with courage. The Imanus did his best to atone for the absence of Lantanac. They had cannon, but to the great surprise of Govan they made no use of them. This was due to the fact that the artillery officers had gone with the Marquis to reconnoitre Mont Dole, and the peasants did not know how to manage the culverins and demi-culverins. But they riddled with balls the blues who cannonaded them. The peasants answered the grape-shot by a volley of musketry. 
they now had the advantage of the shelter, having heaped up the drays, the carts, the baggage, and all the small casks that were lying about in the old market, thus improvising a high barricade, with openings through which they could pass their muskets, and from which they opened a deadly fire. So rapidly had they worked, that in a quarter of an hour the market presented an impregnable front. Matters were beginning to look serious for Govan. The sudden transformation of a market into a fortress, and the peasants assembled in a solid mass within, was a condition of affairs which he had not anticipated. He had taken them by surprise, it is true, but he had not succeeded in routing them. He had dismounted, and holding his sword by the hilt, he stood with folded arms, gazing steadfastly into the gloom, his own figure distinctly revealed by the flame of the torch that lighted the battery, a target for the men of the barricade, of which fact he took no heed as he stood there lost in thought, while a shower of balls from the barricade fell around him. He set his cannon against their rifles, and victory is ever on the side of the cannonball. He who has artillery is sure to win the day, and his well-manned battery gave him the advantage. Suddenly a flash of lightning burst forth from the dark market. There came a report like a peal of thunder, and a bullet went crashing through a house over Govan's head. The barricade was paying him back in his own coin. What was going on? This was a new development. The artillery was no longer confined to one side. A second ball followed the first, embedding itself in the wall close to Govan, and a third ball knocked off his hat. These balls were of a caliber so heavy that they must have been fired from a sixteen-pounder. "'They are aiming at you, Commander!' cried the gunners as they put out the torch. And Govan, still absorbed in his reverie, stooped to pick up his hat. Someone was indeed aiming at Govan, and it was Lantanak. The Marquis had just reached the barricade from the opposite side. The Imanus hastened to meet him. Monseigneur, we have been taken by surprise. By whom? I do not know. Is the road to Dinan open? I believe so. We must begin to retreat. We have done so. Many have already fled. I am not speaking of flight, but of retreat. Why did you not use the artillery? The men were beside themselves. And then the officers were absent. I was to be here. Monseigneur, I sent everything I could on to Fougere. The women, the baggage, and all useless encumbrances. But what is to be done with the three little prisoners? Do you mean the children? Yes. They are our hostages. Send them on to the Krug. So saying, the Marquis started for the barricade, and directly after his arrival things took on another aspect. The barricade was not well constructed for artillery, there was room for but two cannon. The Marquis placed in position the two sixteen-pounders for which embrasures were made. As he was leaning on one of the cannon, watching the enemy's battery through the embrasure, he caught sight of Govan. "'It is he!' he cried. Then, taking the swab and the ramrod, he loaded the piece, adjusted the sight, and took aim. Three times he aimed at Govan and missed him, but the third shot knocked off his hat. Bungler, murmured Lantanac, a little lower and I should have had his head. Suddenly the torch went out, and he had only darkness before him. Well, let it go, he said. And turning to the peasant gunners, he exclaimed, Let them have the grape shot. Govan, for his part, was also in deadly earnest. The situation had become a serious one since the development of this new phase of the conflict, and the barricade was now cannonading him. Who could tell how soon it might pass from the defensive to the offensive? The enemy numbered at least five thousand, even allowing for the dead and the fugitives, while he had no more than twelve hundred serviceable men at his command. What would happen to the Republicans if the enemy should become aware of their limited number? Their rules would soon be reversed. From playing the part of assailants, he would become the object of assault. If the barricade were to make a sortie, all would be lost. What was to be done? It was out of the question to think of attacking the barricade in front. An attempt to capture it by main strength would be folly. Twelve hundred men could not dislodge five thousand. Imperative as it was to make an end of it, knowing as he did that delay was fatal, still he realized that to force the enemy's hand would be impossible. What was he to do? Govan belonged to this neighborhood. He was familiar with the town, and knew that behind the old market where the Vendeans were entrenched was a labyrinth of narrow and crooked streets. He turned to his lieutenant, the brave Captain Gechamp, who afterwards became famous for clearing the forest of Concis, where Jean Chouan was born, and who prevented the capture of Bourgneuf by cutting the rebels off from the highway that led to the pond of La Chaine. Gechamp, said Govan, I entrust you with the command. 
Fire as rapidly as possible. Riddle the barricade with cannonballs and keep them busy over yonder. I understand, said Gachamp. Mass the whole column with their guns loaded and hold them in readiness for an attack. He whispered a few words in Gachamp's ear. It shall be done, said the latter. Govan continued. Are all our drummers ready? Yes. We have nine. Keep two and give me seven. The seven drummers silently ranged themselves in front of Govan. Step forward, battalion of the Bonnet Rouge, exclaimed Govan. Twelve soldiers, one of whom was a sergeant, stepped from the ranks. I called for the whole battalion, said Govan. Here it is, replied the sergeant. Are there but twelve? Only twelve of us left. Very well, said Govan. This sergeant was that very Radoub, the rough and kindly soldier who, in the name of the battalion, had adopted the three children found in the forest of La Sodre. It will be remarked that only half that battalion was massacred at Erbon Pile, and Radoub, by good luck, was not among them. A forage wagon was standing near, and Govan pointed it out to the sergeant. Let your men weave ropes of straw and bind them around their muskets to deaden the noise when they clash against each other. A minute went by. The order was silently executed in the darkness. It is done, said the sergeant. Take off your shoes, soldiers, continued Govan. We have none, replied the sergeant. Including the drummers, they numbered nineteen men. Govan was the twentieth. Follow me in single file, cried Govan. Let the drummers go before the battalion. You will command the battalion, sergeant. He placed himself at the head of this column, and while the cannonading still continued on both sides, these twenty men glided along like shadows and plunged into the deserted lanes. Thus they proceeded for some time, skirting along the fronts of the houses. It seemed as though the whole town were dead. The citizens had taken refuge in their cellars. Every door was barred and every shutter closed. Not a light was to be seen anywhere. But through this silence they still heard the awful din on the principal street. The cannonading went on. The Republican battery and the Royal Barricade spit out their grape-shot with unabated fury. After marching twenty minutes, winding in and out, Govan, who had led the way unerringly through this darkness, reached the end of a lane that led into the principal street. They were now, however, on the other side of the market. The position was changed. On that side there was no entrenchment, a common mistake of barricade-builders. The market was open, and one could walk in under the pillars, where several baggage-wagons stood ready to leave. Govan and his nineteen men were in the presence of the five thousand Vendeans as before, only instead of facing them they found themselves in their rear. Govan whispered to the sergeant. The straw was unwound from the muskets, and the twelve grenadiers ranged themselves in a line behind the corner of the lane, while the seven drummers, with uplifted drumstick, waited for the signal. The artillery firing was intermittent, when suddenly, during the interval between two discharges, Govan raised his sword, and in a voice that rang out like a clarion upon the silence exclaimed, Two hundred men to the right, two hundred to the left, the rest in the center. The drums beat and the twelve musket shots were fired. Then Govan uttered the formidable battle cry of the blues. Charge! Bayonets! The effect was wonderful. All this crowd of peasants, finding themselves assailed in the rear, imagined that another army had come up from behind. At the same time, on hearing the beating of the drums, the column which held the upper part of the street and was commanded by Gachamp began to move, sounding the charge in its turn, and, starting on the run, attacked the barricade. The peasants saw themselves between two fires. A panic magnifies, and at such moments a pistol shot sounds like the report of a cannon. Imagination distorts every sound, and the barking of a dog seems like the roar of a lion. Let us add, moreover, that the peasant takes fright as easily as a thatch catches fire, and as quickly as a burning thatch becomes a conflagration, a panic among peasants grows into a rout, and on this occasion the flight was beyond description. In a few moments the market was deserted, the terrified lads scattered in all directions, and the officers were helpless. The Imanus killed two or three of the fugitives, but it was of no avail. Nothing could be heard save the cry, Sauf qui peut! and, with the rapidity of a cloud driven onward by a hurricane, the entire army scattered through the streets as through the meshes of a sieve, and vanished into the country. Some fled toward Chateauneuf, some toward Pleguer, and others in the direction of Antran. The Marquis de Lantenac, who was the last man to leave the scene, spiked the guns with his own hands, and then quietly and calmly took his departure, saying as he went, It is evident that the peasants cannot be depended upon to stand their ground. We need the English. 
End of section 38. Section 39 of 93 by Victor Hugo, translated by Aline Delano. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part 3, Book 2, Chapter 4, A Second Time. They had won the victory, and, turning to the men of the battalion of the Bonnet Rouge, Govan exclaimed, Though you are but twelve, you are equal to a thousand. One word from the chief in times like these was as good as the cross of honor. Gechamp, who had been sent by Govan outside the city in pursuit of the fugitives, captured many of them. Torches were lighted, and the town was searched. All those who had not been able to escape surrendered themselves. The principal street, illuminated by potes à feu, was strewn with the dead and the wounded. The fierce struggle that always terminates a battle was still continued by a few groups of desperate fighters, who, however, on being surrounded, threw down their arms and surrendered. Govan had observed amid the wild tumult of the flight a fearless man, vigorous and agile as a fawn, who stood his own ground while covering the flight of the others. This peasant, after handling his musket like an expert, alternately firing and using the butt as a club, until he had broken it, now stood grasping a pistol in one hand and a saber in the other, and no man dared approach him. Suddenly Govan saw him reel, and lean against one of the pillars of the principal street. He was evidently wounded, but he still held his saber and his pistols. Govan put his sword under his arm and came up to him. As he called upon him to surrender, the man gazed steadily at him, while the blood oozing from his wound formed a pool at his feet. "'You are my prisoner,' said Govan. "'What is your name?' "'Dans sa l'ombre,' was the reply. "'You are a brave fellow,' said Govan, extending his hand. "'Long live the king,' cried the man. Then gathering all his strength, and raising both hands simultaneously, he fired his pistol at Govan's heart, at the same time aiming a blow at his head with the saber. This movement, tiger-like in its rapidity, was yet forestalled by the action of another. A horseman had appeared on the scene. He had been there for some moments without attracting attention, and when he saw the Vendean lift his saber and pistol, he threw himself between the latter and Govan, intercepting the saber thrust by his own person, while his horse was struck by the pistol shot, and both horse and rider fell to the ground. Thus Govan's life was saved. All this took place as quickly as one would utter a cry. The Vendean also sank to the pavement. The blow from the sabre struck the man full in the face. He lay on the ground in a swoon. The horse was killed. Govan drew near, asking, as he approached, if any could tell who he was. On looking at him more closely, he saw that the blood was gushing over the face of the wounded man, covering it as with a red mask, and rendering it impossible to distinguish his features. One could see that his hair was grey. "'He has saved my life,' said Govan. "'Does anyone here know him?' Uh, "'Commander,' said a soldier, "'he has got just arrived in town. I saw him coming from the direction of Pontorson.' The surgeon-in-chief of the division hurried up with his instrument case. The wounded man was still unconscious, but after examining him, the surgeon said, Oh, this is nothing but a simple cut. It can be sewed, and in eight days he will be on his feet again. That was a fine saber cut. The wounded man wore a cloak and a tricolored belt, with pistols and a saber. They placed him on a stretcher, and, after undressing him, a bucket of water was brought, and the surgeon washed the wound. As the face began to appear, Govan studied it attentively. Has he any papers about him? he asked. The surgeon felt in his side pocket and drew out a pocket book, which he handed to Govan. Meanwhile, the wounded man, revived by the cold water, was regaining his consciousness. His eyelids quivered slightly. Govan was looking over the pocket book, in which he discovered a sheet of paper folded four times. He opened it and read, Committee of Public Safety, Citizen Simordan. Simordan! he cried, whereupon the wounded man opened his eyes. Govan was beside himself. It is you, Simordan! For the second time you have saved my life! Simordan looked at Govan, while a sudden burst of joy, impossible to describe, lit up his bleeding face. Govan fell on his knees before him, exclaiming, My master! Thy father, said Simordan. End of section 39《セクション40》を93バイ・ヴィクトル・ヒューゴー、トランスレーターバイ・アリン・ダラノー。This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part 3, Book 2, Chapter 5, 
a drop of cold water. It was many a year since last they met, but their hearts had never been separated, and they knew each other again as if they had parted but yesterday. A hospital had been improvised in the town hall of Dole, and Simordan was placed on a bed in a small room adjoining the large hall devoted to the other wounded men. The surgeon who had sewed up his wound put a stop to all exciting conversation between the two men, considering it wiser to leave Simordan to sleep. Besides, Govan was called away by the thousand duties and cares incident to victory. Simordan was left alone, but he could not sleep, excited as he was by the double fever of his wound and of his joy. He knew he was not sleeping, and yet he hardly felt sure that he was awake. Could it be possible that his dream had come to pass? Simordan was one of those men who have no faith in good luck, and yet it had fallen to his lot. He had found Govan. He had left him a child. He found him a man. A grand, brave, awe-inspiring conqueror, and that in the cause of the people. In the Vendée, Govan was the pillar of the revolution, and it was really Simordan himself who had bestowed this support upon the Republic. This conqueror was his pupil. Simordan beheld his own thought illumining the youthful countenance of this man, for whom a niche in the Republican pantheon was perhaps reserved. His disciple, the child of his mind, was a hero from this time forth and would soon become famous. It seemed to Simordan like seeing his own soul transformed into a genius. As he watched Govan in the battle, he had felt like Chiron watching Achilles. There is a certain analogy between the priest and the centaur, since a priest is but half a man. The incidents of this day's adventure, added to the sleeplessness caused by his wound, filled Simordan with a strange sort of intoxication. He seemed to see a youthful destiny rising before him in all its splendor, and the knowledge of his own absolute control of this destiny contributed to increase his deep joy. It needed but one more triumph like that which he had just witnessed, and at a word from Simordan, the Republic would place Govan at the head of an army. Nothing dazzles one so much as an unexpected success. This was the epic of military dreams. Every man had a longing to create a general. Westermann was the hero of Danton's dream, Rosignol of Marat's, Ronson of Hébert's, and Robespierre would have liked to ruin them all. So why not Govan? Simordan asked himself and thereupon he proceeded to lose himself in dreams. There were no limits to his imaginings. As he passed from one hypothesis to another, all obstacles vanished before him, for this is a ladder on which, having once set foot, one never pauses. The ascent is a long one, starting from man and ending at the stars. A great general is only the commander of an army. A great captain is also a leader of thought. Simordan pictured Govan as a great captain. It seemed to him for fancies travel fast, that he saw him on the sea pursuing the English, on the Rhine driving before him the kings of the north, in the Pyrenees repulsing Spain, on the Alps setting the signal for insurrection before the eyes of Rome. Simordan was a man who possessed two distinct natures, the one tender, the other gloomy, both of which were satisfied. For since the inexorable was his ideal, it gratified him to see Govan at once glorious and terrible. Simordan thought of all he had to pull down before he could build up. And certainly, he said to himself, this is no time to indulge in tender emotions. Govan will be up à la hauteur. An expression of the day. Simordan pictured Govan to himself with a sword in his hand, girded in light, a flaming meteor on his brow, spreading the grand ideal wings of justice, right, and progress, and, like an angel of extermination, crushing the darkness beneath his heel. Just at the crisis of this reverie, which one might almost have called an ecstasy, through the half-open door he heard men talking in the great ambulance hall adjoining his room, and he recognized Govan's voice, which, in spite of years of absence, had always rung in his ears, for the voice of the man often retains something of its childish tones. He listened. There was a sound of footsteps, and he heard the soldiers saying, Here's the man who fired at you, Commander. He had crawled into a cellar when no one was watching, but we found him, and here he is. Then Simordan heard the following conversation between Govan and the man. Are you wounded? I am well enough to be shot. Put this man to bed, dress his wounds, take good care of him until he recovers. I want to die. But you are going to live. You tried to kill me in the name of the king. I pardon you in the name of the republic. A shadow crossed Simordan's brow. He seemed to wake as with a start and whispered to himself in a tone of gloomy dejection, Yes, he has a merciful nature, there can be no doubt. End of section 40